Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the pre-show for week nine, the final week of the regular season. I'm Atlas. I am proud to be joined by Daniel Orks Harrison and Chroniclers here as well. How you doing, gentlemen? Pretty good. You know, uh, I feel like we had some pretty banging games last week and things, there's still stakes to be set kind of for this week. There's still things on the line. Sometimes you get to the last week of the season, it's like, okay, everything's kind of decided, but there's still a lot to, that can change with this last week. Yeah, we had a little bit of esports weekends. Yeah, we saw some challengers, played some video games, as you do. But week nine, final week before the playoff hits. I feel like spring always just passes by so quickly. It's kind of ridiculous how fast it goes, but we are here. It's the final week, and we're looking at some standings as Gen G have locked in first and second. They can actually lock in first place if they pick up a victory against DRX. If they fail to do that, if uh, T1 then uh, loses to Nongshim immediately afterwards, then they will also be locked in regardless of the result of the very first series. So very likely that Gen G are going to be first, guys. And uh, the standings would definitely show you that. Let's have a look at the POG standings. Speaking of which, Chovy out in front, 100 points above Faker. I feel like it is going to be a battle between those two for our uh, POG of the, the split. Yeah, mathematically, Zeka could get first, but I just think it's so unlikely, especially with how much Chovy and Faker have been racking them up. Likely to be between these two to see who can get the number one spot. Obviously, Chovy in the lead, definitely a big advantage to start the week. Absolutely. One advantage Faker has is that some of his teammates have looked slightly worse. So hey. there's an opportunity there. Perfect. Um, speaking of opportunities, I don't have any. Um, I just ran it down, uh, apparently, last week as far as the predictions were concerned. But uh, wasn't a lot of predicting correctly unanimously. You know, it's, uh, it's there was a few whoopsies. Yeah, uh, you know, I got a lot of points for the Fear X belief, but then lost out on the Bro Leaf. But can you ever really lose out on Bro Leaf? No, no, no. You know? They, they did, you, you guys did lose, though. Mm. Well, we did, but we didn't. Yeah, we paid our Bro Tax. Exactly. And we I paid our Bro Tax. Weird. And, you know, we can't all be winners when it comes to the predictions, but we can all be Bro Leavers if we would like to be. Um, let's have a look at uh, some of the interesting facts about these standings, because. This is the thing that we want to focus on when it comes to the top end. And this is the fact that Hummer Life Esports do have an opportunity to potentially get to second place, although it is slim. And the big thing here is, again, I don't know if either of these teams will need it, but the moment that you get seeded into the second round of playoffs, you do have double elimination in place. So say that you somehow end up with a really rough meta read or your opponents do way better than expected. If you're in first or second place, you will always get the second opportunity. If you end up getting upset in the first round of playoffs, that's the end of it. Yeah, and with the points being uh, points difference being four, T1 have to lose a game for Honor Life Esports to make up this difference. If T1 win both those, you know whether it, even if they win them both 2-1 and Honor Life Esports gets two two O's, they're not going to make up the distance. And given that it's Nongshim DRX. I think it's looking hard for Honor Life Esports to make up that gap. Yeah, that one's going to be difficult, but this is the big one. This is the battle for our final playoff spot, Quan Long Freaks versus Fox. And you can see that six wins versus five wins, Quan Long Freaks still with, you know, very, very high likelihood of making it. They've needed one win for a really long time, but I think it's done so. I think it's uh, it's Phyrex all the way. They were five and three at a point. It's, it's really just, and you can sense the frustration, because it's just a rerun of what happened to them in summer. And for Fear X, I think, and Orcs was actually the one that pointed out, we kind of got a, a worse idea of them because they had a really rough stretch of games. But that was going up against some of the best teams in the league. And now we see, when we see them face off against the teams that, uh, like DRX, are more within their own scale. They look so much better. And they did beat Kwang Nong, their direct competitor, last week as well. Yeah, they went into last week on a nine loss streak. And yet the only time they'd ever lost to an Eastern team was their first round loss against Quantum Freak. So, you know, just the way the schedule had gone had gone out, it kind of made them look worse than they were. Now they've started facing some more Eastern teams. They've really pulled it together. And I think the main thing that stood out to me is their patience when it comes to team fights for finding the right angle of approach. and. I think going up against Nongxing and Brion, I'm convinced they'll be able to, to carry out both these two games. And Quantum Freaks, they're in such a bad spot. And now, d and K KT still have something to fight for. They're still fighting to try and get a better spot in the seeding. So they're not going to go easy on them. It says a lot as well about the current forum that none of us have any faith, even though they've been, if I remember correctly, they've beaten both DK and KT in the first round. One of the reasons why we got so excited about them and then that was kind of what kickstarted DK really struggling. 
with KT, we didn't really take any stock in it because they are KT. But now it just doesn't look likely because the team just hasn't looked the same. And it's heartbreaking because they went through this in summer and that was without Cuz. Like, and yeah. Cuz has not been the problem, don't get me wrong. But the fact that you have a jungler of that level and still the same issues plague you is very, very unfortunate for Guangdong. Yeah, it's really I, rough. It's, it's hard to know exactly where all the issues came from as well, but we'll have to try and dive in. And they got chewed by Bro, I think. <laughs> I mean, back to back <laughs> losing to Bro definitely would not be helping them out. But let's have a look at what happened last week. This time around, we don't have sort of massive outliers apart from the Ash, which is kind of hilarious. Just banned a whole bunch of times and just otherwise ignored. And Callista has really shot up as far as priority. Yeah, I mean, even though we got some nerfs for Cuesta on the last patch, she just really didn't really do anything. She's been kind of dominant. Uh, I think another one that stands out to me is the Talia. Uh, with, with Azir being disabled, a lot of time before that, we saw Talia picked into it because it was a good matchup. But Azir was just so strong that it wasn't really worth the trade-off. Whereas now, she's kind of just come into her own. I think particularly the Talia-Poppy combo is a really popular one. Yeah. As they both shut down mobility so well, no fun allowed if you're playing things like Arya Lee Sin. And on top of that, if you use the wall to go to a side lane and then Poppy turns up as well, it's just, you can't prevent being dove against that. It's just so, such a devastating combo in side lanes. Just to let you know that uh, it, we are moving to 14.5, but Azir remains disabled. So the Taliyas are going to be running amok more often, and uh, we'll have to see whether um, you know we'll ever get Azir back. Let's have a look at some of the buffs, though, on 14.5, as, you know, a bunch of armor for Sivir that could work out. Sivir's issues, I think, aren't just tied to the fact that the laning phase obviously is still a really, really weak point. I think it was four armor that four armor, is yeah. quite substantial and is really going to help her out, but she is still very short range. Uh, and I think that a lot of the champions that are like that currently struggle unless there's Zeri levels of strong. And then Jarvan. Jarvan is one of those champions who needs like only a tiny bit of buffs and the right place in the right time. If you're playing into things like Varus or Rihanna, you can actually get a ton of value from his ultimate. Uh, you're able to get through your early or your mid game a little bit uh, more healthy as well. Yeah, and Wukong changes, uh, pretty solid, especially since we've already seen players like Willa will be very keen to bring out the Wukong. Uh, I think he's seen a lot of popularity in the top lane as well. Uh, there's definitely some matchups, things like the Jace, where he's always been pretty good into, so maybe we see a bit more from there. Rek'Sai actually becoming a bit of a trend. I don't expect it'll be in pro, but top Rek'Sai has really taken a uh, sharp turn in solo queue. And then That's the other two um, that we uh, had a look at as well, the Vyga and the Vex. These Vex especially, um, if you think about players like Showmaker and Chovy that absolutely love this pick, can actually be used into the Ari. What do we reckon? Is this going to be enough? Yeah, I don't think it's like a huge increase in power for either of these, but I think it's kind of like a little push because they know Ari's performing well. And these matchups have historically, because we've seen Ari in the meta for quite a while in the past couple of years, have been picks that have worked very well into it. So I think there's definitely potential to see them show up. Yeah, we saw one game of Lissandra and that made us go like, no, not Lissandra. And Vega, I think, getting some buffs after uh, he was still a very sad Yordo over the loss of his Everfrost. He really liked that item. He did definitely like that item, but hopefully he can land some more cages. Let's Let's have a look at the other side of the coin, though, because some champions have been tapped. And speaking of which, TF is kind of out of here, but Maokai is a cool one, Ox. Yeah, so they've been trying to trim down Maokai's power for a while because he's just been ridiculous, honestly, uh, particularly in the support role. The movement speed nerf is significant because the support uh, pick, you just go Trailblazer and rely on your movement speed. The ult cooldown as well. This feels like the really first change, the nerf they've given, that feels substantial, but I still think he's very playable. Probably more so we'll see him in jungle than support right now, though. Man, look at all these champions that were nerfed, none of which we saw at all, unfortunately. The Apart one that one of them, but we didn't really see it. Oh, the the, 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 the angle. Yeah. yeah, and and Zach's nerf is more so the top lane nerf than is a jungle nerf. We've seen him there, I think, twice this And season. what do the center nerfs mean, Orcs? Tell me about it. They're not super significant. Like the Q nerf, obviously, it, it's it's definitely something. It's definitely gonna trim it down but I still think she's strong. And I think even despite the win rate on the previous patch, she's strong. What happened is we were seeing Senna slip through draft occasionally. And oftentimes it was matched with like Smolder Karma. And we seen Soul Team just not able to punish that quickly enough. The Smolder ended up taking over the game. So still think it's strong, but definitely reeled in a little bit. Uh, range tops, we did see Dundun pull out Vayne. It didn't work. Is that Dundun? Is that Vayne? Is a competitive play? I'll leave you at home to <laughs> make your conclusions on that. It's probably a combination of it. The TF, though, I do think those nerfs are really substantial. We're still seeing some ADTF in solo queue. 
But I do think that it really took a big hit. Uh, damage was, I think, uh, uh, chopped in like third, and a lot of attack speed loss is really big for the amount of unhit damage he's able to do. Yeah, we'll see whether he still gets played at all. Um, but let's have a look at some of these adjustments. Seraphine getting a whole lot of things changed, and then the little dragon. Yeah, so Seraphine, they're basically trying to move her away from being a AP carry, like in the bot lane, to specifically being a support. Hasn't really caught on yet, uh, but that's definitely the intention they're going with. Smolder, though, this was an adjustment. He still feels really strong. So, for example, like the Q, the burn when you're at 225 stacks used to be 6.5% base. It now has like an AP scaling, an AD scaling, a, a, a stack scaling. And it honestly, I think he's maybe even ended up more powerful after this patch. And now Shurjin is also buffed a little bit. And so that kind of helps as well. Yeah, especially when you read just has attack-based spells now at a stack and get their in da damage improved by the spell amp. I don't know if you know this, but it's Q. Um, yeah. Yeah, so... Yikes. He's, he's probably going to be even better. What isn't better is Frozen Heart. There is a pretty substantial nerf. Even though we've already seen it drop off a little bit, I still think the item was fairly overtuned. Uh, can't wait until two patches from now when we do the same thing to uh, Knight's Vow, because that is going to be next up on the chopping block, because that's what every jungler is rushing now. Yeah, exactly. We just basically take whatever anyone's building first, and then we try to take that one away from them. But let's have a look at who is going to be winning this glorious award for today. The Uri Gold King. Who is it going to be who made m the most money? It will be clear. The man played Twisted Fate and he got a lot of plus sixes. Yeah, it feels like he kind of hustled this one, you know. Um, definitely when you're talking about average gold, the chef, like we've tracked it so much when we're in game where we're like, hey, look how much gold he's earned from it. Like he's 2,000 gold ahead and like 1,500 of it is just from his passive. I think it's cool. I, I think that TF is an honest, hardworking man that creates his own gold. He doesn't take his gold from his teammates, like some other Gold Kings. He made it himself. And Claire also had a really great week. I think that was yeah. really uh, the, the second takeaway. Obviously, TF generates a lot, but I think Claire is uh, one of the reasons that we mentioned as well why Ferex have been looking up. So, yeah, good for him that he's able to get the win here. And uh, Orcs and I really like players that make a lot of money, and that's why uh, we, we, we might have voted for him for something that's coming up here. OPGG Player of the Week. A little bit of a spoiler there as far as our votes are concerned, but don't worry, that means nothing because Peanut is still going to win. The man got some ridiculous scores, both up and down this week. Yeah, I feel like Peanut was, in the games that we saw uh, Honor Life Esports lose, was a little bit underwhelming, if I'm being honest. But in the games they won, it, it was definitely him being a massive driving force. And especially as they beat T1 this week, was, which was a win to happen, but a very convincing one, I think most people would say, in that matchup against them. And his poppy, the pick itself was in such a good spot, but the play was just flawless. I was a peanut voter, and for me, the, the match against T1 specifically, right, the direct competitor for the second yeah. place spot, a team that none of us, I don't even think the Korean side, anyone predicted Humble nope. Life to win. And it, it really felt like Humble Life wasn't at the same level, and with that win, they showed that they can be. So uh, even as, as mentioned, he had like tens and like one and a halves. Yeah, he had a 1.3, a 3.3, and then otherwise they were all tens. Uh, shout out to Based Wolf uh, picking up Henna there. He was actually number one when it came to scores um, for 80 carries. So that's pretty impressive. Let's have a look at what to expect for week nine, though. Starting off with today, starting off a little bit slowly, you could potentially say here, as we definitely have some top to bottom matchups, but some opportunities for some, uh, some I, I guess, upsets, perhaps. And uh, here we have everyone with exactly the same predictions. And what that means, spoiler, is that Chronicler and Hoonie are going to win the prediction for this particular season. So congratulations, guys. Um, yeah. That's a guys with Hoonie back at home. Yay. He gets a day off Hoonie. for it. Thing. His predictions. Yeah. I, I, I like them because we can talk about them. The fun we definitely, part. Yeah, not we, this week because we yeah, all have the same. It's kind of, <laughs> you know, I do think the last day everyone's voted the same, but it, it's nice that we get Fear X and Quantum Freaks playing on the last day of the season. Exactly right. Keep but in mind. we need to get into the day. It is time for the intro and to get into week nine. Still inside my blood. 
To the LCK, we are back here for week nine. It is a wonderful Wednesday afternoon, and we have DRX up against Gen G, and the fans are back. We got everybody back in the stadium. Look at how awesome this is. Yep, it is. Uh, it's been a long time coming, and it's. I'm glad we've got it back here for our final week of regular season. People are still filtering in after the pre-show did end. Big claps around as we are back here. We don't have to do any more of our own fan chants <laughs> at the beginning of the games. It's just going to be the fans themselves. So we'll have our fans here, of course, for the rest of the season, including playoffs, assuming nothing crazy happens. And uh, we got to say, Valdez, it feels like it's right. It's it's time. And, uh, you know, you and I walked over here to the cast desk earlier, and I was like, oh, that's right. I'd almost yeah. forgotten what it was like. Yeah, I actually had forgotten, but then we walked in and everybody was here and we're like, oh, yeah, everybody else is here to watch because uh, we have fixed all the issues, thankfully, and hopefully it does stay that way. As the last week of regular season, DRX plays Gen G and T1 back to back. They need to finish strong. Can they pull up an ups pull off an upset with an unbreakable spirit? Um, we'll no, see. I, I think T1 and Gen G are going to be fighting really hard, too, because they want to get as, as good of a placement as possible. As yeah. Well. I mean, look, as DRX, you're trying to finish strong, as this point of the match does kind of indicate. But I think this week is definitely about where the top teams are going to land right now in the standings. The series is way more about Gen G than it is DRX. But DRX can play spoiler uh, to Gen G, as that first place spawn is so important, uh, of course. And at the moment, it seems likely Genji will will take it, then T1 will take second, and Han will take third, but that's not set in stone. Hmm. As we've only <laughs> had seven teams ever to get the uh, first place in regular season. Of course, if you count um, the Tigers as one org when they were GE and Rocks, but Genji has done it twice, and they're looking to do it a third time. And all they need to do is to win their last two series, yeah. and they will be the first, or the, the, the team this season to clinch first and go undefeated in round two. Yeah, it's about the undefeated in terms of series. They did drop one game to DK on Sunday, so that was kind of unfortunate. They were looking for the undefeated in entirely, like no games dropped, but uh, fortunately that's off the table now. Keen, the first LCK top laner to learn, to earn, and to learn about the 1,500 kills situation. If he gets five today, which seems pretty likely, he will uh, be the first to do it. Yeah, crazy that it's gonna be him to do it. He's been around for a long time, most of his career not on dominant teams. But we will have the players to walk out to the fans for the first time in what feels like forever here, starting with DRX. Two matches left for this team, and they are not easy. DRX will walk out on the stage, facing off against Genji to start off the week. 
They've already been eliminated from playoffs contention. Rascal, see what he could do today as uh, it is a very tough season for this squad that finally found their footing at the end, but it was a little bit too late yeah. to make that playoff run. Yeah, I mean, like you're referring to Yehu came in, you know, they, they saw some nice changes with him. He was performing a bit better than Tab. We also saw that it kind of reinvigorated the team. Everybody was playing well together, but it's a bit too little too late. They obviously do not have a chance to make it into playoffs, but I think at this point, you just want to avoid 10th place, right? You, want, you don't want to be that 10th place team, so it's between them, Brian and Nongshim at this point for that 10th place spot. We'll see if they can pick up some wins here in this last week as Gen G looking to finish off the undefeated round. Yeah, Gen G, three titles in a row. In our opening video, it's always highlighted there the three trophies that they stand in front of. They could get a fourth if they're able to win this entire season. So, form at the end of the regular season does matter. Matters for standings, matters for getting that skip round into round two, which they've already secured. It matters for getting first to have the selection of opponent moving into that second round. But more than that, I think all eyes are on what Genji's read on this patch is going to be this week. And then, of course, we'll be moving to a new, new patch for playoffs. But Genji need to showcase something strong here to make the fans feel confident, of course, that we move into playoffs. They're still going to be on form. Keen versus Rascal in the past. Great matchup, right? Keen, of course, spent a lot of his career on Afrika. Rascal was actually a former Gen G player himself. Did end up playing the Renekton in the top lane during that time in 2021. Yeah. Um, so kind of a swap here in terms of the top laners, but Keen has been one of our best and has the widest champion pool in top right now. Rascal, on the other hand, has unfortunately been a shadow of his former self. Yeah, uh, even got subbed out last week for Frog, who did come in for, I believe, just the one game. But still, you know, it's not going to feel good as a veteran, as Rascal, uh, to be subbed out. And he's going to try to uh, retake his spot here. I mean, it is his spot, but he wants to solidify that for the future going forward into summer. And uh, Keen certainly looking at the top of the rankings here in the top lane, especially after some of their recent wins against strong opponents. Yeah, and some of the slight fall off from Zayas, I'd say, in the last few weeks. I'm not saying that... You know, he has become a even mid-tier top laner, Zayas, that is, but hasn't looked as dominant. So the next time these two top laners face off against each other, of course, uh, Keen and Zayas will get a better idea of that. It'll be a while until that happens. But going to this matchup, you know there's a clear favorite there. And then across the rest of the Rift, it almost <laughs> barely uh, begs speaking to, to discuss the gaps that we have in each lane, because yes, Yehu, definitely a massive improvement over Satab. That much we've known for sure since the, the day he stepped onto the Rift to, to replace him, but he's up against Chovy. You, know, you have Teddy in the bottom lane, which is a strong point for DRX. You're like, okay, it's a pretty strong scaling meta. That's Teddy's best strength, but he's playing against Pays and Lehens. And so, you know, will he be able to get it done? It is tough to say, as Pleta has also been pretty consistent this season. Maybe the bottom lane is one way they could maybe get ahead because that has also arguably been the weak point here for Genji, although to say it like that almost makes it seem, <laughs> it almost sounds silly because it's not really a weak bottom lane at all, is it? It's it's only because the top side of the map for them is insane and the best. And Chovy and Canyon are for certain the best mid jungle duo at the moment. And Keen is at worst, you know, second in terms of top laners, I would say. Yeah. So, yeah, uh, you're, you're exactly right. Peas and Lehens, they're doing just great, but the entire team is uh, pretty fantastic at the moment. Definitely the favorites going into playoffs, although we'll have to wait and see how those best of fives go and what the matchups do look like, especially after their loss against DK. The one game, they might be looking to avoid them and stuff like that. But let's talk about this series. Let's talk about this pick, Bam, because we are on 14.5. And that should bring at least some interesting picks. Yeah, we'll see what Smolder ends up looking like here. Azir is still globally banned, as was mentioned in the pre-show. So that's not available. And the, the big question for me is, is it still Senna and Smolder? Senna got slightly nerfed as well with her attack damage. So that's going to make her less of a threat, you know, when she's kind of roaming around in the early mid game. But she's already banned. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, I, I feel like the LCK might not be looking too much into this patch because we're going to be moving on to a new one coming next week. And especially if you're Genji, you don't necessarily want to show anything here. Uh, if you have a new read on what you think is going to be good on this patch or the next one. But Maokai, I think, very significantly nerfed his base movement speed. Really hurts him, especially in the support role, as was mentioned. But still can be strong with his ultimate. And he's going to be taken away as well. 
Callista was not nerfed. And yeah. uh, she is going to be the most relevant <laughs> pushing bottom laner. She was quote unquote nerfed. I mean, she was nerfed, so uh, maybe yeah. that's unfair. But it was very small. It wasn't big enough, and she's still extremely dominant. So yeah. she's that was the last patch, and she's still strong. Not changed on 14.5. And uh, yeah, Maokai, I think he's still okay in the jungle, and that's where we see him the majority of the time. So uh, does get banned away, and there's the Smolder ban as well. So banning Smolder and Senna here. With the Varus taken away, the Ash is available. Vi also is going to be first picked here now for Sponge. So that is going to be the lock-in for DRX. And it's very strong into Zeri, which I think is probably what Pays and Lahans were leaning towards if the Vi wasn't locked up here. With the Sejuani Maokai bans here and, of course, Senna and Smolder, it just felt like a no-brainer to grab this. They can take the Nautilus themselves and still go Zeri. It's still viable into Vi. It's just a little bit tougher to pull off here. Nautilus is the highest tier support right now in this meta. It'll just be first pick Jax, though, with no Sejuani. <laughs> and so this might be jungle huh. Jax, but it, they're going to keep it as a flex. Yeah, I, I suppose, you know, in recent times, we have been seeing a bit more jungle Jax. And just the fact that a champion is flexible gives it the opportunity to be picked more often and you, earlier on in drafts as well. You could go Jax Rel here, feels really strong, and then you can keep the flexibility extremely open with where those champs can go. But they will go ahead and lock the Zeri up now. Would have felt pretty good as DRX to have Zeri with Vi on your side as well. And they will end up taking this one away. Lucian, Zeri, Nami, Lulu. Question or mark. you go with Helios <laughs> Nautilus, and Zeri doesn't get to play the game, but that's not the, that's not the way we play things over here. Lucian, Nami, Zeri, Lulu, that's where we're going. It's Lahens Lulu as well, so you know it's going to be an exciting one. This is one of the best versions of Lucian, Nami, Zeri, Lulu we could ask for. And yes. uh, to Ruler, to Pays, to Lahens, to Delight, we, we do it every single different Gen G bottom lane. They'll play, the, they'll play this into Lucian, Nami. They will win the lane oftentimes as well, and then scale up to an incredible degree. And the Jax can be such a great side lane threat too, if it is going to be played top lane. Yeah, the Lulu is pretty good with the Jax as well in team fights. Jax jumps in the wild growth, and you feel pretty good about that engage in little skirmishes and stuff. Malphite. Yeah, another point click blow up Zeri uh, when the Vi ultimate comes through. If the Vi locks up the Zeri, it's impossible yeah. to stop the follow up. Rascal like has that. played it a, a decent amount already, so he's been the one guy in the top lane that's been consistent with it. Yeah, I like that. See a Cassante ban. Now, Chovy has been known to play Cassante mid, but I think this is more ex assuming that Jax is going to be flexed uh, into the jungle. As see what this final ban is. Could be another ban onto a strong engaged champion like the Rel that's still available here. Although, I suppose that with uh, the uh, Vi not being a flex pick, that's not going to be the case. But I think <laughs> they need some more engage. They need follow-up for this Vi. Win Rel top. I just think Rel is so broken, I'm like, they have to ban Rel. It can't be allowed about this. It is very strong. It's been played a lot. It's still sitting at 60% win rate over the course of many patches. So, um, uh, very consistent. Yeah. I, I feel, feel like Rel Jax especially is quite strong, but see where they want to put this going to get some more answers soon, or, or maybe not, actually, with the Twisted Fate locked in. We'll get less answers. Yeah. So likely still to be Twisted Fate top in the Jax jungle, but you have to you know, plan for the possibility that it's something else. Chovy can play so many different picks, you have no idea where this draft is going if you are DRX. So just putting a strong blind mid lane here, like this Orianna for Yehu, does feel pretty good. This feels very heavy on the top side, obviously, if they just put the Twisted Fate into the Renekton. You're going to have to put your Vi attention top side. Otherwise, you're going to have a big problem. That means the bottom side gets played out just exactly the way Pays and Lahens want it to be. So we the way in mid lane. Can be a punishable pick. Very immobile. Yeah. I think the Renekton as well um, <laughs> might be struggling a bit in that top lane if uh, Sponge is not there a lot earlier on. Let's see what Jovi wants to play. Still expecting this TF to go top. He could just play Orianna, since they didn't lock it in. I mean, a matchup that you can win into the way. Yone, or though. <laughs> Chone! Yeah, Yone is just so strong into Hui, because obviously you can get chunked out of lane early, but you have great follow-up for his ultimate with the Jax, and vice versa. And Hui is just going to really struggle if Yone starts getting online. And so now as the Vi, like Sponge, is put in this predicament where he needs to help Illusion Nami lane put down Azaria, but he also has to help 
his top laner deal with the ranged matchup into Twisted Fate, but then he also has to deal with Chovy's Yone yeah. into the immobile play. So I don't know what, what Sponge is going to choose to do in this game. And he is obviously a, a rookie player who doesn't have a ton of experience. And the agency for Canyon is extremely high. Sponge can only patch one hole in what looks like a sinking ship of a draft here, unfortunately, that Micro has put together at the end. But that's the power of these flex picks over here on the Gen G side. And if you ended up going for something else, you might end up, end up getting countered by a completely different setup there where they flex the Jack's top and then put Rel in the jungle. There's so many different things that Genji could have done. So it doesn't make it very easy to draft this one out as DRX, but it does feel like a pretty large difference in terms of what these two drafts do. Nameplates removed, nameplates on. And if you're a DRX fan, you might want to put your hands together. <laughs> do a little praying and not to the Church of Chovy. Yeah. Exactly. Um, the the Hui Vi combo is going to be pretty interesting. Ari and Talia were taken away, so they were left with that, I suppose. You hold someone in place for a long time, I, I guess Wei will be happy about it. I'm not sure if you can hold Tovi in place for a very long time, though. Let's jump into the game at number one. All right, we got our fan chance back here for match number 81, beginning of week nine, the end of the regular season of spring. It does feel like it flew by, doesn't it? Yep, it always does. Yeah. Even Every though time you do another split, it's like, oh, it's gone already. <laughs> yeah, it's weird because, you know, we had some, some metas in the past that were super all-in, super early game focused. We had a lot of short metas, and it felt like the season was was long. And this is one of those metas that feels like the opposite. We've had this crazy long scaling meta where every game is super long, and yet it feels like I'm like, wait, we're in week nine? It's the end of the season? It feels like I'm in a week like six or seven right yeah. now. Yeah, especially the end of last week, we had two back-to-back -back six game days, and every game was very long, like yeah. 30 minutes plus, but on average, I'd say like 37 to 40 minutes. Um, definitely a slower meta at the moment, and uh, we in the LCK, if it is a slow meta, if we ever begin to lean even slightly in that direction, you know we'll embrace it. Oh, we do. <laughs> we, we do. Um, and we love it. As Rascal only played one game of Renekton, the other game was played by Frog, um, the Renekton. That's when he was subbed in. People were very surprised to see that, considering Rascal's history on the pick. Uh, we talked about earlier when we said he was Genji player. Um, and he played a lot of Renekton. That was where the Chronicler Renekton Azir memes came from. And it's very, very strong on the pick, but it is not a strong matchup into Twisted Fate. Can be deadlier later on, obviously, but it's going to require a lot of help from Sponge. As Keen should be able to keep him at arm's length and kind of chunk him out and use gold cards very effectively. The Ruse cooldown on the E for Renekton, that buff that put him back into the meta, will definitely be helpful, but it's not going to win you the lane. Yeah, definitely not. Good respect here from Teddy and Pleta, as they were not going to hit level 2 at the same time, so they had to back away from that spike. Uh, Zeri and Lulu very good at hitting minions and dealing damage to them quickly, so oftentimes we'll hit level 2 first, unless the Lucian Nami can put on early pressure, which they were not able to. And uh, still very curious about this choice, because you knew the TF was almost definitely going top. Yes, it could have been flexed, flexed into mid, and maybe that's why they went for Renekton, but Still, the fact that they held the TF card up and said, well, this could be going top, I think this Renekton will definitely struggle, regardless of who it's going to be. My you know, my issue is that the Twisted Fate just kind of is such a great answer. We've seen so many teams, but Keen and Genji the, have been the best at it, of being the opposite side of the map to the Zeri, because you know you're likely playing into a melee matchup where you're going to have a lot of control with the meta picks, as now Sponge is going topside. He's going to try to maybe get something done here, but he, he just doesn't have a, a ton of opportunity to do so because Kane has Flash and Ghost. That's another thing Twisted Fate gets because he has his ultimate, so doesn't need teleport, so he's not weighted down by that. His Rascal is uh, very low, yeah. and he went Fleet Footwork, which is great into this matchup. He has so much control over this lane, and if uh, Vi tries to come over your pre-ult, Kane just ghosts away. Nice dodge here from Chovy as well, playing this matchup very well. Yeah, the bottom of the map went completely uh, pays Lehen's favor. They got level two first. We were able to control that early game as well. And now, obviously, it has gone a little bit back. We'll see some backs come through in the bottom lane. But this is the kind of heavy uh, topside weight that you have that resources have to be committed to. 
Otherwise, you just end up getting super far behind. Now, Keen has done the first job, which is to get the teleport out. Now, if he pushes him in a second time with no answer, he'll start getting plate gold. Rascal will start actually losing minions. So, this is where things get really tough for Sponge. Yeah, Rascal. Nice little trade here. The red card pulled up by Keen. But uh, at the end of the day, still not going to feel too good. And yeah, I mean, TF did receive a pretty substantial nerf on this patch, but it doesn't really... It doesn't really affect the fact that he's still a ranged top laner that can harass a melee one in the top side. So he's going to be having a good time here, as we've been talking about. Mid lane seems to be going decently well for Yehu. Actually able to poke out Chovy early on. Another range versus melee match. Oh. Yeah, doing a good job of pushing his health low here. And I'll try to see if he can force Chovy to teleport. Chovy with some great sidesteps on the crushing maw so far. Still is going to get QQ'd there. As, yeah, you can just see Keen is... He is really just not caring about the crocodile. It looks like uh, Twist of Fate's looking for a new crocodile belt. Um, yeah. And he is approaching the said belt. <laughs> yeah. For now, Rascal down about 10 CS. Bottom lane here at level 4. Seems like Paze just got back to lane as uh, able to harass them back and push them out. We have TP as well here out of Yehu. Chovy did go back. He's got level 6 now. So a new level of pressure that can be obtained by the Oni. Yeah, I do wonder, you know, Valdez, if the fact that we see so much Lucian Nami into Zeri despite it losing lane to, to good teams so often is just a product of teams practicing this because it's been so meta for so long as Lens is in trouble. Well, you can do this as well. Flash forward from Teddy, but Lens is too quick. As now Pace trying to take the 1v2. This is not going well. He's missing kind of everything now. As Flash forward with the bubble. That's going to be first blood going to Pace though. And now Pleta is going to pick up the kill. Pleta, unfortunately, I think extending for the Lulu. Maybe should have just focused on the Zeri. And that will give first blood to Pace. Yeah, that does end up giving Pace the first blood. He's probably shocked to see it. Didn't want to use his Flash there and will not do so. So three summoners down for DRX. Three, four. Genji, but critically, the flash still available for Pays is massive for him in this laning phase. We'll be able to get back to lane very quickly because he's Zeri. Genji will also secure with Chovy coming up here the first objective, and it will even grab this crab as well. Looks like your sponge over here to potentially contest, but a little bit too slow, and Chovy can come assist. So nothing really to be done here. You have to respect the Yone's level six. Yeah, level seven. Level seven actually. Now. Just got the level up. Feeling pretty good. Kanye was able to get that Scuttle Crab. And pays with the money. Goes back, buys a new Quiver. He's also so, got a Cole, so I mean, he is yeah. really going to start accelerating quite quickly. And we'll watch the play again here as Lehens actually stays for a little bit. Really trying to trade aggressively into Teddy and Pleta, which is why they were pushing this lane super hard. I think maybe miscalculating Teddy's mana, as Teddy obviously is able to get a little bit back the, here. And then Pleta just bubbles free. Zeri yeah. and forces a flash at least. I think you don't give the first blood over to Pays. Maybe the concern there was that another shield would come through, but don't think so. Um, and yeah, I think the greed was real on that one from Pleta. If you just bubble the Zeri, you kill her 100%, you've already won the play. Yeah, I mean, she did have flash, so maybe you at least get the flash. Yeah. But I think if she's like spending time flashing away and not utilizing her Q, you know, even for a split second could have potentially taken her out before she did get the first blood. But a very close trade in the bottom side. Yeah, this lane matchup has been played by every single pro in the LCK for the last two years so much that everyone feels like they have such a great mastery of it. But I think the mastery of it will eventually favor the um, the Lulu and the Zeri. Like, the, it has a higher skill ceiling of how the matchup was played out, and we've seen it win more and more often, and obviously it scales better, which is why the Lucian wants to, to get ahead and get massive advantages. And it's just shocking that the LCK really hasn't adapted that much at dealing with this. It's just been so much into all into the, let's play Lucian, because if you play Aphelios, we can't. And I get that too in this particular series matchup, because if you're Teddy, you're like, I'm Teddy, I'm good at late game, but it's Pays Lehens, it's Gen G, it's Chovy on Yone, you know, in this particular game. He didn't know that, of course, we locked in the Lucian, but what if he engages on me? His engages are so crisp, they always have map control. I don't want to play Aphelios into that. I want to be the one who dictates the pace at least. Well, level six here for Rascal. Stun card does come through, and that's the end of the trade. 
So he's able to use it to push the lane and get out of lane and get a good reset. So I, I assume that's what he was doing. Yeah. So, and to your point, Wolf, there were also four AD carry bans early on in the draft. So as you were saying, you don't want to play one of these picks that we don't really see anymore, which is like the Aphelios, right? So with Smoldergong, Callista, San Avaris, you don't really have some of these new age picks that we see oftentimes. So just go back to old reliable Lushinami. Sorry, Lulu. Yeah. Well, the back timing for Rascal, as you mentioned, means that he should be able to get away with getting back and won't lose too much CS. He will lose a plate. However, now Sponge is up here. There's a ward. Now that's a red card as well. Keen's in a bit of trouble. And he is going to utilize the Ghost, trying to just outrun the Vi here. Gold's card is going to come through, but easily canceled by the Cease and Desist. Keen still holding on to his Flash, though, and he is going to utilize it, and they can't get under the turret. Guess what? Yeah, now Canyon says, oh, this is a free little dive down here on the bottom side. Tidal Wave comes through. It's a double bubble. It's going to hit them as Teddy gets some huge damage into the hands, but at the end of the day, Teddy also is going to bite the dust. That is a two-for-one in favor of Genji. Here is Yehu. Trying to make some plays is going to force a flash at a pace. Now, luckily for Pace, he didn't have to flash earlier. We'll have it to escape from that long range coming through from Yehu, so he does not end up dying there. Uh, would have been close as they're going to at least get some plate gold up here. Lahens is rushing up to try to put out this fire here in the top side as Rascal is getting incremental advantages from this, right? You, you know, you got the summoners out of Keen. Now you're going to grab a plate. Looks like you won't be able to get the second one. Oh, okay, just will barely stay in range of it there. He was hitting the turret moments before, but. Two plates picked up there. He's 20 CS down at Swisted Fate. In terms of his passive, he's going to have a gold advantage, but Rascal's getting something out of this. It's down here on the bottom side. As this is happening, topside pays all ins into this, knowing that Canyon obviously knows that his opponent is topside and come down here for this play. Tidal Wave goes off here before the aggro is hit um, for Canyon, and then he double bubbles, so a ton of extra damage goes down here on the Pays. Teddy will burst down the Lulu, but Pays still healthy enough to get out, even with that er uh, aggro on him. We'll have to flash, of course, when Yehu comes down, but a good play, good reaction to that extended topside play coming through from Sponge. <laughs> Yehu kind of an awkward spot there up against the wall. Uh, Canyon is going to pick up the third bub for himself. Looks like uh, Sponge took two and then ran away. So, very nicely done in the trade, but Genji's still feeling pretty good about their situation at this point. At least DRX got that early Mountain Drake. It's going to be a little bit of a bonus, but in terms of the gold lead in this early game, should be all Genji. Uh, the um, bottom side here left a little bit on its own. Paze has to, you know, with his Shiv now, just catch minion waves, but that's okay. He has Shiv. He's not going to lose too much, as Chovy will lose half his health bar. Um, but, you know, Lehens made it the save top side to make sure nothing worse went down there. They got Rascal out. Yes, he did get two plates, but he's not going to be able to pressure any further. Um, you know, kept Yehu at arm's length in mid. So Lehens is doing a lot of stuff on the room right now, and Pace is just happy to sit down there. So once again, Chovy just keeps dodging these. He does. The ult is going to come through, though, as Chovy is going to elect to get out of there with his own ultimate ability. Didn't want to go in, so can always just use that to, to get out. As level six Pleta, not going to be happy with this level eight Zeri blocking his way. Pleta puts down another control ward after one is immediately cleared. Yeah, yeah who will oh, no. grab the Archangels here, try to complete that. Does have his first item before Chovy. He did teleport just back to lane. So a big spike here for DRX to potentially fight over this first dragon. It's not completed, obviously, but it is his first core item. And Rascal. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Still chasing him, and a huge amount of burst damage comes in on the Pays, but Rascal, he chases too far. The flash comes out. He's got a dash over the wall, and he will be okay. But now, with uh, Canyon up on the top side, Sponge can do the same thing that Canyon just did a minute before. And pressure on the bottom side. Meanwhile, Chovy is getting some pressure in mid, though. Yeah, Yahoo decided to, to come down there to try to make sure they could follow up on that play, but I don't know if that was necessary. It's going to cost him a plate that it, I don't think he really needed to lose. His Rascal's still in an uncomfortable sp spot. No ult, no flash. Clears the wave. Oh, boy. Yeah, he's, he's dead. Uh, he doesn't have flash. He doesn't have any more dashes. He's just taken out. Kind of funny. Uh, just <laughs> Kenyon's behind the turret as Keen is harassing him out of range of the turret, and they just wait until the right moment, and it's an easy kill. I mean, they had to put some pressure on right, and I think if Canyon isn't topside there, you don't commit to the bottom side play to, to zone pays out, but they don't kill pays, they don't kill the hens. Yes, plate gold is given over here to Teddy. 
But at the same time, you know, Canyon is topside, so you end up losing control of the, the play. You lose the Renekton. You lose plates at mid because Yehu roamed. You will still get the Dragon. Uh, I was talking about moments before the second of the game for them here. We'll find out what the soul is going to be and how relevant this is. Ocean, so... I really feel like that doesn't do much. Yeah. Into this comp especially, which is very all-in, and it's going to be diving you. Like, you don't have a lot of time to, you know, regenerate health, let's say. No. So, uh, not not too lucky with that one. It was kind of a 50-50. There was also Chemtech on the cards, so they avoid that, but they get Ocean and don't get any of the cool ones. If it was Hextech, you know, or Infernal, I think you'd feel really good about this, especially yep. Yehu. Um, and Teddy can get some slows, and they can set some stuff up with that, with uh, you know his ultimate, things like that. But even Cloud would have felt okay, but obviously it's not going to be Cloud um, Rift. But yeah, Ocean feels like perhaps next to Chemtech the worst one uh, in this case for DRX, which doesn't feel great about that being the only advantage you have in this game. I mean, you blink and it's a 4,000 gold lead. Uh, yeah, he just flashed, and now there's a TF underneath the turret. He's got to run. The fear is excellent, but now he's got a Yone right behind him, and Chovy just barely going to get away. Sponge is going in, and he might be able to pick up this kill. Yes, he will, but now level 10 Canyon is getting on in there as the jungle jacks, and you're not getting away from this one, especially with the TF gold card, as that will be another kill in the hands of Genji. Genji to see everything on the map, every single play, every single angle, and, I mean, it's just a... Uh... It's just Keen showing up to tank the turret at the end of the day there. <laughs> Chovy ends up getting two kills here for Genji. And like I said, it's a 4,000 gold lead, 15 minutes. You know, just suddenly you look at the top of the map and you're like, okay, well, yeah, it's Twisted Fate. There's some money coming through, but the Zeri's got two kills. You only picked uh -oh. up some plates and Oh, no. And, and uh, Plata does have heal and tidal wave. He's got a lot of stuff to actually help. And you know what? Canyon oversteps. And he's just going to flash out of there. He's like, never mind. I'm sorry. I didn't mean it. Teddy has cleanse, and he is going to utilize it here just to be safe. Really annoying here, though, because even though they almost kill Canyon and force him to flash, and Keen <laughs> doesn't get a kill, it means that Teddy has to go back, and he's not going to be able to farm in the mid lane. Chovy's just going to hold on that. Zeri pushing bottom into this Renekton, so a lot of gold's just being lost across the map here for DRX right now. Mid turret also gone. And we got Yehu around as the fear is going to come through. A huge amount of bursts onto Paze, but the wild growth makes him a tank. And he's just going to flash away after taking damage from the fireball. As now, Nady Canyon thinking about diving that turret. And just going to wait until the Renekton goes, and then he's going to wait until the way goes. And the TP comes through, actually, so maybe just waiting to actually dive here as a three-man unit, 1v3. Yeah, once the wave crashes, they have an opportunity for sure. Yahoo doesn't have flash. It is Huey, and he's trying desperately to clear the wave, but he's not going to clear the cannon. A very unfortunate timing for him. They're just going to kill the turret. <laughs> it's not even a dive anymore. They're just 3v1 bullying him on the bottom side of the map. Yeah, really nicely played here from Canyon. He is just everywhere right now. Every single play looks like it might go DRX as well. Maybe they could turn this. Oh, Zeri's low. She had to flash. She's walking away, but you don't chase because you know Canyon is coming. He has just turned almost every single play around this game. Had an early Triforce. Does so much damage. They just take the turret out. Kill the way who, you know, just teleported back in. So now he's down TP. And this obviously moments before was the play with Twisted Fate coming down. Keen does decide to come over here. Ends up just tanking the turret as the wave is cleared, gets feared, but it doesn't matter. Buys enough time for Chovy, he lives with like 50 health. And then yes, he will die to Sponge, but then they turn the play back around. Ends up being a two for one. Very clean stuff here from Canyon, who's just so accelerated this game on the jacks. And here, you know, not much you can do is Yehu tries to clear the wave, and they just kill the turret because Jax is good at doing that, even when he's in the jungle, as it turns out. Counter-Strike comes down, not much he could do. And where's Sponge? He's topside doing the Herald. So at least they got that. Yeah. And Canyon, from the jungle, you mentioned this Jungle Jax. He is so accelerated that he already has Trinity Force and a Tunneler. I mean, this guy, he looks like he's a laner. <laughs> he looks like he's an accelerated laner with how much gold he has. And he is a significant threat. Chovy also ahead pretty significantly on farm. We also have the TF, obviously, we mentioned a lot. The bottom lane also did go in favor of Gen.G. So DRX are getting all these individual objectives, like the Rift Herald, a couple of Drakes, but it's kind of rough to use those objectives if you are behind 6,000 gold. Yeah, it's just map read differences here from Gen.G. The macro is what's so impressive about this. I feel like we've seen some really cool mechanical plays out of Teddy. We saw Plato with the double bubble. 
Yahoo obviously knows how to get out of a, a tough situation, clear the wave, look for a fear, things like that. But Genji are just trading up every single time. It feels like maybe DRX have this one sliver, this one shining light. And then you, you see the, the swath of darkness that is Genji collapsing on them and Canyon running at them. As this turret also not going to die to the charge. And with uh, Shiv here, they're going to clear it so the turret even stays alive. Huh. Nearly took it out there, actually, Teddy, at the very end of that. As here comes Keen, it's going to ult down over. And Rascal just barely not having his TP means they kind of just have to give this one up. It's just an individual Ocean Drake. It's not the end of the world, but I feel like the Ocean Drakes are better for Genji into what they're facing off against in terms of like Lucian Poke, Way Poke, Way Poke yeah. and be very annoying. They will get the turret on the next wave, but they could not get the dragon to be contested. And obviously the Zeri is a big problem. She already does have Phantom Dancer online. Uh, had the Shiv early, same timing as Teddy. Teddy is also at two items, but the Zeri in team fights can be so much more impactful as the game goes on. So DRX kind of want to fish for a fight before their comp loses its relevance. Obviously, the way is going to be strong later on, but the Renekton's going to fall off. The Lucian will fall off for a bit. He goes into his own little power trough in the mid game, and that's when Zeri is going to really shine. And the, the immobile Hui is what I'm most concerned about, considering you have Gold Card, you have Jax, you have Yone Ultimate from Chovy. Same could be said of Teddy. If he tries to go fishing for some damage himself, he wants to go a little aggressive, proc his passive, drop his ultimate onto somebody. Even Lahens, for example, who looks like a good target. He just wild grows himself, and then suddenly the Yoni's there on the cross, Redemption. or Canyon's there. Redemption. It's uh, it's an uphill battle, you know? Um, I just think the draft put DRX in such an awkward spot where Canyon was going to have so much agency, and look at what he's done with it. It's just absurd. Yeah, he's, uh, he's had a very fun game, for sure. It also helps that all of his lanes went to... Uh, pretty swimmingly, right? He just kind of got to full clear and be there when they needed him most, which he always was, credit to him. And now DRX just trying to hold on in this current spot. Fortunately, it doesn't feel like there's too much to hold on to, as now Yehu in a lot of trouble gets flashed, gold carded, and CC'd to death. And that'll be the end of him. Good luck trying to side lane against all of this they? roaming power from Genji. They have to contest Baron. J DRX here, they have to check this, and so... Very scary now. Uh, you have to be on the top side of the map. Yone's still bottom, but that's teleport, of course. And Keen's just going to push this wave out. They had to come in there and check because Genji might have said, hey, you know, we, we took out your mid laner. It's 21 minutes in, but yeah, we might start a Baron. You have to be aware of it. And we'll clear out the vision now. As it's impossible to side lane this way. How can you team fight this way if you don't have map control into this? I mean, it was just like we were saying moments ago. Way's a strong pick, has a lot of poke, has horizon focus completed now. But, but. have to live long <laughs> enough, you know? Yeah. It does feel like there is a relatively sizable but with, yeah. with one team uh, in this case. Um, just trying to figure out what kind of position the way does have uh, in this game. Well, if you want to put two T's on it, I feel like Genji might butt in uh, to his plan. Oh, boy. <laughs> <laughs> it's perfect. Uh, and look at this. The engage is pretty perfect as well as Bun's trying to get something done. He's going to get Blast Coned in. Unfortunate. Very um, rare usage of that plant, but that's going to be his demise. As that is the end of Sponge. Genji are just kind of playing with their food at this point. They have total control over all of the map. They could do Baron if they want, but they're not going to take that risk. Nope. Chovy just going to clear this last wave. He'll probably be back. We'll see how much money he has. He could stay a little bit longer. They just have so much control. He could just wait for the next wave and keep hitting the turret. They're going to three-man this mid turret. Actually, even Canyon coming over here. Look at how much damage he does. It's just absurd. Yeah. Calling comes out. Cleared the wave, I guess. And meanwhile, uh, Wei still exists in this game, I swear. And again, it doesn't even really feel like this is Yahoo's fault. Like, he, he tried his best. He did get caught the one time, but then the TF ganked him. Like, you know, what are you going to do? Yeah. It's hard. It is really hard. It's a hard comp to pilot. And Genji left himself so many outs in draft. He was winning the lane before that. <laughs> he was like up on CS. It's uh, sometimes feels not fair. Chovy's just spent this entire last five minutes on the side. He hasn't even been in team fights. There haven't really even been team fights. It's been skirmishes only that Genji are winning. We haven't seen a 5v5. So Pays, he has three kills. Has his uh, Quick Blades online now. He's like, I'm waiting for uh, the 5v5 team fight. That may never come for my scaling area that's on three. As uh, 40 seconds until this dragon spawns. And look at where DRX are on the map. 
nowhere near it. They're going to have to fight tooth and nail and leapfrog their way through vision to get to that 5v5 fight. Their first of the game, maybe their last of the game if they can't make it work here on this dragon. And if they just let the dragon go, Jovi goes back to a side. Pick your poison, DRX. Keen runs in a straight line at them, takes more than half his health bar, but he's still going to land the gold card, so I guess he did his job. He's got the RFC online, and they're not able to dodge him. His cannon is behind the whole team. Tovi getting in there. He's going to keep Rascal around, takes him down. A lot of damage into Tovi, but meanwhile, the front line of DRX is just disappearing, evaporating before our eyes. As now Pace underneath the turret, another gold card is going to hit Teddy as he doesn't have anyone else on his team. That is a clean ace for the side of Gen G. There you go, there you have it. 24 and a half minutes in, they're gonna push to end here. 30 seconds on the Lucian, 30 seconds on the way. It's over. It's done, that's it. There, that was the last and only real team fight. And it wasn't even a real team fight. It was just them getting caught. Keens, it's like, that's the Twisted Fate gameplay. I lose half my health bar, press gold card, my team wins. <laughs> I and, have and the RFC, I attacked him from miles away. The space laser that is the TF. And yeah, he will get the zoom in from production for that one, I guess. Um, I don't even know who to vote for for POG, honestly. I, I think it was kind of just maybe Canyon? Yeah, it's a Canyon vote for me. Yeah. I uh, I felt like he controlled so much of the early game. And every single play that, that DRX thought maybe they were going to turn, Canyon said no. From the moment Spun showed topside, and then they set up that dive bottom side, which was well played by Teddy and Plata as well as they could have, but they're still down a member. And I mean, Genji just from start to finish, better map reads, super oppressive as they always are. Did we learn anything about this patch from this game? No, not really. We just we just reminded everyone, or Genji reminded everyone, they're still top dog in the LCK. TF still does what he did. Um, he is a little bit less oppressive in terms of the amount of damage he does, but he's still an incredible range versus top matchup, takes Ghost, still bullies those melees, and um, he still presses gold card with RFC. Yeah. <laughs> he's still I mean, doing his job, he's fine. His I main, feel like that's what I learned about the draft or his the main job from this. His main job in this was to make the draft frustrating for DRX and just to put an anchor top side so the Pays and the Hens get the free bot lane. Yeah. Well, that was game number one, guys. I hope game number two is a little bit closer, but not sure I can guarantee that. We're going to take a break and have the space, and we'll be right back. ちょうどできねちょうどできねちょうどできねちょうどできねちょうどできねちょうどできねちょうどできねちょうどできねちょうどできねちょうどできねちょうどできねちょうどできねちょうどできねちょうどできねちょうどできねちょうどできねちょう
trying to make himself felt at this point in the game before it goes too much farther. Aiming is going to get bubbled as he does have a very aggressive positioning. Here comes Bob as they have the engage from behind onto uh, the back line. As down will go King into the platform from Zeus, it's going to be enough to take away aiming as he just gets Wobble Combo down. Probably a lot. Uncanny. How uh, still Jackie on the front foot. Yeah. And now a Fate's Call is going to come through. Dylan does find the handshake onto Chovy in the bailout onto himself. Lahance. Is he going to go down? No, he's not, but it's going to be the double anyway. Lucid gets one of them, and there's one for aiming. He's 5 0 5. Chovy just take this one. Yeah, Lucid is running across the Cloud Rift. And he is going to be able to get in there. Not able to, but he gets into the back line. They managed to find Chovy, but he survives for that little bit too long. Pays is getting out of there, but that means he's not going to be able to defend the rest of his teammates. And T Plus find everyone. We're just setting up for a Rift Girl fight. Okay. Fate Call just came up. And we're just going to go for the flash forward from Carry. It doesn't get much of anything as it's going to go to Finger, actually. Peanut in the pit. He's living for so long. And he gets over the wall as well. Nearly gets another passive in there, but still going to be a nice little one for two three. And soaking up a lot of it. Take 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 I mean, we'll get to play the game. Yeah. Esports. Oh, here we go again. He gets it again. Now to two tankier members, oh. but he's got his whole team there, and they all just burst to smithereens. It's now how will I esports fly me free? He goes to about two thirds health. He'll be able to possess Shelly. And she will be the demolition crew, but now they dive oh! on in the five man magnet storm and the stun is just as good. DRX, how are you finding these team fights in back to back games? And DRX, they just all of a sudden on the floor. Quite do too much here as now closes splits up the fight. Typing shot is so good as Cuz. He's gonna get the two lots of execute gets into the back line, and there's no Mega Knight for Dudu Bulldog. It's just torn to shreds. And Fear X, they do not want to give up on the playoffs. They are looking for it this early into the. Carol did have to use his hook defensively, but has somewhat reset its cooldown. It looks like they are still looking for a fight. Valkyrie out there from Karis. There's a flash forward. Gideon getting on top of Beryl, but he's not necessarily a priority as the three knockups do come in. And now Perfect just launches himself into the back line. Mom gets angry. Gideon is just dead. It's a kill for the world champion Kindred player. And Polo, he's the next one on the menu. It's Death that's going to barbecue him. A triple kill. Are you kidding a quadra, me? Make it a quadra. It's a penta kill for Pyojin. And 14 minutes, he gave one. Oh my god, it's incredible.
Welcome back to The Space, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Atlas, joined by Orcs and Chronicler, as we were in the pre-show, and we have got a game to delve into. Genji, kind of making short work of uh, DRX in that one, but it was pretty exemplary play from them, so maybe we can focus on that. Started with the draft. Yeah, uh, TFs are looking pretty good, and picking the Renekton into it didn't feel like the best decision. That really wasn't yeah. a fun lane matchup, and also, the Lucian army, which, like, you, you saw the hands and pays really do a good job in the laning phase, but also I feel like old Lucian army, back when this was like the most common matchup, like the lane wasn't too hot then into Zeri Lulu, but it was mostly like the fact that once you got a one item, you were just so powerful. And I don't think the one item spike is as strong as then. So they didn't end up being able to match up well in the laning phase. And then thanks to some help from Canyon, uh, they got set really far behind and you just never really saw them come to fruition. I feel like it's a, Difficult comp for DRX to pilot, and you kind of saw that come out. Also, really like the respect paid here by Gen.G in just banning the free AD carries, Kalista, Smolder, and Senna. Just saying, if we get a even relatively even game, we're always going to win. Uh, Oaks, uh, as pilot, or as mentioned, this a lot as well, where Smolder can just create these crazy upsets, even though I think for Gen.G this is going to happen. Uh, Chovy played Yone, which I guess was 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 here in this game, even though we didn't feel yep. like he was really necessary. The one thing I do want to highlight is the Jax into the Vi. We have seen uh, Jungle Jax slowly make a rise, and on the LPL it's way more popular, so I could see that maintain uh, a position as a Vi counter pick instead of banning Vi because it frees up your drafts a bit. And also the Zin Zhao is also such a good pick as well. Yeah, not to mention the fact that you can then flex the Jacks, and they held on to that until the second round of picks as well. And the Jacks did some great things, and it started off in the early game, but it was after these shenanigans here, which was a bit heartbreaking for DRX. Yeah, you know, it's a position where the hen's pretty low on mana and very low on health, but the problem is once you burn all your cooldowns as a Lucian army, like here, Teddy's just kind of autoing, and you really don't hold up well against the Zeri. They do end up trading kill for kill, but Pays being the one who gets it definitely favors you there. And now you're down a lot of summoners, and Pays goes for a great early trade here to set up a dive. Unfortunately for Plata and Teddy, if you start falling behind in this matchup, the game is just kind of... Free kinda Plata, man. Done, He's so good. His so bubbles good. were so good. Yeah, it, it, just, it just doesn't really matter. I don't even feel like that one was up to Teddy either, right? Like, obviously, Kane is going to do a really good job. There was also... Yehu, who got punished, so he didn't really get to influence you. So there was trying to help his side lanes. And there is no one in particular on DRX that you look towards and go like, man, if this player would play better, it was just all around. Genji were running the early game, and when Genji get an early game lead, the game is just... Yeah, it's it's pretty doomed. And they're also set up with, you know, a, an incredible side laning composition just in general. We were sort of joking about it, saying that it was a 1-1-1 one, one, one with, like, Lulu Zeri running around the jungle because they've got some of the best split-pushing champions in the game. And this is an example of that. They just, after getting a slight lead, they just took over everything. And that slight lead was then 10,000 gold without even having a team fight. Look at these highlights. Look at the turret taking. Look at the PVE. It's glorious. And they were ahead in CS over the clock in three positions at 22 minutes. Yeah, I mean, I feel like Gen G are just such a good team at uh, resource allocation and just so efficient at just picking up gold across the map. We kind of talked about how they can comfortably play through multiple lanes. Obviously, usually Chovy is the star, but it feels like they just outscale you because they just get more gold from the map, whether it's through turrets or farm. And I felt like DRX, you know, obviously there was those early plays that were punished on. We saw uh, Yahoo get dove in the bot lane. But it feels hard to place a specific moment where we felt like they made a big mistake. It was just death by a thousand cuts. It's so interesting because Canyon always was the farming jungler type of guy, and Peanut definitely wasn't. So now Chovy is flanked by people that also love to pick up all the. Oh, we've the got like now. minds just farming things out. Well, let's see who farms the POG. It's going to be Canyon, obviously. 900 points. Uh, he could theoretically, if he gets like another three in this next, if they win another game in this series and then win a couple more, he could tie Chovy. It could happen. Yeah, and Chovy fans fuming right now. How dare Canyon try and hit Chovy's chance of maintaining first place in the PSG? It's, it's I know, it's, it's it's actually like, it's pretty rough. Look at look at the face of the man in the bottom left. He shows no mercy. What about the votes in the bottom left? That's what I'm looking for. I'm looking for triple mid, trying to save Chovy from being robbed. I, I, there's gotta be one. What? 
Do you reckon there's, there's no, going to be one? No trophy for, I could well, think it's 12 out of 12. No, I, I no, 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 no I don't think one. it's trophy vote. I think there is uh, a pace vote. Oh. I think there's two pace votes. There's 100% going to be at least one trophy vote. Zero trophy votes. Oh, it's a Crazy. top lane vote. That's fine. I think actually this is a good split. Damn, base media today. I guess we don't, we don't get to have yeah, any fun. Wow. Yeah. It's just good. It's just good. I'm shocked. I think the keen votes are fantastic. So never you mind. Uh, we've just got really intelligent people um, here at Low Park. Um, but now there is going to be a little bit of a change. It's time to welcome the frog to Low Park. And I, I think this is a bit a bit sad because you pick Renekton into Twisted Fate and then you sub him out. Yeah, but also Frog guts to play against KT and Gen G. If you're gonna pull in Frog, put him in like six weeks ago. Yeah, that would be a good idea. But yeah. it's time. Like, let's go now and uh, and check out game two. See whether Frog can stand up to the pressure. Thank you so much, Spacers, for that awesome breakdown. As we are just about ready to jump into game number two, Frog will be playing. In game number two, he does like his own set of Renekton games. Hopefully we don't see it again into TF, but um, wouldn't be surprised if they hop back onto the blue side and run it back either. Yeah. I Look, I think the reason why Rascal is being subbed out is, and this is my personal theory, I have no, there's no data on this. I don't have any secret behind the scenes info. We know you control everything, Wolf. Well, I mean, yeah. Well, well, it's, thanks for I remember what happened three weeks ago. <laughs> Let's jump with this draft, but I think they want to make Frog their long-term top laner for summer. I think they're they're thinking he's a higher prospect right now in terms of his growth potential. Rascal hasn't shown this season. And uh, I think, you know, we're seeing shared play time here. I don't think it was about the game. I don't think it was about the draft. I think they, they probably told Rascal, you play game one, Frog plays the rest of the series. And that's what we're going to see uh, for this one. The rest of the series might not last too long. Things don't change, but they'll take the Twisted Fate away here in game two. Not going to leave that one for Gen.G to play. As everything else looking fairly similar here, they will ban the Sejuani. The Varus is gone. Callista, Senna, will we see Smolder? Probably. Yes. Ban it. Don't let Teddy play it. His celebration is too good. He's not allowed to play the pick anymore. The Maokai was what was left open, and they will first pick it this time around. Even though it has been significantly nerfed in base movement speed and the W cooldown, but the movement speed is the big one. And he got like buffed with his clear, so he could still clear to make up for the fact that he you know, runs through the jungle a little bit slower. As for Genji, see what they want to answer with here. Lucian. Zeri. Lucian. Nami. Versus Zeri Lulu, but this time on the other side. Or will it be something more interesting here? We know how much Challengers loves Maokai Rumble, Maokai Jace. Frog is in. And Maokai Tristana is the LCK special. Yeah, at least for now, that is what it looks like we are going to be seeing. Yahoo being given a, a big task here to pop off on this Tristana into Chovy. And they will grab that Jace I was talking about with this. Frog has played this in Challengers. It's not surprising to see. Yeah, I like that they're not running it back, really. Uh, change up the early bans, change up the early draft, and, and try something new here. Does look like Genji is you know, mixing up their own draft in response to this. And they might get their hands onto this Rel pick as well, which we were talking about uh, is a very strong pick at the moment. And Lushinami and the Rel will be coming through here. It looks like it's not Lushinami Zeri Lulu, just Lushinami because I would expect them to at least ban the Zeri at this point, with just the Tristana showing. Yeah, Rel. Getting locked in here means that you have really good counter engage after the Maokai ult. And it's very difficult for the Jace to do anything but poke. He's obviously, that's what he's best at, but he can't come in and finish targets off. But if he goes to the skies, he uh, will be eliminated very quickly if they're not able to get that elimination instantly. Is The Lulu ban here I think is smart. Just saying, you're not going to be playing Zeri Lulu into this. Lulu's great at mitigating Lucian's damage in general. As the Talia ban here makes a lot of sense because you want to be able to roam bottom side with Weaver's Wall, make impactful plays, can be very strong into Tristana, as we've seen. Final ban here will be Rakan. So taking away the different types of engage that Pleta could use after the Magnet Storm to turn those fights. Rumble. 
is gone. I don't know if they were planning on playing Rumble into Jace, but interesting choice. Yeah. Not sure about that one. Uh, perhaps because of Rumble Ash, but no, because it's Lucian. So I don't know. <laughs> I don't really know about that one. A bit puzzling. I mean, Rumble seems to be Corky all seems right, like it would have been a better after band. the nerfs. You know? So. Yeah. Uh, Corky definitely has been something Jovi has picked up. The Oriana, though, is going to be the choice. Yeah, I'm surprised. I, I think the Corky was a fantastic pick with this draft, as the Ash is left open, like I was talking about, and it's going to be Caitlyn Ash into this Lucian Nami. Strong lane here for Teddy and Pleta. They actually might be able to, to make that their, their really strong point on this map. See what's going to be picked into this Jace now for Keen. Uh, Cassante is still available. We saw him dismantle uh, Owner and uh, Zayus together with it when Zayus played the Jace in the series against Gen G, and that's what he's going to do again here, or at least hope to do, into Frog on the Jace. Kane is pretty insane on Cassante. He does have that one clip where I was like, oh, well, I guess it's just Cassante, and then he won not be 3'd. Um, it's not. It's not fair when he does get his hands on this champion. It was banned in the second phase of game one because they didn't want to see him play it. But this time they said, I think that the TF is a bigger issue. And the Rumble for some reason. Yeah, I, the Rumble is still very puzzling. But at the end of the day, what I like about DRX's comp is it's very simple to play out. You have Maokai, you hold people in place, put the Ash Arrow down, and then Jace Poke hits that single target that's in the front line. And as long as that target is not Cassante, they are going to be out of the fight, and likely dead, uh, if you can set up those fights consistently. Then you can get Drusana to come in there and finish that target off, get jump resets, and then, you know, those team fights do make sense. They do play out very well. You also don't have the Renekton into Twisted Fate top matchup where you've just thrown your draft to the, to the wayside and you're just hoping that Canyon doesn't play well, because that's kind of what the Game 1 draft felt like for me for DRX. And perhaps Rascal was asking for the Renekton. Give me the Renekton pick here. I think I can pilot it. Maybe I could do it. And this time, Frog will be taking a different approach with the Maokai swap up here in the bands as well. Pretty smart for DRX. Now, nameplate's on here. I look at this comp for Genji. I go, okay, early game, quite strong. Mid game fights, fantastic. That's what Genji is so famous for. Yeah, and if DRX gets behind with this, I don't, I don't foresee a long future for game two. But let's jump onto their rift for game two. Here we go, game number two between DRX and Gen G. Same sides, but very different drafts in this second game. Glad to see Chovy on the Oriana. Feels like it's been a while. And he is very good at lanes that allow him to a lot of pressure early. He's played the Tristana so many times, he's played into it so many times, knows this matchup. It's gonna get slowed here. Um, the whole team is in the brush, guys. <laughs> As they're gonna bubble it, they're gonna get the flash out of Yehu. Trying to get something out of Chovy. Lahen's gonna flash over the wall now. He's in a bit of trouble. As he doesn't have his flash anymore, and he should be going down here. As flash forward now from Pleta, looking for more. And it's first blood to Maokai. Sponge gonna pick this one up. Yeah, some flashes down here. You know, Chovy, Lahens lose their summoners. And of course, Yehu will expend his with Pleta. But this is the power of level one Ash. And you have to respect it. I think Genji thought, like they respect the power of level one Ash. They're like, oh, they're gonna push in. We're in the bush. We actually turn this, we win this. They expected this, but the execution was actually pretty crisp and Sponge getting over the wall. Um, with his W there was really a big deciding factor as to why that ended up working so well for DRX. So, big win. Three Hail of Blades setups here, as Yahoo's going to be trying to put the pressure on in mid, and obviously bot, that's how it goes. Level 2 uh, advantage. Yeah. <laughs> Level 2. Yeah, just take a big chunk of damage from the minions. Meanwhile, down at the bottom side, Pleta is going to get bubbled. But should be fine, as they will have control of this lane early on. The name of the game for how Keen ended up beating Zayus last time around in this matchup was trying to keep the wave frozen in a very awkward spot where you know Frog pushes in too, or if Frog pushes in too much and then Canyon comes up, he's susceptible to ganks. And we'll see him come path bottom side first, of course, to punish this Ash Caitlyn. They do not have vision in the brush. So they saw him on the ground. They're not respecting this engage. Pleta does not have flash, um, so he's just dead. 
Guys, you saw him on the Gromp. Your support doesn't have flash. <laughs> there wasn't a ward. There was no way to see him coming on in, but they could have extrapolated that there was a chance he would gank the lane that doesn't have flash. Yeah. I agree. I think Baby Eyes is big for the stomach on this one because they want to maximize the value out of this Caitlyn Ash, and I think the communication between Teddy and Pleta is let's just keep pushing this, let's get a bigger advantage, but gotta respect Canyon. As Frog will try to make something happen up here, knowing that Canyon has backed. He is coming towards his Krugs, though, on the top side of the map here, so maybe an opportunity if Frog decides to push this advantage too far. Having a great start to this lane, though, maximizing. Jace's early levels and the range advantage he has over Cassante. Yeah. Definitely good stuff so far from Frog. But Cannon's a level three realm, and he's trying to get some stuff done. We do have Sponge coming on up to the top side as well, but Frog is going to be forced to flash away from this one. Canyon no longer has his flash, but he's going to hit the max range Q. Although Frog is going to stay alive, and now Sponge is here with double buff, but not going to extend the play. And Canyon has Hex Flash, so not going to feel too bad about this. Bit of a, an overextension from Frog. And my man Canyon just ran the rift in game one. They're acting like he's not here in game two. <laughs> They're like, oh, I guess that's it. He got POG. They have to sit out after that, right? He's being quite aggressive early on. Yeah. And, and Rel, Rel. Rel doesn't always uh, end up doing this. I love like, this replay. Yeah. They, like, obviously, they do know that he's likely there. And then he comes down. It takes the long path, lets them push up even further before he shows. And. We just have to be more respectful than this. We've seen so many different uh, Caitlyn lanes with uh, with Ash, or just general pushing lanes with Caitlyn, even Caitlyn Lux, have the jungler path bottom side and be here for this play to turn it into a 3v3, because otherwise, if the enemy jungler comes down, you will lose your advantage, even if you don't die. But a flashless Pleta will also die. Yeah, I, I think there's something to be said about saying, okay, most likely he's just going to path toward his, towards his red. He's behind. He lost a buff already, so maybe he's not going to come bot, but... Either way, that's the way it did pan out. And now Sponge is on the bottom side of the map here. Pei's already taking a bunch of damage. Just step on a trap. He is going to cleanse away from the root, but this is pretty elementary as a very nice dive does come in from the side of DRX. Well played. Teddy should be able to grab that plate as well. He does, and now Lehens is next on the chopping block. Yep, Leta going to tank up a couple of shots, and it's done perfectly. That's a couple of kills now for DRX on the bottom side of the map. Really massive. And Canyon, this time they read him correctly in that he's going to try to get the maximum value out of Rel's early clear on these Void Gromp, or Void Gromps. <laughs> Look at the Gromp void like with his Void Krug Raptors. <laughs> the Void White Buff. Um. <laughs> uh, Canyon is here. He can Hex Flash. And it looks like he does want to. Yeah. Once, once it's ready. No Flash for Frog. And there it is. Canyon's just going uh, to just, just run away. Okay. <laughs> we'll get Frog back, and uh, the wave was pushing away from him, so it is pretty frustrating regardless here for Frog, even though it won't end up being his death. And, uh, yeah, they, they read that, you know, Cannon would likely be doing the Void Grub's top side, and end up having a successful dive bottom, even without Sponge's ultimate. But Pays is super low. They chunked him down, and this trap placement from Teddy is really frustrating. Not a lot Pays could do here. They do commit the cleanse to try to get out of this one. Unfortunately, will not be successful. And then, see, of course, on the follow-up here, Lens has nowhere he can really go. He's level three. Pleta tanks it up. Really nice play overall. Pleta stands like that's hard for Lens to get a bubble value onto him and, and trade back a kill. Yeah. Cannon, he went down there early, but he can't stay down there forever. And we see that Sponge, he just went for a very healthy clear. He already has Knight's Vow because he got both of the kills. Um, I guess he got the first blood and then yeah. one kill on the dive. So very rich is the Maokai. He is also clearing a lot faster than Canyon with the extra buff that he got and the fact that he wasn't going for level three crazy ganks like Canyon. And uh, he's really happy with this spot. He can just put down his early Knight's Val for one of his 380 carries. As now, Sponge um, very far in the enemy jungle. He's going to have to flash out of there. Look at the way. Phase Rush going to boost up some of that speed that he lost on this patch, and he will be out just fine, but does lose his flash, as you mentioned. And now grouping on this dragon with the bottom side Pryo. Should be DRX picking up this ocean. And there's no Pryo for Chovy mid, so they're getting plates, they're getting a dragon, and Gen.G just put so far behind in this early game, and we're looking at a 2,000 gold lead here, nearly, at seven and a half minutes. This early game is going swimmingly. Pays so far behind on CS, plus the plate gold means he is just so significantly behind this lethality, Caitlyn. 
as okay. Frog. Yeah, he's in a lot of trouble. The knockup is going to come in here as he gets knocked away by the hammer. So Frog doesn't have any way to get away from this. Although, it does go pretty far away, but this is Cassante. Who am I kidding? He's got another dash in about a second or two. It's a straight up solo kill that does come through from Keen. Keen's so good at this matchup. And he, unfortunately, as you say, hits him with the hammer as the Q3 is coming through. So still, like, he builds the distance and then it's taken away. So he's pretty much doomed at that point will find himself in the death chamber. So over here, Sponge does have level six. He's just gonna come back for another setup of a dive. Yep, this time Canyon is here, but uh, meanwhile, in the mid lane, a one on one, Chovy doesn't really seem too scared about that actually, as now calling on the bottom side of the map. Looks like Yehu did get away, but he had to flash away from Chovy after he was the one who jumped onto Chovy. So pretty interesting trade there in the mid lane. Yeah, it looked like some mind games played with trying to use the rocket jump there in Chovy's ultimate, and he will have to flash, as you uh, mentioned, as once again, Canyon stays down here. This time, there is Arrow, all summoners available for DRX's bottom lane. Still just trying to help out the bottom lane. Canyon's taking a lot of damage here, but now Pleta, he's not going to respect the Rel combo. He's just going to get Magnus Stormed in the face as here comes Sponge, but is he on time is the question. Another Q is going to come through, and Teddy just gets run into as Paze will be able to take him down with the help of Lahans. Actually flashes and then dies as Sponge might be able to follow up on this one. Nice Q from Sponge, but not going to be able to get any more kills. Uh, some of that uh, extra cooldown on the W, you could feel it there in that one. I think it was like 1.5 seconds away from him maybe getting back in there and getting the additional kill. So we'll go all the way back to this play here. This has been a lot of action as Genji try to bring themselves back into this early game. Pretty simple. Again, the wave where Keen keeps it makes it frustrating for Frog to farm. And then the hammer boob catches him. He runs away with the acceleration gate, but still just not able to get away from this speedy Cassante in All Out. At least they banned Rumble, right, Wolf? Yeah, well, uh, we, may, we may come back to that a few more times. As Canyon gets arrowed here, but Pleta stays in his engage range. He disrespects the rel damage here and the, the double CC he has. And your Ash, you know, another different support might have actually been okay with just getting engaged on by the rel. Teddy might be able to out damage there, but you're support Ash, so you're not, unfortunately. As, uh, yeah, Hayes will flash <laughs> as a celebration. Oh, boy. Um, Bit of a messy one down there, but Genji have really evened up the gold. Yeah, and what do you do when new players join the LCK? You bully them. Um, this dive is not going very well. Pay's just going to die to the turret. So actually, Genji are the ones bullying themselves, I guess. That dive was not it. What is going on, Valdez? <laughs> uh, yeah, he's just dead. No flash, no rocket jump. Not sure how that one happened. Maybe he jumped in again, and then he died. So... We're just devolving to solo queue right now in this game. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, okay, well, Sponge says thank you, and uh, Sapling might actually block the back. It will play the Benny Hill team. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Not the Acne Sacks, probably Atlas. Yeah. Well, we'll go back to this play here where Frog gets hit by the Nami ult and was able to flash the bubble. Yeah. And then Paze still has turret aggro. It's not juggled here. And he's just like, thank you? Um, the fact that Canyon doesn't get aggro somehow is the biggest issue. It's the problem, yeah. That's the rough one. Not necessarily Paze's fault there at all, but he's the one who pays the price. <laughs> Good one, Wolf. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> I got the Valdez wheeze. Yeah. Well, now we have something happening on the top side of the map. 3v3, and it's an engage from Canyon. Pleta is once again dead. He used to take a huge amount of damage from this one, and now Canyon's in a bit of trouble. He's trying to run this one off with his horse pants, but it's not quite going to work out. The heal comes through, but the Q hits as down will go Lahens, and D-Rex win the 3v3. <laughs> Sponge has four kills, Valdez, in this game. <laughs> and he got that Night Spell early. And with the Merc Treads, he just runs at them, he doesn't care, and pays. He wants to stop these plates from going over, but he is actually now oh, under threat. No. He wants to farm. Yehu is dead. Uh, is he? One kill? Yeah, that's it. <laughs> um, you knew he was dead. No rocket jump, no reset, no flash again. How many times have we seen this today? <laughs> <laughs> this is such a wild game. I don't even want to analyze anymore. I just want to see what happens next. Uh, top side. Um, okay, well, before we talk about top, because this is what happens while...
Frog gets the kill topside with a failed dive. Down here, Chobi is ulted away and then is able to still catch up here to Yehu. Hits him with the slow. And then, yeah, just keeps ramping those autos and then cues him to death. He has no flash, so there's no real play he can make there. As Canyon starts his engage off, will kill Plutta. Pace takes a ton of damage here, and then this chain of CC here for Canyon means that he is just going to go down as Teddy can follow up from such great range. Lehen's also just incredibly low. Such a great Q from Teddy. And the Caitlyn at this stage in the game is super strong with the itemization that she's chosen. And if you're a squishy Nami, you don't get out of there. And this one needs no explaining. Unfortunately, Yehu just uh, overextending once again. And so now you have a fed Maokai versus a very accelerated Orianna, a decently accelerated Kasante, and then Pays, whatever's going on down there. He's 30 CS behind, but does have three kills, but Teddy's significantly... Um, is it down there, or is it up there? Well, I mean, it depends on, you know... Where, where map are they on the map at a certain, at any given point? I just mean the gold that's like down at the bottom of the graph, True. where Teddy is still ahead despite the three kills from Pays. The bot laner. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, he's, he's not too happy, but I think, you know, we're, we're still in reaching distance. DRX do have a nice lead here. Unfortunately, they get unlucky with the dragon again. Um, this time it is going to be the Chemtech Soul, which has literally no, like they have the slow and tenacity, I guess. <laughs> hey, extra like, survivability so for the Tristana trying to get resets? Come on, Valdez. It's so bad for this comp. It's just very unfortunate for them. They get Ocean Soul the first time around. I mean, they weren't even able to get a second Drake or a third Drake, rather, in the last game, but still. As Chovy, now he's got his Ludens. No first item here for Yehu, so he's just getting bullied now. <laughs> the Rel gameplay. Try to smite this objective. Let's see how it goes for you. <laughs> Yehu's also down a couple of levels. Yeah. That is problematic for how much damage Chovy's outputting here with the Ludens, as you say. Awkward fight here. Yeah, Colin gonna come through. Arrow is dodge. Not easy to hit that one. Pease also has cleanse. And now Canyon, he's just gonna say, okay, well, my mid lane's going pretty well, so I guess I'll just come here <laughs> into the mid lane and help out with this. Meanwhile, in the top side, Sponge knows where his bread is buttered, as maybe he doesn't actually. Double TP is coming in from the entire side of Gen G. Teddy is so dead. And down he will go. Keen not gonna be able to catch Sponge as Canyon will do the job instead, as he was just running up the river himself. The disengage cone is definitely going to help out very nicely here, but uh, unfortunately, Cassante is more overpowered than the blast cones that try very hard to deny us any action. So he is going to pick up that kill as Genji are right back in the game. Now, Frog was able to push bottom here, grab a turret. Yehu did a significant amount of damage to this mid turret, so it wasn't all for nothing here for Derek, who still Maintained until that turret went down a slight gold lead, but Genji have really turned this game around. I'm sure we'll get the gold graph up in a moment to show you guys just how much. Oh, that's very annoying. Just how much the, the lead was Valdez here for DRX so that they've now kind of lost control of this game with. And in the mid uh, push that Chovy and Canyon had going on, I was a little bit disappointed. Canyon didn't just come up here and, and stop this from happening because I feel like he could have turned this a lot earlier, but the teleport is going to get the job done here. Good tidal wave from Lehens puts Teddy in a bad spot. Chovy's just so ahead in this game. He's level 12. Even his Q just chunks Teddy down his canyon. Is the initial part of the Magnus Storm not the greatest there, but you know what? It's okay, because Cassante will get it done. Now, even the Mega Cone not able to get Sponge out of range as he just gets run down. He needed another cone over there to help him survive. Not going to happen this time. Still a Caitlyn in this game. Teddy's doing a good job of trying to cut off um, <laughs> cut off some angles and stuff, but at the end of the day, no stopping Canyon from hopping on in there, as he will come up now. And uh, Canyon has his own Knight's Vow now. This one is put on Pays. Yeah. Just make sure this Lucian can go up and do the max amount of damage. Side lane control here still for DRX in the bottom lane. And... See what Frog can get done poke-wise here because he does have his Ghost Blade, his Cole has completed, getting closer to finishing his Muramana as well. So he is about to be a real big threat in this game. And this game is winnable at even footing for DRX gold-wise. They had a huge lead. Some of these uh, items are very accelerated despite the now deficit in gold. So the Jace can definitely get some stuff done here when we move into neutral objectives. The problem for DRX is that Genji don't really care 
about said mutual objectives because it is a Chemtech soul. But if they can get Pryo and chip away at Genji, there are some opportunities. But Genji can just not commit to any fight and then re-engage with the Rel. That's why Rel is so good in the Maokai as we do finally have that gold graph coming up. See, they had a 2,000 gold lead nearly, and now it's Genji pulling ahead. Yeah. At least the Chemtech Dragons will have some effect on Genji's composition compared to DRX's one. Um, so, true. might as well, if they have control, just pick up a couple. You've got a, a, a lot of shielding. You have the Nami as well. So, at least you have that. Chovy might be in a bit of trouble here as the Maokai Ultimate does come out. Does get caught by the edge of that one. Very nice Shockwave. There is no wave here, but it does not matter as they just burst down Chovy. That's a big shutdown in the hands of Frog now. That was what I was talking about in the draft, the combo. You just press Maokai ult, you press Ash arrow, and then you just shoot him with Jace. And if it's not a tanky target, if it's not the Cassante, they will die. It was Orion in this case. That's a huge shutdown, as you mentioned, for this uh, Jace, who should be able to get that Muramon pretty soon now. He's going to get the turret as well. His tier is nearly stacked up, so suddenly Frog, a big threat here. And because of the two Dragon lead, and because it's just a little bit of you know, shielding and healing power here for Oriana Nami. It's uh, not really a big concern of DRX. They'd rather make that play onto Chovy, pick up that bounty gold. Teddy not confident to push up here and take this turret down completely, but it is going to be some standing gold they should be able to pick up relatively soon here as well. There's that Muramana I was talking about with all that gold injection Frog just got. DRX still relevant in this game. Yeah, they absolutely are. They have an insane amount of poke. Uh, with the Jace and the Lethality Caitlyn, uh, not to mention a lot of ways to get onto the targets as we did just see uh, in that example you were just talking about on the top side of the map. So definitely still have some nice angles on the side of DRX. Uh, the nameplates are still on and, you know, Genji have been staying in this game, which is worrying for the side of DRX. This is the combo. Yeah, if Chovy walked to the left a little bit faster there, maybe he doesn't get hit by that, maybe he can actually live, but He's not able to, of course, dodge the Ash Arrow while rooted, so we'll just be taken out by that combo. Almost was able to avoid that Nature's Grasp, but not quite. Now, Frog getting pretty strong himself, sitting on nearly the completed Muramana with those stacks. Already has the Ghost Blade and the Pickaxe with the completed Cull, so... Jace definitely should be doing some work here as Yehu in a bit of trouble. That arrow is not going to do much. And again, this this 1v1 is not going to work. Yehu can't really match Chovy in the side lane right now. And this is what I said in the draft is, okay, well, I'm going to get this turret at least Look in at mid. <laughs> He's so far behind them. As now Sponge is like, I'm just going to run away, I guess. And down will go the Rift Heralds. And out comes Sponge. The Rift Herald escape pod. <laughs> yeah. And actually here Sponge will have the flash away, but they're not done yet. Thankfully, Chovy has... Nope, it's not going to matter. The ult does follow. And no disengage code and is going to help him out this time. As now Sponge is going to get re-caught here with no summoners. Down he goes. 19 kills in a 21-minute game. Yeah, this, this game is definitely a very high kill, very high action, constant skirmish game. As Keen is once again going to come up behind them here, not giving any mid prior, not giving any control. Yeah. Nice trap here, and Keen is in a bit of trouble. That that Caitlyn is doing a nice amount of damage, even with the stacking armor that Keen does have. For sure. Gonna try to chase this. Well, at least it's a low cooldown on the yeah. Ash Arrow. True. And Frog, I mean, they still end up getting map control from this. They can set up some deep vision here. Frog can go back to, to the top lane and continue to push. Yehu obviously pushed bottom lane. And that kill on the Chovy was actually pretty massive really open up the map for DRX quite significantly. And, you know, obviously Gen G now have the ability to recall and come over here and contest this this Baron vision, but it is going to be tougher into the Jace. Now that they have some vision set up, it's easier for, for Frog to poke. And some of the, the stuff that we're seeing here for for Yehu is, is obviously correct. You know, some of these plays here, knowing where Chovy is, punishing the greed here, it wasn't just him. Obviously, Teddy coming over to help out as well. <laughs> you poor old. <laughs> The Pengu! Wait! <laughs> oh yeah, it's a Pengu, not a Poro. That... <laughs> what is that? That's so cute. I didn't That's, even know that was yeah, a... No, I... Tristana... skin. Yeah, I'm not even familiar with this, but... <laughs> huh. Well... Biggest weakness, TFT, I guess. Yeah. Or Jovi. <laughs> TFT Mobile? Yeah. Dudunga? Dudunga. Yeah. Well, um, now Dudunga we're doing Dudunga the Baron. Baron. Yeah. <laughs> Here we go! Yeah. Where's that poke frog? He's got the 
plant to give him some additional vision. Not going to be a great one, but it's enough. The Hawk shots are good. They know exactly the health of this. As it is coming down, there is a trinket as well. Dirax are going to have to do something. Genji are not backing down from this Baron. As we can see, the poke is going to hit Chovy mainly as now the tidal wave is excellent to keep Sponge out of this one. And look at Keen as well, just going to ult him. Excellently done by the top laner of Gen.G to keep the jungler out of this one. But now can they win the fight is the question. As here comes Canyon, going to take down Frog as he is the front line right now. And the Maokai, you know, Sponge, he's the only one left here with three and he carries. He's just got to turn tail and get out. Thankfully, the Blast Cone saves his life and avoids more action. But Gen G, a massive win with this Baron team. Yeah, huge win for them. And it was so clean, like you mentioned from Keen, is keeping Sponge away. And Rel, after Maokai Old is down, it's just so easy to re-engage. There's no one to stop you in this comp. Arrow's down, Nature's Grasp is down. And all Canyon is thinking about right now is, how can I turn onto them? Because they don't have any tools to block me. He's going to grab this Baron and then he says, oh, you guys are thinking you're going to push this Cassante? I'm going to use his health bar as a resource. And then engaging on the Frog, who's so desperately trying to get something done in this fight. And his poke was pretty good, but they just didn't have enough time for him to get enough acceleration gates to really put Genji low enough. So he has to go melee. He dies. Unsuccessful attempt there from him. And now this game is wide open for Genji again. All the vision that DRX have worked so diligently to set up is gone. Yeah. It, it's something we've talked about many times, how teams um, with like Lee Sin, Rel, Cassante, they'll somehow struggle to keep people out of the pit, but that's how you do it, right? You, you just send your Cassante at them, you're ulting them away, you're not keeping the jungler anywhere near the Baron. You don't even give them a chance to get close. No steal attempt, and it's Rel. So it, it's 100-0, it's not a flip at all. Even if they get in the pit, yeah. Um, against the Rel, you're, you're going to be feeling pretty confident. Although at that point, you know, mistakes do happen. So Gen G, it's the right call. They have the tanky frontline to take up the Baron early on in the game as well. And now with the Baron, they're going to be able to put on a huge amount of pressure onto this map. With the Baron power plays, here comes the Hex Blast, but the Nature's Grasp is going to help out a bit, but only helps out the rest of the team, Sponge not included. Yeah, who's going to get a turret up here topside, so it's not all for nothing here for DRX. Not all for not the lost turret mid, but it's going to be a trade two for one here, potentially. The wave will actually thin out, so it won't be able to grab this inhibitor turret, but they get half of it. As Teddy, you got to be further back than you are. Hmm. <laughs> You gotta avoid the uh, the minefield as well. Culling is gonna come out. Teddy, he's so low that he just gets taken out, assassinated by the Lucian. I guess that's why we still pick this champion, as that's a double kill, four pays. Already has three items, and he is assassinating people. Yeah, well, nice try, Teddy. Flashing away, but not a different angle to the culling will still be taken out there in the end. And Gen.G are going to go ahead and take this Dragon as a bonus, the Cherry on top to their 4,700 Red Bull Baron power play. So much gold, and it's now the, the gold lead feels really quite robust. It was kind of going up and down like a heart monitor for a little bit there. Gen.G were able to maintain a very slight lead, but it's plays like this where you say, okay, I know you're Tristan is top, I know you're going to get inner, but I'm going to turn this into something more, grab Sponge, and then it looks like for a second, okay, Teddy may have overextended, but then on the chase, they Watch come through here. Hayes, calls. The end of this is so clean. Oh. And then, then, just a bit more. Cherry on top. Yeah. Doesn't have to say much. Meanwhile, some more training, because that's what this game is all about. We're not backing down from any fights, neither team in this one. Caitlyn Alt is going to hit the hens, but you know, a couple of Kemptech drakes. He's going to get healed up in no time. And heal up the team as well. No more Baron, but Jinji's still threatening in the top lane. Threatening in bottom as well with Chovy. Chovy's been so ahead of Yehu this entire game. Yes, you know, he did die that one time uh, in the bottom lane, but that wasn't Yehu out playing him necessarily. He just flanked him. And the fact that he could just beat this Orion in sides means that Orianna late game side threat is not really going to be an issue as well as Speaking of issues. Yeah, even all of those traps not going to help out. Although Sponge does live, and now you've got to run through the traps, so Redemption is going to help out nicely. And, uh, you know, 12% extra. He's feeling pretty good about that, actually. And uh, meanwhile, here the 1v1, you talked about it. Yahoo, he's just never able to match Chovy. The entirety of this game. 
That's in draft. I said it like they're putting a lot of pressure on Yeho to, to lock him this Tristana into Chovy, saying you, you have to do this, you have to carry, you have to be successful with this pick. Otherwise, it will do nothing if you lose to Chovy early. And Tristana does often win a ton of different matchups, including the Oriana matchup, but. He did not, and he struggled so much with this. Oriana, it's 2-2-4, two, two and four, but has been so frustrating for DRX. It's taken so much map control away. It's not massive team fight shockwaves we're seeing with Aurel or anything like that. It's just the fact that this Tristana has been put into the, the back burner on this game. Like, she's just not able to do anything. She's not able to side. She's not able to pressure. Yes, she did get the, the turret bottom lane when left alone and was able to push the inner um, when, when they ignore her, but otherwise hasn't really been able to guarantee Pryo when they're setting up for objectives. Speaking of, Baron up in 35 seconds here. Gen G, they're it, ready to fight for it and end the game. It's gonna be a repeat of the last one, except this time Gen G are up 4,000 gold instead of down 1,000. Yeah. So a, a 5,000 gold swing, you've got Cryptloom finished here on Chovy. He was sitting on a Fiendish Codex and an Arm Guard. Still has the Arm Guard. And now he's got the Cryptloom. So this Oriana that's already incredibly strong. We also have Bloodthirster finished for Pays. So your damage dealers are doing a lot, and your tanks have just stacked an incredible amount of armor as Pleta doesn't exist anymore. He is just pushed away as we do have a big fight coming in here, and yeah, who's just not here? Neither is Keen, but now Sponge is going to be taken out as well, and Canyon finally pulls the trigger. They don't even need them, Baron. They're just going to run at DRX and kill four of them, and that might just be the end of the game. Yep, they, they end up catching them there in the top lane before the Baron even spawns. Who needs Baron Sebs? K gets his 1500th kill, the first LCK top laner to do so. And he may be picking up a POG in this one as well. They're pushed to end. Now yeah, that should do it. And uh, Gen Z going to make it pretty quick here. We talked about some long metas in recent times. Not the case when Gen Z does play off against teams they are much better than. So quick 2-0. And a bunch of kills in this second game. Gen Z, you see that Keen just takes negative damage in the trade. And that is going to do it. Gen Z will go home very happy tonight. They certainly will. Keen dealing with the Jace top side really well. And there were some messy moments. The top dive failing and obviously playing uh, into this Maokai and getting kind of, you know, when they showed top, they, they ended up losing their, their weak side bottom there in Gen Z. Uh, ended up losing that first skirmish as well, where the Maokai got the first blood. There were a lot of things that went wrong for Genji, but you love to see games like this for, for Genji, and I think the takeaway for some might be, oh, is Genji slipping? But that's that's not really it. In fact, I'd, I'd say it's the exact opposite. Genji, despite massive deficits early, despite being put down early with a comp that needs to actually get significantly ahead, <laughs> they come back. They know exactly how to find the angles, to find the win conditions. Keen denying the Maokai from getting into the pit, setting up the waves constantly to where it was an uncomfortable laning phase for Frog. This did everything right, Valdez. Yeah, they absolutely did. This man had another great game here in game number two. And uh, <laughs> he's very happy in this picture only. And he's a very stoic man. Um, yeah, pretty quick 2-0. Tonight, Chovy also going to be pretty happy with this one. Might get a bunch of votes for this, especially just with the way the mid lane did go. Not sure if he'll win, but um, we'll just have to wait and see when that pod vote does come out later. Yeah. <laughs> Thumbs up. Pays having a series that, uh, you know, I don't think he feels too great about just based on his expression there. And there were some silly moments for him. Um, but you know what? He. He's Pays, he's got Lehen's, you know, on the bottom lane. They're going to get it done. I mean, Lehen's also having his back there on that moment on camera. As said, please give Keen kills. <laughs> and uh, I don't think they wanted to, but he took them. Uh. <laughs> yeah, Cassante just kind of does what he wants, I guess. I I look at this series in a, in the light of Genji can come back in games that feel unwinnable. You know, I feel like that's one thing that we very rarely see from Genji because they are very rarely behind, right? And in this game, they definitely were. But it was individual plays in the lanes that ended up getting them back into this. Chovy especially punishing Yahoo so hard this game. It's almost unreal. And, you know, he was not behind. And so he said, well, I will definitely just take the Tristana out of the game. There were some good moments here for DRX as well. Um, really proactive plays from Sponge on the Maokai. It looks really comfortable, this pick. I like their draft adaptation. 
And it's good to see good things out of DRX because obviously they're going to be on a long break at the end of this week. And we'll see what their mentality is like during uh, the time between spring and summer. They can come back stronger. Maybe Frog will be the, the mainstay top laner. That's what I would expect. But again, too early to tell, too early to know. Yeah, I mean, at this point, it doesn't seem to have changed the team enough, but um, they might look towards the future. You know, as you mentioned, maybe they see him as the next big prospect for the team, and they might try to develop him over the rest of the year. But uh, that does remain to be seen. As you guys are seeing the rest of the highlights from this game, we had an incredible amount of fighting. Just felt like DRX, you know, they had an early lead, and they were trying to push that early lead, and Genji were like, sure, we can fight if you want. Pushing in. Oh. Yeah, who the only one left? Poor Tristana, super far behind. I have a calm <laughs> mindset here in the comms here for Genji. Oh. At least yeah, who said who oh. got that one time. <laughs> Not sure what cake they're talking oh. about. Oh. 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 Uh, maybe the oh. cupcake? The, oh, the uh, Caitlyn Cupcakes? Ah, uh, yes. I would assume that's what they're talking yeah, about. Yeah, that's probably... an actual cake <laughs> that they have. Kind of doubt it, but... Uh, you know, the lethality, Caitlyn looked pretty good again. Yeah, I mean, well, Teddy played it well. Win, but <laughs> it's not individual plays, I think, that DRX struggle with, with the exception of Yehu here. It's just that Genji is one of our most coordinated teams in the world that we have right now, so, you know, they will be able to punish you and they were pushing their advantages so much in mid, and then this is the Keen wraparound, the Canyon wraparound. Uh-oh, you know, we've, we're up too far. And it was just kind of a repeated story of, of what we've seen from DRX in the past, just struggling so hard to cross the finish line with these big advantages. Yeah, well, that's a clean 2-0 from Genji tonight. We're going to hand it over to Space to break down that game number two. Thank you so much, gentlemen, for the cast for our very first series of the night. And yes, it was a 2-0. This second game was a little less clean than game one, though. Let's dive into the draft, gentlemen, see what changed, because we kind of liked some of the adaptations that came through from DRX. Yeah, I I think for like the power on the bot lane, like I prefer them having this K-Ash into the Lucian army. My main issue with this draft is how AD heavy it is, and particularly you ended up with the Jace and the Caitlyn and the Ash build Nathality. And I know I kind of talked about how Lethality is doing a lot better now and is really overtuned, but you're into Cassante Rel. We were even, you know, Mao was suggesting a Malphite 5 pick be impossible. And I think the trickiest thing for Gen G this game was deciding which armor item to build first because they were spoiled for choice. They built Unending Despair, so shout out to Keen. Uh, love that. Yeah, that's really my only piece of criticism with Gen G's Luck Malphite. Like, I know they were never going to yeah. lose the game, but they would lose the game even less. That said, I really like this from DRX. I think that they made the right call, which is if we don't win early, we are never beating Gen.G. And guess what? They did win early. It wasn't enough, but I think that that's the best call that they're ever, or the guess, uh, case they can ever make for themselves. Bot lane was played out well. Teddy yeah. and Blood actually did a good job. Sponge uh, was able to use this Maokai as well. I don't know if the Maokai priority is still this high, if that's still warranted, but I, I, I assume it will be the same. I think he still definitely made it work. I think that DRX had a lot of really good points, especially the level one where, you know, they really did put the pressure on, managed to pick up an early first blood. Um, you never really felt like it was out of Gen G's hands though. Even if it was first blood into some decent plays in the early game, just wasn't quite enough. But we're still going to have a look at it here because some of these dives that DRX set up were actually really clean. This is something we see with DRX, but with a lot of our lower tier teams when they do get good early games, because I feel like early game is so much more railroaded. So it's very straightforward to be like, okay, we have a pushing bot lane, Caitlyn and Ash. So Sponge, you are Maokai, you're great at setting up dives. You're going to path towards the bot side of the map as uh, Lehenz's flash, masterful bait here. <laughs> Yeah, and this one's a little bit unfortunate because if they, they it feels like they were kind of waiting for the Maokai to get here, they were trying to buy time, and Canyon was just there a little bit sooner, and that ended up being the difference maker. And Sponge still comes in and, you know, turns the play around, but this definitely destabilized the bot lane success that DRX had been having uh, in the game so far. Phase on the hands there, unfortunate laning uh, scenarios do continue. Yeah. As uh, he flashes there off taking a little bit, so did Plata. So uh, what are you going to do? Uh, Sponge really tried to do as much as he could in this early game, playing really heavily for, uh, towards his bot side of the map. 
which I think was great. Actually, uh, credit to him, credit to the DRX bot lane as well. That's the one part where Genji have looked weak, and we saw another confirmation of that here. Obviously, once we got to mid to late, Hayes and Lahans were completely fine, as they are. But that's, yeah. that's, I think, the angle you look towards if you're a contender to try and push down Genji. No, exactly. And while it was all happening, while there was a lot of craziness happening towards the bottom side of the map, and we saw the Caitlyn finding some advantages, was ahead by a whole bunch of gold in this game as well. We had Trovi picking up like back-to-back -back solo kills in mid lane, was ahead by 60 CS or something like that. And so that's part of the reason why it never really felt that over. And then this play happened, and it was pretty solidified. Yeah, they don't even manage to get towards the pick. Keen doing a fantastic job of interrupting and keeping Sponge away. And then I think you just want to take into account how little damage the Rel and the Cassante are taking. And they're being focused down, but the health bars just, they really look, struggle to move. Look at this moment for Keen. He's like, I should run away because I'm low. And then he remembers they only have physical damage. So actually, he has infinite health. Yeah. That's fine. Uh, he was rather tanky, I think it's safe to say. Could have been <laughs> <laughs> That's a really good point. So maybe that'll cost Keen the POG, but it is time to find out. He did just hit 1,500 kills here in the LCK as a top laner for the very first time. But no, it's going to be Canyon back to back, and that means he's on 1,000 points. And that means next time Genji take to the Rift, he could theoretically equalize Trovi. Anyone on top side was a good vote. Just just no Pays or Lions vote. Like Canyon uh, did a lot in the early game. Trovi had a great solo uh, a set of solo bolos. I think Kanye taking it makes complete sense. Ran the early game and, and really made sure that this bot lane didn't get fully out of control. Yeah, sometimes when you vote for a POG, you kind of compare them to the counterpart. And like, you know, they really outclassed. That wasn't the case here. Sponge also had a good game. But I would say the early game could have been a lot more DRX favored if it wasn't for Canyon bailing out his bot lane and finding these great windows to punish DRX and keep the game even enough so that when it got to the later stages, they could just do what they wanted. Was also like jumping over walls, like in that moment there, finding these great angles uh, on his rel, and now moving up to a clear third place between Faker and Zeka here, the one jungler amongst the mid lanes. And it's kind of crazy, like obviously Gen G are top team, they have the most wins, but it's crazy that you have Ever two changed. players in the top three, considering only one person get POG from the team at the time. It's it's mad they have so much points between them. <laughs> have, a, have a little bit of a looking there. <laughs> oh, what a time to be alive. It's so good. You, we've got every, like the audience is back here at Lowell Park. Last week, we welcomed back the media votes as well. And I feel like media are also celebrating by giving us this hilarity. Oh, no, he's broken. He broke the chronicler. Oh, hey, God. I love Pace. Like, yeah, he dashed forward and, and like his team fights are good, but you can't. Yeah. Okay, so let's we can change the subject because Genji have now officially achieved first place in the regular season. So they will be guaranteed first seed, um, which is absolutely fantastic. So now it is time to throw it over to Deer, who has the interview with Canyon. Thank you very much. This is Deer for the POG interview translation, joined by Canyon on the side of Gen G who just secured a clean 2-0 victory. Congratulations! With today's victory, you secured one of the first place in the spring season. How do you feel? Uh, yeah, we were supposed to get our first place, and I'm really happy that we were able to secure it. And this was such an important game, and after three weeks of no audience, how does it feel to play in front of the fans again? It's been a long time since we were able to play in front of the supportive crowds. And I think it was all thanks to everyone cheering for us that we were able to win today. And you reached 1,000 POG points. It looks like you skipped uh, and climbed the ladder pretty fast. So how do you feel? I'm grateful that I was able to be the POG. I think uh, it's, it's thanks to my teammates that I was able to get my POG. 
And mid laners were actually leading the POG ladder, and you have joined them now. And to be honest, at the season opening, it was the junglers who had the most impact. So, will you aim for first place now? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's nice that to have so many POG points, but since Chovy is the first place right now, I would like to give it over to him. And game one, you picked up Jax quickly and. Was this a good pick against Bai that you had him in mind as a jungle pick, or was it based on the enemy comp? It could be a flex pick, top, or jungle. It's, I think it's just something that I'm also confident with. I think we ended up just picking it just because of how we can flex it. And then the opponent quickly went for Jace, Maokai, and Tristana comp for their top side. And with these proactive picks, how did the team decide to deal with them? Yeah, they actually created a good comp that are really strong early game. And they did win early. But given that they wasted their flash, I believe that we were able to find some opportunity to get back at them. And Chovy in game 2, after 781 days in the LCK, about 2 years and 2 months after, uh, picked Oriana. So if he's so good at Oriana, why didn't he pick her earlier? I think Chovy's actually really good at any sort of champion. He's really good at Oriana, which gave us a room to pick her when, whenever we needed to. And yeah, he hasn't played Oriana on the stage in a long time, but after seeing him play Oriana so well, it just made me realize, yeah, he's already so good. He's, of course, very, very good. And in game two, uh, it could have been a disastrous game after the counter jungle. So what was the plan to come back from this? I think we were just keeping track of what the uh, opponent had, what sort of um, resources they had. So we were just able to come back just pretty calmly. And with Canyon's Ral engages and Xante's tanks, um, what do you think your synergy with Xante was? Yeah, Kasante was a really good tank. He was so sturdy. I think he just happens to be a really good tank player. And speaking of Keen, he is the first top laner to earn 1,500 kill kills. So, for this meaningful milestone, would you like to say a word of congrats? Keen, congrats on 1,500 kills. You're the first one to reach it as a top laner. I think that's an incredible achievement. So I hope that you can keep it up. Fighting! Now you only have one match left against OK Savings Bank Burion. And for an undefeated round two, this will be a very important last match. So what is your resolution? Yeah, uh, we'll try our best to make sure that we win our last match to keep our undefeated record. Thank you for the interview. So to take a look at the standings, we will have Canyon of Gen G, the first place team of the regular season, read off the standings. With 2-0 victory, Gen G have joined 16 wins and they have secured first place of the regular season. Congratulations on first place. Thank you so much for the interview. And this will be the end of the interview with Canyon and back to the space. Thank you so much, dear. And thank you so much, Canyon for reading through the standings. Of course, the most important part being the fact that Genji have now locked in first place. Unfortunately for DRX, it does mean that they move to uh, last place just for a moment. Uh, and then they hope that Bro is going to overtake them in the negative direction once again. T1 are going to be taking on Nongshim after the break, and that is going to be a very similar position as we see in the standings here. But maybe, just maybe, Nongshim can do it again. They managed to take a game last time. Maybe they can take two this time. There's only one way to find out. It's by staying tuned. We're going to go to a short break when we get back that next series. We'll see you there.
내가 없는 곳에서 최강을 논하지 말라! 저희를 이길 수 있다는 그런 생각을 버리시길 바랍니다. 쏘리 쏘리 플러스기아 입장에서 최강 팀들 상대로 갚아주고 싶은 게 망치나거든요? 플러스기아를 가볍게 보지 마세요. <목소리> 바텀은 그냥 하플이다. 바텀 하플? 그런 취미 싹 떠네. <웃음> 미드 처음에 조금 힘들지? 아니요? 아니야 괜찮아. 네. 아 얘기 많이 하면서 해라. 얘들아 잘해줘. 파이팅! 파이팅! 네. 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 바텀 주도권 계속 있고. 나 가야 돼. 바텀 한번 싸우면 돼. 오케이 오케이. 이번 라인 메고 갈게. 못방 할게 알림. Q 이철 더블 하나 둘 셋. 나 가야 돼. 나도 있어 나도 있어. 둘다 왔어. 다시 해봐. 이거 다이브, 다이브까지 볼 거야 우리. 아 어, 라인 밀어봐. 볼게 볼게. 돌려놓고 더블 와우 프리터 가게 가게 한번 알리 10초 뒤에 도착 어 진짜 들어갔다 아래부터 볼게 우리야 어 아래 가는 중 아래 가는 중 가도 돼 이거 어 기다려 봐 가야지 우리 보는 중이에 잡았다 아줌만뭐뭐뭐어나 있어 아 뒤태 탈게 뒤태 탔어 어 봐봐 봐봐 한대한대 맞춰 제발 이건 한대한대한대한대 솔로 킬 올려야 돼 솔로 킬 솔로 킬 어시 나이스 땡큐 <웃음> 솔로 솔로 킬 이러고 있으니까 나한 3호시 정도만 하면 되는데 뭐 3호시? 3호시 하면 4천일걸? 해보자 아 진짜? 파이팅 해보자 야 세나 잘한다 스몰도 높을 와 세나 잘한다 굴대 굴대 구멸시 세나 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 아, 아 이거 불 이겼네 불이 이긴 거야 욕 먹고 공 박을 테니까 가자 아, 이거 링스이 그거... 어시 채워줘야지 소리 볼게 우리 형이 아 소리 볼게 어시 필요 안 돼? 나 거기 내면 안 된다 형아 소리 잡았어 소리 잡았어 아래 쪽 봐줘 아 파이팅 자 제발 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 좀 잡아봐 잡아봐 잡자 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 나이스 나이스 GG 이제 졸린 사람 없제? 스트레치 한번 쫙 하고 남겠어? 아니요 좀 벌겠어 이거 시작 하면 깰듯 말좀 많이 해야 될것 같아. 말말말말말말말말말말말말말말말말말말말말말말말말말말말말말말말말말말말말말말말말말말말말말말말말말말말말말말말말말말말말말말말말말말말말말말말말말말말말말말말말말말말말말말말말말말말말말말말말말말말말
is Guma trying to make himself felt at this point in the game before it goes too much farther. Aiming is going to get bubbled as he does have a very aggressive positioning. Here comes Bob as they have the engage from behind onto uh, the back line. As down will go King into the flash forward from Zeus, it's going to be enough to take away aiming as he just gets Wobble Combo down. Probably a lot. Uncanny how still Jackson on the front foot. Yeah. And now a Fates Call is going to come through. What? Dylan does find the handshake onto Chovy and the bailout onto himself. Lahans! Is he going to go down? No, he's not, but it's going to be the double anyway. Lucid gets one of them, and there's one for aiming. He's 5 0 5. Chovy just take this one. Yeah, Lucid is running across the Cloud Rift. And he is going to be able to get in there. Not able to, but he gets into the back line. They managed to find Chovy, but he survives for that little bit too long. Pace is getting out of there, but that means he's not going to be able to defend That's the true. rest of his teammates. And D plus find everyone. And we're just setting up for a Rift Girl fight, okay? Fate Girl just came up. And we're just gonna go for the flash forward from Carry. It doesn't get much of anything as it's gonna go to Finger, actually. Peanut in the pit. He's living for so long and he gets over the wall as well. Nearly gets another passive in there, but still going to be a nice little one for two three. And soaking up a lot of it. Take them, uh, I mean, we'll get to play the game. Yeah. Esports. Oh, here we go again. He gets it again. Now to two tankier members, oh. but he's got his whole team there, and they all just burst to smithereens. It's now how will I esports fly me free? Goes to about two thirds health. Will so be able to possess Shelly. And she will be the demolition crew, but now they dive oh! on in the five man magnet storm and the sun is just as good. BRX, how are you finding these team fights in back to back games? And DRX, they just all of a sudden on the floor. Quite do too much here as now closes splits up the fight. Seismic shot is so good as Cos. He's gonna get two lots of execute, gets into the back line, and there's no Megan R for Dudu Bulldog. It's just torn to shreds. And Fear X, they do not want to give up on the playoffs. They are looking for it this early into this. Carol did have to use his hook defensively, but has somewhat reset its cooldown. It looks like they are still looking for a fight. Valkyrie out there from Karis. There's a flash forward, Gideon. Getting on top of Beryl, but he's not necessarily a priority as the three knockups do come in and now Perfect just launches himself into the back line. Mom gets angry. Gideon is just dead. It's a kill for the world champion Kindred player. And Polo, he's the next one on the menu. It's Death that's going to barbecue him. A triple kill. Are you kidding Quadra, me? He's make it a quadra. It's a penta kill for Pyoji. And 14 minutes, he gave one. Oh my God, it's incredible.
Hello and welcome back to the LCK. We're here for the second match of the night. It is Nongshim Red Force up against T1. As Nongshim was actually able to take a game off of T1 in their round one bout. And this time T1 are looking a little bit weaker than we've seen from them in the weeks prior. So it is going to be interesting coming into this one to see if Nongshim can make them hurt a little bit. I mean, T1 have had some really tough matches as of late, uh, losing to Genji, losing to Hanwha. So I think people are a little bit less high on them as they were when they were beating against our weaker teams, some of our Western teams. They were still beating our still a little bit lower tier, right, than the teams they did end up losing to ultimately. So I don't think we should read into it too much, but maybe some vulnerabilities have been found here for Nongshim. Going into this match, it is such a tough one for them. As always, they're already eliminated from playoffs. Uh, as you guys can see here, it's only Firex and Kwangno that are still in that running for the final spot. And T1, they need this win if they want to potentially, uh, you know, challenge first place or, of course, keep themselves in the running for second. If they end up dropping this one, Hanwha has a pretty good chance of actually passing them and skipping round one. Yeah, T1 does have a couple of easier opponents in Nongshim and DRX for their last couple, so still expected to hold on to that second place, but it's not guaranteed, as you did mention, so still going to have to play hard, and Nongshim, they're definitely a team that I think would really enjoy, um, you know, playing spoiler, right, and, and trying to take games off of them. Now, it is a nine-match win streak for T1 against Nongshim. The last time Nongshim won was actually in 2021, and that was a different roster entirely. Yeah. Will they deny T1 from securing second place? That is the question on everyone's mind. And I think T1 fans probably a little bit apprehensive, but I don't think should be too worried. As it is Nongshim, after all, they do sometimes punch up. So you can see in terms of solo kill standings here for top lane, Zayas is still number one. Six ahead of clear in second. You can see Dundin is up there, though, in top three. We've been talking about this all season long. Yeah. But he's not getting solo kills on <laughs> Zayas. He's not getting solo kills on Zeus. He's also getting solo killed a lot. Um, happy birthday to Jiwoo. It is, well, it's Jiwoo Day. Uh, will he pull an upset and claim his birthday victory? Maybe. Maybe. It is possible, as we do have some pingus on the cake. Uh, and yeah. a really nice Photoshop hat there for him. As it uh, says, happy birthday to you on the sign there. Uh, and everyone remembers the ceremony when he jumped. <laughs> it's actually become quite a meme in Korea, the Jiu jump. Um, that he Why made. is his mouth like that? I don't know about that part, but he's saying his <laughs> name. It's a Ronaldo Photoshop. That's oh, where the right. celebration is from. Yeah, I didn't know that was what Ronaldo's face looked like in it, but when he did the ceremony, it became a pretty big meme here in Korea. But Nongshim walking out on stage first. Valdez, a tall task ahead of them. And as you guys can see, it will be Call Me starting, not Fiesta here. Would not be shocked if they do sub him out just to give both players a little more play time here before the end of the season. And if you're a T1 fan, maybe you're hoping for that. Uh, time will tell what they do with these drafts, but coming to this with no pressure is the Nongshim way to, to find success, right? This team will just have fun. They'll draft something completely unusual. Some of their craziest and most fun games happen after they've been eliminated from playoffs. And we see Jiwoo play uh, Nila. We see him play some wild stuff in the bottom lane. Maybe Vagar bot, something like that. I'd love to see it, Valdez. Hey, Vagar got buffed. Yeah. Why not? Uh, T1, on the other hand, they want to get a 2-0. They want to hold on to second place. They want to get that seed into round two of the playoffs. And um, should be feeling pretty confident. As you mentioned, you know, played off against some strong teams in Hamalai Peace Force and Gen G did lose both of those series. And, now looking to bounce back, going into playoffs. They need to be on good form if they do want to challenge those teams and have a chance in the playoffs, because it's not going to be easy once we do get into best of fives. But um, not too worried for them, and we'll see what their form is like here tonight. You know, Jovi, he didn't get any POGs in the match we saw earlier today. True. So now Faker's got a chance to catch up and try to at least tie in the POG number one spot. Yeah. Taking a look at the key player, it is going to be Dundin versus Zayas. And as you can see, um, neither of these top laners very high on the KP. They end up doing a lot on their own and then come to team fights later on with TPs. The Cassante versus the Aatrox is the focal point matchup. So I'm not going to do Dundin dirty and read off the numbers, but 
It has been uh, very strong, uh, the, this meta for Zayas, because he's incredibly strong at Aatrox. Aatrox is also very, very strong in this meta with the item build he's been abusing. And still, teams just let him have it, and he takes the opportunities that he's given with it and, and wins the games. I'd like to see teams challenge Zayas a little bit on his champion pool, because in the past, we know it's, it's quite large, right? But we haven't really seen that that much this season. As teams are much more worried about the bottom lane in this meta in terms of the draft and what's banned away. So maybe that could be a way for Dindin to end up being the hero here of Nongshim. But my eyes are more focused on how this mid lane matchup is going to go because Faker has been a top two mid laner all season long. Uh, and Call Me has been a bottom two mid laner all season long. And so that is kind of a little bit of a, a problem potentially here for Nongshim. He had one great game last week, uh, I do remember Call Me. And, uh, you know, maybe if we could see another performance like that, maybe he could do things here that would get Nongshim into a winning position. Yeah. Sometimes when you're a young player and your spot is being challenged, the spot that you just took away from Fiesta and he's coming back, you know, that can sometimes light a spark underneath you to, you know, practice more, or at least, you know, try to improve your play. And perhaps we'll see that a bit out of uh, Call Me and Fiesta, perhaps. Um, it's going to be interesting to see what the Lucian Pryo looks like as well. It's going to be high. I, I would, uh, you know, I would yeah. gather that, you know, Gumayuzi and Karia have been very reliant on the Lucian, which has backfired quite a bit against the top, top teams. Nongshim is not a top, top team. And if you're T1, do you really want to show anything that you've been practicing or trying to improve on your bottom champ pool before you go into playoffs. Do you really want to show Zeri for Guma? He's historically shied away from it, even if he's been working on it and trying to improve playing around that. Maybe you keep that hidden this week. So I'd imagine they will be happy to pick Lucian every game they get a chance to. Well, let's see what happens here as we hop onto the uh, draft, rather, for game number one. Varus going to be taken away. The Vi as well. And you mentioned a lot of. 80 carry bounds for hey. our first match of the 14.5. Here's the Aatrox band you were looking for. Yeah, like to see that. Because I'm mostly because I'm tired of Aatrox, but I want to see more Zayas on different things. He will abuse the Aatrox, but what else can he do? Uh, hey man, he's only played 16 games of Aatrox this season. That's true. Maybe you know. Maybe I haven't really been giving him credit. <laughs> Uh. <laughs> His next most played is Cassante at six and zero, and then Yone three and one. Yeah, everything else is one game. Yeah. So, including the Jace, he did play into Gen G. That was kind of one more recent niche picks. Final bands here. I mean, Smolder. That could be the angle for the upset. Uh, Ox has been pretty outspoken about how that can be a, a real decisive uh, factor in some of these upsets, just the sit back and scale so difficult to deal with. And both Senna and Smolder will be left open. See which one Jiwoo will choose here. Unless they just want to go for a jungle pick, but I don't think you're, you're prioritizing for Sylvie in this draft. Will be the Kalista. So saying, now I have Kalista, so neither the uh, Smolder nor Senna feel good in lane, and also, uh, Guma has played Lucian into Kalista, and it has not gone well for him. See if they want to decide to go that way, or if they think the Senna will break through the laning phase. A risky call here for T1. The Orianna also going to come out here. Faker 10 and 0 on this pick. Undefeated so far this season. And has played it quite a lot, but wasn't pulling it out as often in recent times. So interesting to see him take it out once again. Renata Glask is available and feels pretty nice. Although, if you are into, you know, a lot of range on the side of T1, can be a bit of an issue as the game comes along. No doubt. See what the counter pick here is going to be for Call Me. Could just try to play way into this. Gives you the scaling later on. Or Talia. Well, Talia is definitely the pick that you'd want to go if you're confident to, to obviously give some assists to the bottom lane, but they're going to keep that pick hidden and just toss down the Udir. Remember, Cassante is still available. Dindin could have played that here. Would have been fairly safe blind, but very confident in the Udir into Cassante matchup he's played so many times and just feels comfortable blinding it into even the Renekton. That's quite strong right now, so... 
see what it's going to be. Is it going to be the Kench into Kalista? Does not feel great, to be honest, but is the best pairing pick left besides the Orn, who isn't also going to feel great into Kalista Renata. So yeah, this is going to be obviously great the longer the game goes on. It's just going to be tough on those first few levels. Yeah, and it is Karia. So Senna and TK uh, for Guma Karia is going to be pretty insane regardless of what uh, lane they are playing into. They are very proficient at this duo. And, you know, if you didn't pick the TK now, you might be facing like TK Orn or TK Seraphine bans from the side of Nongshim. It could have gotten a little bit dicey. Yeah, no doubt. Or <laughs> dicier in the bottom lane. Lohe ban for Call Me makes sense. One of the picks that outranges the Orianna and can push her pretty successfully if played well. See a Nocturne ban here. Nocturne Orianna, pretty obvious. And owner has been the LCK's best Nocturne and the one who's played it the most uh, since he's become relevant again. See what the final ban is here. I don't think you're worried about a Tristana pick or anything like that here. As there's a lot of jungle picks still available here as we haven't really seen that much, so it will be a Rel that is targeted now, which I think is quite wise. And then Zeus will eat another Jace ban this time around, so he may just be on Cassante duty for the Senecop. And owner's Lee Sin will come through. A very scary thing to face. If I'm Sylvie, I'm like, yeah, I'm just going to play Poppy, just, <laughs> just to put the fear in him, as, of course, Peanut did have a wonderful time into his Lee Sin, but generally not good against this composition, so probably not a good idea. Jarvan is being looked at, actually. They really just want to crush bottom, and okay, gonna swap over to the Tristana, though, as okay, well, they're gonna change it up completely here, and go Sejuani, so not gonna have a great dive in bottom lane, as Zayas is gonna play Twisted Fate into this Udir, and this is definitely a matchup that it's tougher for Twisted Fate to play out than a lot of our other top matchups where you do just gold card and walk away. <laughs> Such as Renekton. Yes. We also saw today yes. for some reason. Um, because now the Udyr, you know, he gets gold carded, but he recovers from that quite quickly and then continues to put pressure on you. So this is not a, way, a lane uh, phase that Twisted Fate just wins automatically. Uh, it is definitely one that they can put a lot of pressure on and they, they can find success with. But again, a little bit more nuanced. And I, I trust Zayas will be able to get it done. The bottom side is where picking the Sejuani does kind of hurt Nongshim Red Force here because they're not going to be able to necessarily set up dives pre-6. You can pull it off, you can do it if you have a ton of control, but if owner comes down there, it's a little bit harder to actually make that happen consistently. Yeah. You also have a ranged mid laner and it's an Udir in the top lane. Like, yes, maybe you can have a little bit of extra pressure on the TF, but it seems a little bit unlikely if owner visits there at all. Um, by the way, little gift from the LCK given out to all the fans, just to welcome them back into the stadium, which we do have them here for week nine, and fortunately, the rest of the LCK. Yeah, I'm very hyped about that. Thanks so much, CGV. Popcorn here for what should be an exciting start to this series. Massive underdog matchup here for Nongshim, but they've got a decent draft. See if they can get it done. See what happens here as we hop into the rift for game number one. All right, here we go. Match 82. Nongshim versus T1. Nongshim just looking to play spoiler uh, against T1 and, and try to knock them down a peg. Which, in that case, if Amalife Esports did win both of their series, they would get second place. Which uh, could be pretty dangerous, but I'm sure T1 are still confident against Nongshim. But we have to still play the games out and see what happens. It's a round robin format. Peter, Sylvie, and Jiwoo are going to hide in this river brush here, but does not look like we're going to see any face checks. They're However, they're coming in. Yeah. The owner's going to see this. Now, he will stay safe, but that's his blue buff gone. Although, could try to potentially fight this, but here comes Call Me. I don't know about fighting this, but they are going to just come over here and grab some uh, some Senna stacks, try to be aggressive. Uh, not hopeful for them on this one. Just let it go. 
Um, Peter's just going to run into them. I mean, they do have a better level one. So, going to win that one. I mean, Tom Senna isn't weak, but Lissa Renata, definitely going to enjoy that. Yeah, just put some sticks in them. And uh, definitely not ideal. As you can see, Dinden has played nine games of Udyr. It's four and five. It's been one of his more successful champions this season. You mentioned Zaius. Uh, he's only played a few champions. One game, Twist of Fate was one of them. Owner, shockingly one in four on the lease, and he has not been finding success with this season. Yeah. Even though it's one of his most successful picks career-wise. Well, level two, hit here. Uh, okay, there, Jiu does get it. Nice little handshake. Ascaria is going to try to get the knockup, but Guma forced to flash away. Jiu does eat a turret shot now, and now is getting in there. And one more auto would do it. Can he get in range? But no, the Q's gonna come in from the Renata, and even with the Lick, maybe. No, he's gonna get the last auto, and that will be first blood going to carry as Peter immediately trades it back. Really good play from Nongshim going in there, but taking that extra turret shot ruins everything. And the flashes as well to avoid Karia's re-engage. Everything about the beginning of the play was great, but the spacing was good enough there from T1. Guma and Karia will win out on this fight. Zoner and Sylvie will clash in the jungle. Meanwhile, with Kalmi having Pryo, definitely not something that the owner wants to tussle with. But yeah, going back to this Tristana, by the way, you know, it's just like what we saw from Yehu in the previous series. So much of this game is on Call Me to find success in this Orianna matchup early. If he gets completely outclassed like we saw Chovy do to Yehu, this whole draft falls apart. Zoner. Tries to stick around to get this ward, and in the 2v2, this should favor Faker and Owner, as now Call Me's eating a huge amount of damage himself, and Sylvie now has to flash away. Q lands from Owner, and that is just a straight up Kill gets a little bit of help from Faker, and now Owner's coming back. He's angry, and he's not even looking. Call me! Just dies and accepts his fate. Well, this may be a precursor of what we got in our second series tonight. Is Meanwhile, 16 winning streak here for Guma on the Senna. He's played it with a bunch of different lanes, obviously, but this is the most common with Karia, the Tom Kench, that he is so good at, so known for. Yeah. And when he gets farm, he gets triple kills. He is a brawling Tom Kench. Not, not banning Senna against T1 is a mistake. I, I think you have to ban it away from that. Well, I think a lot of teams, as we'll watch this play once again, the root comes down and then Karia wants to re-engage. The flashes come through onto Guma, but Jiu actually chasing there into the turret is really going to hurt the opportunity here. And then Karia does come over. I really like the cleanse here from Jiu. They also get the loyalty program here to actually give the additional shield. Still not enough. And uh, so close to success there. And, and what I was going to say about that is, there's not much to say here, unfortunately. Call me is just super low, and fighting this was not the right call. So he'll be super frustrated on the player cam after this moment. And then, I mean, I guess there is a lot to say in that. Call me the science, you know, he goes in the brush there to just back, and he must be in the shop. This. Yeah. yeah, he must be just in the shop. I mean, I don't know. But the point of the Callista pick is, okay, you can't pick Sen into this. Callista will crush it. Most of the time when we see these Senna's, as his flash is forced as well. Man, this is no, no good news. Um, flashes, I guess. Uh, Dinden is getting on in there. Um, <laughs> he's trying to get this solo kill on Azeus, but now Guard is going to come out and Azeus will get away. You can see that, that pressure I was talking about with the Udyr, but he's not able to put anything else on. It will be Ghost's exchange there. And that's still significant, though, because Azeus doesn't have teleport and he doesn't have level 6. Going to take Swifties and run back as fast as he can. Should be some plate gold going over to Dinden. Yeah, the... Uh the level four Sejuani gank. I mean, Sylvie does not have flash, and yes, Faker doesn't either. But he can just run north as now it all comes down and call me is going to try to take him out, and he does, and now the interrupt on the owner, but he still gets that E down. And Sylvie is not able to do much unless owner sticks around. Might have a little scuffle. Miss on the sonic wave now, but Flail does not connect. Yeah, just gonna be picking up their mid laners CS here for a moment. Lots of action in this one. This is the Nongshim way, okay? Just try to force early, but it's also kind of the T1 way. And they have it a little bit more successful with it, but at least they were able to get that kill onto Kalmi. If he ends up dying there without getting the kill, the situation is even more disastrous. Feels like a lot of these plays have been one step forward, two steps back here for Nongshim, and T1 just keeps on winning out. His owner, three-fourths of his team's kills right now, is coming up big every single time. And Faker is reading these plays, calling for owner to leave. Uh, the Void Grubs here and come over for the assist. If this Q doesn't connect, 
you know, that's probably not enough damage to take him out, but it does. Good accuracy there from owner once again as Comey is trying to turn this game around. Bought a call as well. But Faker is definitely feeling pretty comfortable with the, the game state now. And as you can see, despite Zayas getting pushed in earlier, he's actually still maintaining a really nice CS lead. Plus, Twisted Fate's passive gold means Dinden won't be doing this to him for very long. Yeah. Dinden just letting the wave push into him, aoing down the weak ones here. And call me in that mid trade, actually, uh, very nicely calculated. He hit, he hit level six on the one minion. I thought he was going in on level five, and I was like, this is not going to work, but it was perfect. And uh, this is what happens if you're not all inning on Tristana, is you're, you're just going to get poked out by Orianna. Uh, a lot of matchups end up that way against Orianna. So now Q is going to connect here on the Sylvie as the action does not stop in this early game. Here comes Karia, just going to dive onto two people. There's no level six for them, but he's got it as Devour comes through. And now Gio's in a lot of trouble as Owner is getting pretty low. The bailout comes in, and actually Gio is fine for just a little bit. As now we get another official dive, but it's denied as the Lick is going to get the kill from Karia. And we got a little two on two action now. Peter and Call Me on the run. And meanwhile, Faker just taking mid turret plates. Yeah, just taking plates here as Call Me is not able to come down here and make an impact on this plate just yet. He's waiting to maybe look to do it, but they know he's missing mid. Uh, yeah. And now he's going to jump on in. He does have his ult, I believe. Maybe not. Just going to auto him down. The E is good enough. But now Karia, a nice little dodge sidestep here from Call Me. And Peter's blocking the lick. And there's no devour at the moment. Maybe one more blick. Blick? One more lick for the play. But that's going to be the end of that. Yeah, we'll not be getting the center of that Tootsie Pop. But uh, at the end of the day, <laughs> it's going to be a trade up here for D1. And Call Me left the lane again. Stayed down there. Faker grabbed two plates for it. And uh, Valdez, I mean, again, it just feels like Gnome Shimmer trying to drag T1 down to their depths of, of you know, kind of down and dirty early game League of Legends. And T1 are oh, answering boy. well. Is Zayas maybe in trouble? Nice flash. Good reaction. He's going to get out of dodge. If he doesn't flash that, he's probably dead. Even with close and flash available. Or at least he would have taken a lot more damage. Yeah, no doubt. I think he, he definitely needed to flash it. Reaction time very quick. Does handle it. And he will be pushed out of the lane. So that's going to be good news here for Dindin, who will grab some additional plate gold. Top side is under their control. And then this is, I think, the draft concept for Nongshim is we have a winning Kalista lane, we have a Udir lane, and if Kalmi puts the pressure on Faker, he should be in they a pretty good spot. Here, yeah, they know this. By the way, um, <laughs> we're going to try to flash over the wall, and he's lucky he dodged the handshake. Otherwise, that may have continued. Good reaction time from him as well. Good attempted punish there by Nongshim. Well, the bottom lane isn't winning, Valdez. And that's where I was going back to. Is like, yeah, they're like, you wouldn't put Senna into Kalista. Tom Kent's Senna into Kalista. We've seen teams try to do that. You've got to ban that and then pick the Senna. But Carry is pretty good. His owner just keeps pushing this. this yeah, he's going to land the kick, though, and he's got some help as well. The roam up from their bottom lane, Guma, right here. And it's going to help out in that one. Owner just knowing he's got support from the bot lane that somehow is the Pryo, and then of course Faker doing pretty well in mid of 30 CS 10 minutes in. And just call me, he spent so much time out of lane, either in the bottom lane trying to fight some of these skirmishes or just because he's died, that he's just not getting farm, and he'll be able to teleport back and catch some of these minions. It's not going to change the story. As T1 are just continuing to trade up on the map, and Owner will get that red buff that he wanted so badly. The team playing around him there. It's not going to be Chemtech Soul, either Valdez. We have that confirmed yeah. early. So I think the action will just continue here. Call me just got back to lane. And Sylvie just got his ult back, though. Might be able to punish Faker here, who does have his flash, but uh, doesn't have anywhere really to run. And he's just going to run into the turret instead. And Sylvie will pick up the kill. Yeah, Faker looked really frustrated there, but knew there was nothing he could do. Didn't want to waste his flash. It was a really nice path there from Sylvie, the control ward at the top of the river brush, so no way for Faker to have any information there. He was coming from that angle. As that Sonic Wave looks like it's going to miss, but this initially looks like, oh wait, may, is, has owner made a mistake? Because Kalmi's here, but he just ward hops away before Kalmi can actually ult him into the left side of the map there, because if he actually ults him faster, maybe something happens there, but instead, just being a turn. And Faker, as soon as he sees Sylvie, he speeds himself up and he's like, mm. and he actually, unfortunately for Kalmi, will not be killed by uh, the Tristana. It's actually Sylvie who gets the kill. 
<laughs> well, at least the Knight's Foul purchase does come through. And maybe he'll just use that on Call Me. As you might be getting the bailouts, but we'll have to wait and see where that does go. And uh, here we go once again. Call Me continuing to try to trade on to this one as he will buffer with the rocket jump. But you can see these trades are not going his way. So if he's here this time, try to block this play from owner. Oh, well, hello. Jungler's going to meet once again. Seems like the eighth time this game. Q going to land, but owner is just hanging out. And call me. He's kind of doing the opposite of hanging out. He's very stressed right now. Yeah. I mean, he has just never had a moment to breathe this entire game. Yeah. And that's how you have to play this matchup when you're leading the charge on it. But he's not. He's actually under so much pressure himself as he's fallen behind and still trying to stay relevant. And Sylvie has had to babysit him, so the Udir isn't getting too much more value topside either. His owner's just staying, man. Uh, Syl <laughs> uh oh. He has to flash the Senna ult from the river. This is the level of coordination you see on T1 with their communication. Just two steps ahead of you. You thought you, you got away from owner, yeah, Sonic Wave doesn't get on you, are you safe? No, because you're going to get one more Q from Faker, and Guma's calling for a Q one more time, I'm on ult. <laughs> Just look for it, and then boom, down goes the flash from Call Me, who has... Uh, Really just been put down in this game, similar to Yahoo. If you can't win this matchup, then Tristana just does not end up doing anything. Well, I'm going to try to play on to Zeus here underneath the turret. As we'll hold the gold card, but Sylvie is tanking up the turret. As now we got TP coming in. And Zeus is burning down a bit, but now with Faker and Karia making their way into this fight. It's looking pretty good for the side of T1 as Dundon. He is Udir, but not too easy to run away from the Tom Ken. So Missile Dive comes through. One more lick will be dodged. And will not get stunned up because of that dodge. Nicely done by Dundon to get away. Yeah, nice escape from him. He is Udir after all. Very good at escaping, but Baker did not have his ult when he eventually teleported in. Okay, he does now. Uh, okay. <laughs> All right. That's what I was going to say. Was he didn't have his ult there to catch him, but he does now. And also perfectly timed, sure. calculated. I got the plate as well. Down goes <laughs> down goes the deer. Down goes the plate. And uh, who's the jungler on T1? I mean, they all are. Guma's making an impact globally. Carry is roaming. Faker's TPing for big plays. Now, will he get punished a second time? I think he is in some trouble, especially if Sylvie does come through the jungle here. Uh, although he might be able to execute. I think he might, and okay, Peter. It's looking pretty likely that he gets out here. Although Peter is really fast. <laughs> but so is Oriana after all. Faker's gonna get away and just gets executed down after, after taking the turret. Meanwhile, they're getting a Chemtech Drake. That's Nongshim kind of falling apart at the seams here. Yeah, and it's no surprise considering the early game, but. Baker got the kill on Sudundin, got a plate, got the whole turret, got Fate's call, and then his execute allows him to get out with no return as they get bottom side turret. Now, Jiwoo will be able to turn this into a bounty turret here, maybe. Maybe not off this wave, as Peter is showing up. Uh, <laughs> they want Karia! They want revenge! All right, well, he's just going to flash that, and now there's no CC because Peter did not hit a single one. Karia just going to laugh his way to safety. But they got the bounty gold, Valdez! Yeah. Not carriers, but the turret, at least. <laughs> True. <laughs> it's something. I feel like T1 and Denji are just trying to outdo each other on who's going to win harder today. I thought maybe Nongshim, you know, they generally do show up in game two. So perhaps maybe Fiesta comes in. Maybe we see a little bit of life in game two. But so far, this game one has... Uh, it's been a bit messy. You know, T1 haven't been perfect, but it's uh, certainly going in one direction at the moment. Yeah. I mean, when you try to drag teams down to Nongshim's level, a team like Hanwa, you know, might might sometimes succumb, but KT. usually not. KT, yeah. KT, D+, they will get into the shenanigans and maybe Nongshim wins out. T1, they're like, we, we were born in the shenanigans, okay? We, we are the ones who do the weird dress. We're the ones who take the ex extremely aggressive plays and turn them around, and they're not faltering. Hunters going in. They don't really have any vision, but they don't seem to care. Handshake comes through on a Peter as owner's basically just trying to decide if he wants to go for a little insect play or not. Decides on no. Faker in a bit of trouble here as they might have the burst damage. He does have arm guard already. 
But a uh, bit of help from Senna, perhaps? No, this is... Oh, well, Utter's going to get on over. And now he gets the kick onto the Tristana. And Sejuani is barely going to have enough damage. Sylvie will take him out. Call me. Will be traded back, though. Yeah, Owner basically 1v1ing the Tristana there as uh, Faker will escape. Owner has five kills this game. He's sitting on a Sundered Sky and just some additional health and a Longsword. He's not, like, massively fed, but he is level 10. He is ready to he's ready to tussle as he has just all game long been forcing fights to try to bail Faker out of his aggressive pushes. Guma as well, as you mentioned, committing the ultimate there to try to give him the shield and buy some extra time. It was a pretty valiant attempt here from T1 to save Faker uh, as he buys time with his arm guard. Then owner comes over, looks for the kick after Guma gives him a small shield here. He speeds himself up, ults in. Call me, who then gets kicked away and owner finishes him off with Guma's help. So ends up being a kill over the Nongshim, but it's, tr it's a trade as uh, all of these fights have been 16 kills in 18 minutes. Yeah, the issue in that trade was that didn't then actually got poked out of the bottom lane. So while they're kind of trading, even on the top side, Zeus just gets a turret in the inner bottom turret as well. So he's feeling pretty good about his situation. He's had mostly a free game, although he has been ganked quite a lot. As now he's trying to go 1v1 versus Call Me here. One more card should do it, and that it will <laughs> as Zeus takes him down. Yeah, he's just that far behind. Cannot fight this Twisted Fate. Even with the nerfs, I mean, even with the build, it's rapid fire cannon and a, and a shiv. That's enough versus just the Kraken Slayer there for Call Me, who I believe is a level behind as well. And Zayas hits 13. He's got so much gold from his passive. So he's sitting right now on second most farm in the game, just behind Jiwoo. Oh. <laughs> he's going to hit that cube, but owner is very far behind enemy lines. I think, you know, he's had some struggles on the Lee Sin recently. I think he's trying to really make an impact in this first game. He's going for the extremely aggressive angles at seemingly every moment. You know, I mean, if you're if you're Nongshim in this game, you're not gonna you're not gonna catch up on macro in this one. You gotta you just gotta keep trying. Do not go quietly into that night, uh, into that good night, bad night. I don't know what kind of night it is for them. It's so it's a weird night. Do not go quietly into that weird night. It's a Nongshim. popcorn night. It's a popcorn night. Good night to have popcorn in the audience as uh, the gold lead uh -oh. growing. Nice flash at least to get away from that one. But now we got TP's galore. Everybody's joining in this one as, oh God, Comey is tanking all of the damage. Really nice ult on the two of them though. But the Devourer comes through onto Zeus. He will survive as they take out Comey and they will take out the Callista as well. And immediately the fight is turned around. The Devourer coming in huge here. And T1, of course, with the very large wallets at the moment. Can they take out Zeus? The answer is no. And that is a clean ace for T1. Really nice Devourer there, denies the bailout. Shield comes through. They've got one Chemtech Drake as well. Whoa. So empowered shield. 6%. Yeah. As yeah, he is a level down in this fight. Zayas gets 13 after it, as it's just trades of autos here. He dies. Rapid Fire Cannon coming up big. And then in this skirmish, it looks like initially two members of T1 are caught as they are doing Baron in live with, it looks like, no contest. Yeah, everybody's dead. Yeah. So <laughs> the shield comes out on to Zayas, and then he is devoured. So no bailout for Call Me, who burns down through the bailout. And then an attempt here from Jiu, who's then gold carded. Really good team play here from everyone on T1, including Guma, who then shows up for the end of it to give some additional healing and the damage here. will be the one to get the last kill. T1 just uh, so far ahead that if you drag him into those skirmishes and they all rotate over, TP is available. You don't win those. Nice try, Nongshim. 10,000 gold behind nearly at 20 minutes. Yeah, the 20 minutes for 10,000 golds. And it's something we haven't seen in, in a bit. Um, Swift Herald is going to be a free 25 extra going into the hands of Faker. And a free Cloud Soul on top of it, no doubt. Not going to happen just yet, but Cloud Soul points. And T1 are basically just planning on how they want to end this game and what they're going to do in game two, because it doesn't really seem to be much of a contest in this one. No, I mean, it's, uh, I mean, it was the ultimate contest for a really long time. Like, they kept contesting and, and to their detriment, and now there's just nothing left. Um, there's, there's not no wind in the sails. The sails have been ripped out uh, by T1.
There are no sails. It's a rowboat. Yeah. <laughs> With no oars. A, do they have a paddle? It's a bro it's broken oars in the rowboat they have. Oh no. Like right now, Peter is like scooping his hand into the water. They're using the top of the cooler, <laughs> like trying to yeah. <laughs> move themselves. Another guy on the left side's got a newspaper. Oh. It's not going well. It's not going well, Valdez. Well, there's no no soul for four minutes. Let's see if Nomshi could survive long enough for it to spawn. To maybe have one last team fight there. Two item Callista. And Karia is a Omega tank at the moment. Like <laughs> he's got two armor items. They don't have AP damage outside of Udir as Bailout comes out, just kinda laughable at this point. Call me is going to avoid the loyalty program. And uh, yeah, they're just kind of putting them out of their misery. T1 not wasting any time with this one. As uh, maybe Faker, oh God, he just is <laughs> gonna get devoured. And uh, yeah, call me, just sad by himself in the fountain. T1 should be able to take this first game in about 23 minutes. The most T1 game I've ever feel, feel like I've seen Valdez. Just so much coordination. Look at that healing, Jesus. The healing is crazy. Down goes the Nexus. Every time you think you've got them, every time you think you found an angle, they're just better at rotating than you. They've got more numbers than you. Even in that last moment where Peter's like, I'm holding my Renata ult, I got it timed for the Zonias. Oh, there's a Devour here to keep him alive. You just can't catch these guys off guard. You can't, I mean, that was not an off guard moment. That was a desperate hope for one more kill for your KDA. But the early game 2v2 with the Lisa and Tristana versus the uh, extremely uh, weak, or sorry, sorry, extremely pushing, sorry to vote for PUG, it distracted me. <laughs> uh, the extremely strong pushing Orianna uh, did not go well. Owner and Faker crushed that 2v2 and basically won the game for T1 early that way and pushed Calmy out of the game. Feels like deja vu for the Tristana performance we saw from Yahoo earlier on. Yeah, I feel like Series 1 and Series 2 uh, very similar. There's not a lot to talk about there in the booth for T1 as they're already being sent out. Um, Faker gonna do most damage, Zeus is next, and then it's Call Me, but uh, not a lot of damage that meant too much. Not a lot of effective damage from the Tristana in this one. It was a big lead very early on. T1 got a 20 minute Baron, and then the game just fell off a cliff, and it ended. So T1 win game number one. We are going to have a break, and then the space will break down that wonderful first game. Good luck to you guys, and we'll be back after the break. あ、こんばんは。あ、こんばんは。あ、ちゃちゃちゃに。おでるわ、おでる。うん。出たの、ごめん。変じめしてたら。はい、大丈夫。
Okay.
Welcome back to The Space, ladies and gentlemen. We're here to break down the first game between T1 and Nongshim. I'm Atlas. I'm joined by Orcs and Chronicler. And we have a draft for you guys uh, to go over that meant something. Right, guys? You want to go? No. <laughs> yeah, I mean... I think we, we kind of seen, definitely from the last series and this series, the demise of the Twisted Fate was uh, greatly oversold. Still yeah. looks very strong, still does kind of the same things. Um, I think, you know, the Cluster of Renata is fine into the center, Tom. That That is a lane you can apply pressure on. Not super sold on the Udia. And then with this Trist Sejuani, you know, they try to utilize that really to punish Faker, I feel like, a lot of times. but. Win always having the most success, and with the way the comp played out, you know, you have two AD damage threats. One of them's Callisto, who doesn't scale fantastically into this Oriana center composition. Like, it was very obvious that Nongshim needed to get a big lead early. I would have really liked if they had shied away from the Sejuani. I know that Sylvie's more comfortable on it, but something more aggressive in terms of jungling. Obviously, Xin Zhao is the one that we've seen be relatively successful. Sponges also picked that one up a lot. Uh, that will be something that you can go towards. Fire ready, obviously taken away, but really, I think it's worth trying to find something. Rek'Sai got buffed yeah. really hard on this patch, is actually a fine champion and is really good into Lee. Because I just think that they actually had the right idea, even though the execution wasn't all there as we saw in the bot lane with this. It's similar to what DRX did, where you're just like, we're going to send it. Like, if we don't win the early game, we're not winning against this team anyway. And particularly with how the first half of the draft played out, I would have loved to see the Sejuani be just something different. Wouldn't it have mattered? Probably, probably not, but still. Yeah, what can you do? And you may as well uh, try and shoot your shot. And they absolutely did. Uh, the early stage of the game, it felt like Nongshin were trying to go for the right things. Unfortunately, sometimes the right things lead to the wrong outcome. You know, the all-in, as you said, completely right. The execution is a little bit off here. You know, it's a good flash from Guma, but then the tower hit being taken there, really brutal. And I also feel like here, Jiwoo doesn't take as many opportunities to get autos in as you might have hoped. The cleanse also, I think he mistimed it there, so the slow still connected. Ultimately, it's a trade where it could have been a big advantage. And then this, this was where really a disaster started to open up because oh, you God. see the Trist just can't make the way in here. Not only that, Faker was already doing a really good job here in the 1v1, but also you're not playing with a melee mid laner, so... Clip, please, oh, oh God. Yes. Yeah, that was a cut the video. Yeah, he, had, he had flash as well, so... If he flashes, he might still die, but at least he has a shot. Not going to be the case here. And the only thing that saves this from being a complete disaster is the fact that they do get the kill. But the trades still are always going in favor of T1. Because again, looking at the compositions and the fact that it's T1, if they get to a mid to late game and they don't lose every single trade, they're always going to be happy. And uh, that early game was not what Nongshim needed. Certainly wasn't. And uh, all the while, you know, this is Faker's Oriana in the mid lane as well. The guy is pretty good on the champion, but he was focused pretty heavily, and that seemed to matter about zero. In fact, it almost seemed like it was better for T1 that Faker kept absorbing all of this pressure. And it all led to this moment here, which was the uh, the ultimate death nail. Yeah, this was a consistent theme where Nongshun were trying to punish people in side lanes, obviously with the TF as well, very powerful split composition, but again, miss execution, the timing here, the ult knocks them out of the hostile takeover. I'm going to reel this deficit, I'm not sure they would have won the fight even if it hit, but moments like that just really illustrate that Nongshin, they're just struggling really to connect with key abilities, with little micro misplays, that even when they do have the right idea, they aren't able to pull through with it. Unfortunately for Nongshin, their struggles do continue. They are more of a game two team, is what we normally say. <laughs> because they That's have, good Kobe which, which yeah. truly, like factually is the case. But I think that here we do see T1 obviously struggled a little bit, lost against Hanwha, but against a team like Nongshim, Nongshim shouldn't have any say. And this game already felt like they didn't. They certainly didn't. Uh, they gave it their best. It was not quite enough. Let's uh, have a look at uh, who picks up POG for this one. There's a few front runners, and it is going to be Ona that collects it. He's famously sin 9, 1, and 6, and he ran the early game. Yeah, I mean, he was just super on point. In these 2v2s between the mid-jungle, it was very clear that Nongshim's plan was really to try and put the pressure on the, Ori on the Orianna, but Ona's execution really uh, put a spanner on the works. I mean, this one was... More so, just a little bit of a mistake being in the shop, but I feel like the follow-up, I assume, is the one, yeah, where he lands this sonic wave that turns around what otherwise could have been a disastrous play. 
Owner also had a really rough performance last week. Peanut really outdid him by a pretty substantial margin. So, again, level of opposition is obviously going to matter, but I do think that these are the type of games where you do kind of regain momentum going into playoffs. And Onum is most definitely a momentum-based player. Yep. Uh, there is... Just a smattering of other votes. I do very much like the uh, the carrier vote there, and uh, a faker vote coming on in. He did have some decent shockwaves, but unfortunately not going to be overtaking Chovy today. Might be able to equalize him though, because we have another game, <laughs> right? Right, guys. I just the most reduction. important race. <laughs> This wolf. <laughs> Look, he just it doesn't have an opportunity to defend himself right now. He's just like, what? Like, <laughs> come on, you know? <laughs> Give him a break. <laughs> <laughs> well, now he's now he can actually defend himself because we're gonna throw it over to the cast of desk to get into game number two. Poor wolf. Thank you, spacers, for that wonderful breakdown. Uh, we're getting ready for game number two, Wolf. Any thoughts heading into this one? Uh, yeah. Um. I think Faker drew a ton of the attention on the map. Sonya's dwell and shot called a lot of those fights. I mean, it was him and owner for me. The carry of vote was kind of funny. <laughs> he did end up winning that 2v2 for them in the bottom lane, which ruined the lane. So could give him a vote as well. I, I, I don't mind it. I just saw the lights came on. I didn't know what was going on. And then I felt like I was, uh, I was on the secret hidden camera. <laughs> well, let's move into the second draft because Something's gonna have to change here for uh, for Nongshim if they are going to bring this to three. They're the game two team, as it's been dubbed by you and the space there. But not ready to trust we're going there, as they will take away. What's that? Who's who's champion? Was it the mid laners? Yeah. <laughs> they didn't ban Lee Sin. I'm no, just Lee saying. Sin, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's see. Maybe they ban it here. Nope. Nope. Not gonna happen. Ash, Maokai. Is it going to be a Tom Kench? No! As it turns <laughs> out. <laughs> I'm sorry to everyone. Uh, anyways, let's see if the Senna will get banned this time around. The Callista is banned. The the Ash is gone here. Varus is still available. But maybe Nongshim Red Force themselves interested in potentially picking up the Callista. Might be a trade for Smolder. Lucian is also still up for Guma Karia. I'm very happy to play that. Will not be left up. So, if you want to lock the Smolder, you're going to have to deal with the Lucian. Same to be said of Zeri, of course. Maybe they just first pick Nautilus here. Leave it a little bit open-ended. You could. I mean, Nautilus is pretty strong, but... Um, Lee Sin instead. So they are going to potentially counterpick that one from our POG winner of game number one. <laughs> and to be honest, I don't think it's a bad idea. Um, there are still a lot of strong picks available, and maybe you want a little bit more information before you go head first into like a smolder comp or something like that. So just go ahead and pick the lease in, very blindable, and then move on once you see what else T1 want to play. Yeah. It may just be Lucian Nami here. Could just grab Nautilus, though. Baker going to get the Talia. So it does feel like it is going to be a pushing bottom lane of some kind. It might just be Talia Lucian. Varus, I think, is also pretty safe in the draft like this. As, okay. No, that was Zack. Uh, yeah, I'm just... Yeah. I just thought maybe they were going to... They were just going to have a little <laughs> bit more fun. Valdez, but they just locked the unfun Sejuani. Yeah, they're going to say, this is how you play Sejuani. Let us show you in game two. It would be Zach, really fun if we uh, use reverse drafts, but... Yeah. Zach's not coming yet. Not just yet. Did get a slight nerf uh, on this patch. Um, Sylvie is going to pick Udyr for the team. And that means that Dindum will be playing this back-to-back. -back. Yeah, this time they won't have a Sejuani with it. See if... T1 just want to run the Twisted Fate back as it did give Nongshim a little bit of power topside, but not for very long. Ari would be interesting here. They did not sub Fiesta in critically. We, we didn't talk about that just yet. It's okay, Karma. But T1 will not let you play Smolder in this draft. Varus will come through in response. They may leave it open and say, we just crush you so hard in lane that we don't care, and let the Smolder get locked in here for Jiwoo, and then just try to outplay it. 
That'd be a very T1 thing to do, like last game when they let the Clist go through and just picked Senna into it and still won. Yeah. The fact that Varus made it all the way through to R3, and now they get a couple of 80 carry bans. It is pretty strong. Very strong pick in general. It was first ban in the first series uh, on blue side both times, game one and game two, and in game one of this series. So with Nautilus banned, would you rather deal with Zeri or would you rather deal with Smolder? Is the question here for T1. Van Rakan. Very interesting to see that one. Very worried about the 0 and 6 Zaya. Yeah, that's very <laughs> bad into Varus. Yeah, no, I'm not 100% sure about that one. Rakan himself is very reliable in gauge, but... Uh... I don't see any other pick that that makes a lot of sense here for Nongshim, unless they wanted to go like Ezreal Karma and put Call Me on something else. Jace, a smart ban here. It also makes me worried that they might be playing Zaya. Where's Aatrox? Okay. Smolder Varus. I think they're just hovering it to say, I know you're going to pick this. There, there's no way T1 would play an unusual, strange bottom lane. Would they, Valdez? They would, would they play Vayne top into the man who failed to get a win on it? Or will they just play Renekton? Or Nar. It's not. It's not. Nar, and known to be pretty good into Udyr. Yeah. The the good version of a ranged top into Udyr. Yes. Not Vayne. Not Vayne. Who's a fate was okay. But the Nar is the real safe one. Yeah, it's going to be very difficult to punish. As they knew it was going to be Smolder. You and I knew it was going to be Smolder. We all knew. I thought maybe for a moment it could be Zeri, but... Nah. It's going to be the Smolder upset angle. The Ox principle. The Ox Principle. <laughs> <laughs> um, Milio is stronger for Smolder in the late game. Now, Alistair is stronger in the early game for surviving dives. It is also Sejuani you're playing into, so you feel pretty good. Yeah, it's Sejuani Forest. I think the Milio is a good call. Yeah, feels pretty good against the CC you're up against here. And the range that you're going to get is going to feel really nice, too. You're going to have mid prio into the Talia, unless Call Me makes. Big lane errors. So a solid draft here for Nongsham all around. We'll find out what's going to hold it all together here for Karia. Could be Caitlyn. Rumble! Okay. It's not the Rumble Ash, it's the Rumble Varus. So, uh, Wolf, you want to tell us about your experiences watching this in Challenger yeah, League? So when I watched Challengers, when it was Ash Rumble, what T1 Challengers did was Smash and Reckless was they slowed the enemy champions under turret after pushing the lane in, and then the rumble pressed Q towards them, and they died. <laughs> and it was very it was very interactive gameplay. Yeah. Um, in this game, the Karma is probably going to have to bail this lane out a little bit. And if she gets that prior to come down, or otherwise it's going to have to be babysat a little bit here by Sylvie, as you know, it's a little bit less uh, of a early threat in this lane than it was with the Ash, because you're not going to have any CC with Varus until you hit level six. But then you can just lock them down under the turret in your pushing lane with your Chains of Corruption, drop Equalizer, and make it happen. It's just says, I haven't given up, so you don't give up either, Nongshim. And then, of course, the Jew plus Ronaldo sign. Or is it Jew times Ronaldo? I don't know. It's a it's the collaboration X, fellas, yeah. that everybody loves these days. Absolutely. Well, this time, Call Me has been put on Karma Duty, and we'll see how that goes for him. And we have Varus Rumble in the bottom lane for T1. I think we're going to see a lot of things set on fire in this game number two. As we are ready, let's hop onto the rift. So Rumble has purchased the World Atlas. It is going to be farming Varus, as we expected. But we have seen variants of this where the Rumble does farm. It's a little bit trickier to pull, pull it off. As uh, she will going to get some stacks. Two! Oh my gosh. No one's ever had that many stacks at 50 seconds. It's the fastest pace we've ever seen. The Nongshim Game 2 angle. It's real, Valdez. It's happening. Look at him. 
And that's a number two I see. He's ahead of Viper's pace right now. <laughs> if he could just keep this up. It's true. I could see it. <laughs> he is currently ahead. It's uh, factually a thing. Meanwhile. Yeah, that's how I feel when I jump on my flying rock surfboard as well <laughs> and get really excited. I've been playing a lot of Talia jungle recently. It's yeah. Pretty, it's pretty good. It's pretty fun. Sylvie and Dinden going to get a ward here and start Raptors. They were seen on Vision um, that was placed. So is Zoner. Zoner will also, as you say, be seen and going to be vertical jungling to start things off. Jiu has played four games of the Smolder. Only one time did, were they able to get the Karma with it. As you can see, Call Me did not win that game, fortunately, but it has been the most common mid pairing. As Faker is 7 and 1 on this. Owner hasn't played a single game of Set 20. That's kind of wild. Yeah. Level 1 tree. Uder just does his, his circle thingy at him. That's the official name of it. Yeah, circle thingy. Yeah, uh, very strong. Ah. Ah, yes. Mia! <laughs> From Sorry One Prince playing up against KT's two shit. It's been a while. What were you doing in 2020? Um. Getting ready to cast the LCK at 2021. Yeah. <laughs> in all seriousness. Yeah. This is what true. I did for a, a very long time. Yeah. That was like mid-summer. Actually, end of summer, I guess. Mid-August. So, makes sense. They'll get there soon enough. We're all already almost done with spring somehow. Yeah. All right, so... So far, the poke has been good here. Karia goes Comet, and you try to just chip away at these health bars with your harpoons, and if they try to come up to contest the wave, you set them on fire. Mm -hmm. Then you crash waves in. When you have level six, you can do a really nice all-in, but if you do enough chip damage before that, there's obviously an angle there too, with the wave crashing. The vertical jungling that was set up is really nice as uh, Karia. He does not have his Q yet. Just use the speed boost on his shield and the harpoons to trade with the aggressive ignite as well, just to get them low. And you can see already, this is annoying, and Sylvie has to come down here after not even fully clearing his jungle. Level three, and he's not going to go for the gank. I mean, they're just too low, and it's a smolder. So, like, what are you going to do? Yeah. Also, the Melio, like, there's no engage. So, either you stop a dive from happening, or you try to 1v2 almost. Well, the, the vertical jungling at least does give him the space to come down here and do this freely without any sort of 3v3 happening. And Honor is going to come uh, down to the mid lane right now, as you guys can see on the map, trying to threaten to call me. But otherwise, he's going to force a back out of Peter. And in the uh, bottom 2v2, this is going extremely well for Guma Karia, as you'd expect. This is the weakest part of Smolder is the, the early game. And lanes like Varus into it do feel fantastic. Let's see what Owner can get done here. Call me is in a lot of trouble. He is going to flash away from this one, and so he should be fine. But yeah, that's an early flash already taken away. Gets hit by the seismic shove. Baker actually ahead in CS in this matchup, feeling very good about that. And don't worry, observers, it's Udir. I think it's gonna happen. <laughs> <laughs> it's Dundin, they're like, it's Dundin Wolf. I'm like, okay, well, that's that's a fair counterpoint. Nothing's gonna happen. Did we see Zeus get the solo kill in game one? Uh, Wasn't that the first series? It all happened so fast. No, I don't I'm think like, so. I don't even know. I don't think he did. I think it was Keen, right? He got no. the solo kill. That's right. Oh, with the Cassante. Yeah, not to wrong. Yes. Yeah. Game two. So, Varus very good at trading. Rumble, very good at early trading. And they're playing into this lane that has a Smolder who doesn't even have 25 stacks. So, that's the way that's going to go. We do have Sylvie on the Void Grubs already. And Donor's down here on the bottom side of the map doing the Hextech Dragon. Yeah, and because Faker's actually winning mid, there's just no contest possible here for Dragon. And that is not what you want to see. And if you're running the Karma, he's going to come over now, but it's very late. See if they can get something done in this skirmish. So hard to fight with Smolder. These very, very early skirmishes. There's just no way. I mean, he's just dead. I don't even know why they walked up to that one. Uh, Peter's just going to die. He did try to flash. And, um, yeah, kind of ill-advised to try to go in and challenge that one. Especially because the Drake was already so low. 
If you had rotated over as Call Me, or if you were if you had Pryo and you could stop Faker from being there, or make his Weaver's Wall a little bit more awkward to use, there's a there's a world where you can contest that, but with everything the the way it was set up, I mean it was just never gonna happen. And they felt super priced into it. And this is the the frustrating thing as as a commentator watching Smolder games sometimes with our you know east side teams, it's just the wind conditions aren't necessarily fully understood is Sophie coming up here to see if Zayas is in trouble. Yeah, this is Mini Nar, and uh, he is going to have to flash out of this one. Tries to flash to the side, still gets hit by the Q as Sylvie is a genius on that one. And Dindin, gonna take a bunch of damage, but he will be just fine. Nice yeah. play from Sylvie. Can't even blame any, anything there for Zayas. It's just really good play from Sylvie and Dindin. The Q does connect. Zayas has to flash, but still gets hit by that follow up Q, and the timing of that was fantastic. And the fact that Sylvie was top means that their bottom lane that already didn't exist is it's like wiped off of the face of the universe. <laughs> yeah, it's uh Somebody click on Smolder. No, don't. Somebody Please, click on no. Smolder. No, I don't wanna see it. I think we know. I'm gonna, I'm gonna guess it. 30. Uh, well, the ult's going to come in here as Sylvie is uh, going to eat a bunch of ultimate abilities. Has to flash the seismic shove here. Does Jiwoo. As everybody has joined, you talk about the ability of the Talia to join into these bottom lane fights. They've got everybody and, 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 their, and their whole families here. But you're playing, you know, you're playing Karma and Talia. The Talia's not supposed to be able to have this much free reign. And, uh, yeah, he is down his flash already, and now he's down half of his health bar. Peter still doesn't have his flashback. They're gonna Call get the turret. Mid. They're gonna get nine the, minutes. the whole turret and all the plates. Peter is level three. It's gonna be like that for a little bit longer because both he and Jiwoo can't stack. He can't stack and can't farm because they can't get to where they're the minions are. They're getting denied so many minions right now. It's insane. Like, look at how much XP they lost. Uh, and now they're gonna try to fight this 4v4, but again, their bottom lane doesn't exist. Jiwoo is gonna hit a Q. That one's point and click, thankfully, and Donor just flashes away, and he's totally fine as the rest of them. Just gonna pump damage into that Karma. And, well, at least the turret survives. I don't think that's actually a good thing at this point in time. No, it's keeping him away from minions. <laughs> it's really annoying for him, actually, as uh, you will get some of these at least. And he's half the CS of Avaris here at eight minutes. And Call Me has not been able to change the, the story of this game. He just hit level six, did carry up. Yeah, he could just go for the equalizer here. Next, next flash. Next flash, yeah. There's a ward, though. Yeah, G wouldn't die, I don't think. Um, but still going to go for multiple. it, and uh, just going to flap away. And the Q is dodged here. I mean, this is just like, this is just bullying. And are they going to get the turret? I don't know. Team of Corruption comes down, and now Peter's going to just barely survive with that shield as Sylvie desperate to try to help, and he finally will be able to as the turret it stays alive on about five health. Yeah, well, that ended up backfiring for T1 in a big way, staying there. This play, on the other hand, where Rumble just presses Q and flashes onto the uh, poor Milio, who can't do anything about it. Um, call me? Okay. Well, now Call Me is, uh, he is Karma. He's just gonna flash out of this one. Faker, though, with his own flash, trying to hit some rocks, and that he will. Flashes forward for that kill. As looks like Owner just threw an ult in, and uh, Call Me just got comboed. The power of the Talia. There you go, there you have it. And uh, Call Me just a bit far up, I guess, and got caught by the shove. It's as simple as that. We're just watching gold explode everywhere for T1 right now on this map. Known from our pinata, they are hitting repeatedly, um, and they're not blindfolded, actually. <laughs> Leeson's on the other side. Birthday party just got really <laughs> overly aggressive at this point, and Karius is eating three turret shots for some reason, so he um, is just going to die. Trying to flank on the support rumble, I guess. I, I don't know. It's okay. Just a little bit of showboating. Just a little bit of happy gaming. Nongshim are happy for it, though. They're the ones who are really happy uh, with the happy gaming because they're actually now starting to get some gold back into their pockets here. Three kills for Sylvie. Kill picked up for Zhu on that bottom side attempt from T1. Yes, it's still a massive lead for Guma. And yes, the Smolder is not going to be relevant anytime soon. 67 stacks he's sitting at here is kind of unbelievable. As Kami just trying to put the pressure on mid turret. No real vision around this area. Not advised, will be punished for it. 
good flash from Faker to guarantee the last part of that uh, volley does connect. And Carrier here is kind of corralled by Sylvie and Dindin, so not really much he could have done in the situation. But the, the answer to this situation was to not be in the enemy jungle in that position. <laughs> I think that's probably, yeah. what, probably what he should have done, was to just go back in time and not do Oh that. boy. It's Infernal Rift here. T1 did take the first couple of drakes because Smolder does not get drakes. And <laughs> that just means that we're going to have a lot of map control, which means more cinders, which means also more chances to get these Infernal Drakes and Infernal Soul. And Rumble with Infernal Soul, uh, Talia with Infernal Soul, Boris with Infernal Soul. Heck, even Gnar. Uh, pretty strong, as Kalmi does not have Flash. He does have a Tether and a Prayer, I suppose. But um, after Shock has come through and the Permafrost, and that will be the end of the Karma, just very far up the lane with not enough vision. All you can do is pray to Faker, but he will not answer. He's going to give you a, another Faker death. works in mysterious ways. It certainly does. And in this case, a little bit more straightforward and less mysterious, but... Well, let's see how, how mysterious this, this is. Case. Yeah, yeah, let's see. <laughs> <laughs> now, Talia, okay, he is going to be able to knock him away. And now he's, he's got a blast cone. Maybe can help him out with a DP coming in, though. Looks like Baker is not very long for this world. He is going to get a nice combo, though, on a call. He's keeping them at range. I think he was going to land here from call me, but eventually still be. Works up the courage to challenge Baker, and that will be the end of that. So we do have the uh, <laughs> the red carpet is called down, and Carrie is just uh, shelling at him from range. Doesn't even need to burn him in this case. <laughs> so much time spent on the bottom lane for Sylvie. Obviously, that yes, Faker dies, but they get to set up that play topside with the support rumble, drop the equalizer, and then them with the Q. They burn down there by Scorch in the end, and now it's the second kill of the game. He's had some whoopsies. He's had some. Fun moments, let's say. Oh but yeah, it has. Uh, <laughs> it hasn't been all bad here. You know, he's getting the advantages that you want with the rumble for the Varus in the bottom lane, and now helping Zayas out. So Zayas is starting to get quite large up here too. We'll get the teleport out of Dindin and some additional plate gold. And his owner does not have his ult back just yet, but still interested. <laughs> Coming up empty. Yeah. So, he calculated there from Sylvie, like sand going through owner's fingers. Well, Carrie is ganking top again, and let's see how this one goes. Uh, Udyr this time around is unmovable, but it does not matter. As he got CC'd by Dying, actually, this time around. Uh, nice little steal here from Sylvie, trying to make a play. Kick comes through, hits the both of them. Now Mob is called down for it feels like the first time in this game, actually. 14 minutes in, and they just get away. So imagine this scenario. You're a 13 and 3 team. You just lost two important matches to Gen G and Hanwha Life. It's the last week of LCK. Really important games. Easier opponents, but you got to win those. Otherwise, Hanwha might be creeping up on you. Might be taking your second spot away. Might be, be going for a uh, potential run into the round two. So you'd have to play that first round, but you could be eliminated if you get upset. So what do you do? Rumble support, gameplay <laughs> like this. That's right. <laughs> It's a T1 game two versus Gnome Shival. That's, that's where we are right now. You are here. Yeah. Um, <laughs> we have the map open right now. <laughs> no. like, oh, yeah, we're right there. Right uh, there. Um, and I'm, a, I'm here for it because if it was just super calculated, great T1 macro, amazing standard boring draft, it wouldn't be as fun, would it? Yeah. You know, I'm kind of surprised they brought out the Rumble in this in the series because it was something we saw to the Challenger team, but now... You know, maybe it's not something they will bring out against one of the really strong opponents in a best of five, but maybe if things get desperate, like in a game three, now uh, other teams will know that they also have this in their back pocket. Didn't necessarily have to show it against Gnome Shim, but maybe they wanted to put that fear into the other teams, maybe bait out a rumble ban at some point. And we did see some, some uh, Ash bans and some rumble bans throughout last week when it was popular yeah. uh, in the LCK where it was very clear teams were worried it might happen. Uh, some of their scaling bottom lanes. Um, the Rumble ban in the first series was was just weird. That, that wasn't it. But anyway, uh, we have seen some that were in places where you realize that they definitely thought that there was a chance that this could be played. And we've seen it with Ash. Now we've seen it with Varus. It did work in terms of the laning phase. And it has worked in terms of getting both the Varus and the Nar into a pretty successful position here. As the execution has been mostly good. Um, 
Carrie's not gonna like it for his KDA, but you know, showing another champion of his ocean here in the bottom lane as the dragon started up here by Nongshim as T1 a little bit late on the rotation. Zayas does have TP. He's getting a turret, meanwhile. I wonder if we're gonna get a Huni rating on this rumble, by the way. It's a support rumble, so perhaps not, but he has gone for the Huni builds. Including a Ignite, as you would in the bottom lane. Zeus is here. Meganar is about to time out, though, as Alt comes down. And everybody's corralled against the wall. Oh, no! <laughs> Zeus is going to take advantage of that. Now, it does go the way of Nosim. The Drake, they do take it out. And it's a one-for-one -one trade at the moment. Karia flashes the wall. Doesn't get anything. Comes up empty. And you know what? <laughs> Nosim, they get the Drake, and they trade one-for-one. One. Not yeah, this, half bad. This is actually really good for Nosim now. The mid turret is going to go down. The top push was very successful for Zayas as well. Did a significant amount of damage to that turret, but unfortunately now is down his teleport. And good flash from Call Me as well over the wall as soon as Zayas went into the pit for the play. A really well timed Narbar on his TP in. It ends up being a trade of kills here, but the dragon going over, extending this game significantly for this smolder. And the rumble is, it has the Andres right, he has the Sork Shoes doing the Huni build. That's his Ignite. But he is a support Rumble who's not going to continue to get resources this game. This is kind of full build. You're supposed to win the game off of the advantages you have here. And you're not going to offer the same sort of utility as Bolt comes through on the call me. And when Zayas comes in here, he flashes out instantly and then uh, puts up the root. As then the Smolder Ultimate comes down and Dundun is actually able to secure the kill here. Yeah. And they end up trading one for one and the Dragon is secured. But Karia, he's, he's full build now and he becomes less and less of a big problem later on. And that 50 CS lead that Varus has feels so amazing, feels so terrible if you're the Smolder in the early game, but as we approach 20 minutes, 25, maybe 30 minutes into this game, you're going to care less and less as you continue to stack and your items come online anyways. So definitely feeling right now as Nongshim the most hopeful you felt in the last 18 minutes and two seconds. <laughs> yeah, I, I do think that uh, Jiu has been stacking up pretty well since the early game disaster, um, which we don't really want to speak about, but ever since then, he has been doing a good job. So I don't think he's that close, but uh, he's at 174, which is not bad considering the way the early game went for 18 and a half minutes. So. Yeah, he got a decent amount of stacks off that last fight, too, and now he's going to go get some off of Guma. Yeah, it's a bit more. Let's add a little bit more into that. Guma getting pretty low. Equalizer comes down as Sylvie gets in there and he catches Guma, and he might go down for it, but look at the damage he does. Dude, he gets to that back line. And this happy game, he doesn't feel very happy anymore as Nongshim are fighting, but Call Me does stay a bit too far ahead of his team as everybody else was running away. Felt like Nongshim might have been able to extend that fight, but they chose not to. Yeah, size of relief on some of the faces of the T1 players after they are able to get those kills back. A bit of greed from Call Me. Sylvie, you can understand, he's going in to make the play. Of course, he needs to go that deep, but Call Me does get punished here. It felt a little bit unnecessary there at the end. But Jiwu kind of leads the charge here on this play. Flaps in, chunks Guma down, and Sylvie is looking for an angle here onto Karia. The Equalizer gets a decent amount of damage done, but again, <laughs> flash kick for the win, or Q into the kick there for the win, yeah. and Karia does end up going down, but then Call Me ends up getting flipped, and so. I feel like they could have stuck around, but I guess with the Meganar, and Dindin had already gone down to the bottom lane. Like, if Dindin was there and if he was in the front line tanking, like, the owner was so low. But, you know, we, we don't have 225 stacks yet for the Smolder. They're like, oh, okay, well, it was a good trade at least. Um, but I do feel like that was a nice angle for them to try to squeak a little bit more out of it. They're still down about, you know, 4,500 gold. So even though it was a pretty good fight, it's not like it's getting them right back in the game or anything like that. Yeah, I mean, I think if Call Me doesn't die there and only Sylvie dies, you could probably continue to push the play pretty comfortably. It was a tough call in that moment, though, after he gets caught by the shove and the team's a little bit disjointed. As uh, as you say, T1 definitely still in the driver's seat in this game. But the Smolder is becoming more and more of a problem. That might not necessarily have to be solved, but T1 do want to win this next Dragon fight. It's very important for them. If Gnome Shim end up getting two Infernal Dragons, on top of the already great scaling that they have in this composition. Oh. <laughs> the goose blade out. Yeah. He is just about to have his flashback, Sylvie. So, could have maybe looked for a play. But uh, not going to happen. Zeus is up a couple of levels here on the Dindin. 
felt like the Udir was actually making something happen in that last team fight. But yeah. the side lane still a bit of a, a issue, especially with the Black Cleaver finished already for Zeus. Yeah, he's just kind of been sitting in the sides by himself for a really long time, and so he's getting a ton of extra experience, getting a ton of extra CS, as is noted in the, the farm numbers here. Now, Gnomeshim also have to fight for this dragon. Baker does not have TP. We'll have Weaver's Wall soon. There's a window here for Nongshim to actually make an aggressive play and secure this dragon. Obviously, Jiu does have his ult. He's about to finish his stacks as well. Off of these two minions, he'll get it. He has it. Yeah. Very nice timing. Now, the spike at 225, not as good as it used to be, but still pretty good. And now, actually, it says right down there that it's at 6.93, so actually pretty good Yeah. <laughs> at the good. moment. Um, and we're getting some damage into this one. Equalizer comes down. That is a nice wall to get them against the wall. But it is going to be smited away by the owner, actually. As now, in the pit they are, they all got to flash away. And down will go Sylvie. Not able to secure that objective. So T1 able to get this fight and get the Infernal Soul Point. Still have enough space on the fight to actually control it the way they want to. And the Weaver's Wall really ruins everything Nongshim was trying to do there. And then the smite goes over to owner. If the smite goes to Sylvie, you can still at least salvage it in, in that you were able to get the drag or the uh, the dragon itself and you get some of that scaling. But now T1 are on soul point, they win the fight, they are gonna start Baron. Well, Mom's trying to help out here. Faker is pretty low, gets a big shield from the Saris, but they're not gonna be able to stop this Baron from going down as you gonna flash forward and doesn't even get the kill. Owner might bite the dust, but trying to just back out this one it is going to elect a flash away. Zeus as well just hops and D1 are pretty much out. A call me is going to hit the Mantra Q, but no execute right now. And now they're actually trying to turn something on to Jiu. You do not have to stay here, T1. And Jiu is flapping on in, looking for a bit more. They do not have any vision. And now the entirety of the team of T1 is sticking around as they're looking for a fight. Yeah, this is T1's way. Oh, you think you're going to pick us? We're actually, how many of us are still over here? You don't know. And uh, now they know. <laughs> Jiu's going to miss, unfortunate. But now they're all the way underneath the Ender Turret, so that's the end of that. Well, the silver lining here is that Nongshim burned a lot of the time of the Baron away with uh, repeatedly stopping those backs, but not able to get any kills. As Dundun will get some bounty gold here for his squad, but see if Zayas can make anything of this play with the Weaver Wall. Oh, it's looking like uh, Dundun is going to run away from all the rocks. If you can outrun the rock missile speed, I think you'll be fine here. Um, he's just running the opposite way now, trying to buy as much time as possible. And you know what? He might just be fine, especially with this nice little disengage cone. Not sure why we still have these in the game. Dinden just still running. And uh, I think he's going to go down right now as Gumption trying to fight here in a 4v3. Gonna bay down an ult from owner, I guess. I mean, the idea is good. You you pull them around on the bottom side, and then maybe Jiu can get something done in this fight. He is getting stronger and stronger by the moment. That's just on that last fight. And if he's just a few stacks ahead when he flashes for that play, maybe he gets the kill. His equalizer is gonna be huge. The equalizer is pretty gigantic. Call me is in a lot of trouble. He does not have his flash. He's just running away from this one. Carry on. He's got Sylvie on top of him. Doesn't care. Even Bob's gonna try to help out, but it does not matter. And T1. Looks like they've had enough of the shenanigans trying to get some actual value out of their Baron push. Yeah, a uh, very weird game, but the chaos is where T1 are going to thrive once again. Soul point, there's two minutes to go until that dragon that will decide the game is going to, to spawn. If, if Nongshim take it, they might be able to live a little bit longer, right? But the Baron power play here is sitting at 3,500, 3,600 nearly. End up grabbing those additional kills off of really nice flank from Karia where the Equalizer traps them there. Zayas going to grab another turret. Just so much going the way of T1 here. 11,000 gold nearly, or just 10,000 gold rather, is the gold lead. Don't do math on stream. <laughs> and I, I, I'm looking at the scenario and I can only think of one way for this to go Nongshim's way, which is that they need to be on this objective first and Kalmi needs to hit all of the poke and if Jiwoo can get a kill or two early on in the fight before Faker gets the angle he wants with his Weaver's Wall before Owner can get on top of the Dragon, then maybe you could win this. Even 10,000 gold at down in, in a miracle scenario, you maybe could win this, but you have to get onto the Dragon first. And I just don't think T1 are going to allow it. It's not looking very doable at this point in time. There's this one ward <laughs> that Owner is on. He's going to take that one out. We've still got a minute until this one does spawn. But uh, with no Baron available, there's not really anything else to do, right? Except get mid-prowl, get bot-prowl, 
and try to set yourself up to be in a good spot for this fight. And Nongshim essentially just going to have to provide a front line for their smolder. That's that's their late game win condition. And that's the only way they're going to win this fight. They need to get to you in a spot to do enough damage. Call me needs to be hitting poke too. Without his poke, Jiwoo's damage alone isn't enough. And, you know, Jiwoo obviously has to get very close to the enemy team to actually land those Qs, even with the Milio. So, it's really tough here for Nongshim. And T1, like I said, they're not giving any space to Nongshim whatsoever. They have so much vision control here. The Nongshim have to wrap all the way around to try to get to this pit. Zayas will see them. Yeah. Zayas, I think he's trying to get bot maybe to... Uh, there's not even a wave there for him to try to get towards the Smeganar, but... Uh, Baker has TP and Weaver's Wall, and he's going to get this inhibitor turret. The clock is running against Nongshim. Ooh. <laughs> And the poke is uh, its beginning to land here. The VAR is having a bit easier of a time uh, from range. Call Me is not hitting the poke. And it might just come down to a bit of a split unless T1 can get a fight started on their terms. As everybody on the side of Nongshim is just backing away. We got a wall here. They just want to get this Infernal Soul. And Nongshim are just going to give it up. They say, nope, we don't have the positioning on this one. And we are just going to let them have it. It's not, it's not getting better for Nongshim, but if they lose a fight here, the game just ends. So they have to walk away. And they give Infernal Soul, which feels terrible. It feels like a game-losing play. But as you say, with the positional advantage T1 had, there was no winning play. There was no angle. Speaking of angles... Now they're just going to throw an ult in. Not exactly sure why, but... They're just trying to create space, make sure they get that inhibitor, which they do. No Baron buff at the moment. Still 45 seconds until that one. T1 just poking them down, harassing, and trying to push up. Create more space before they do go for this Baron. And this Rumble pick obviously is still relevant in this game. And I feel like Kerry has really increased its longevity by having great equalizers. The map control they've had has allowed him to, to make some really cool, cool and clutch plays. The Smolder is going to be bigger, as you can see here. Now moving up to 9.73. That is a big execute threshold. He's getting closer and closer to being able to kind of two-shot people, and if he ends up hitting a big swath uh, of, of T1 members with his Q in a team fight, maybe you could carry it. I just think that T1, if they regroup here and push, they can end the game before the Elder spawns. They obviously can just force a Baron fight as well. So, Nongshim have to be proactive. They're trying to find an angle, but T1 is not leaving any openings, and Zayas has teleport. He's going to threaten a second inhibitor here. Somebody has to respond, but that means Baron. And it's not going to be Dindin. He's not enough to, to answer this push. Uh, well, I guess it's the whole team. Um, <laughs> guys, you're going to give away the Baron. It's Nar also here for Zeus. Uh, will they get Zeus is the question. It looks like they should be able to relatively easily. And yeah, Zeus is like, okay, you, you got me. You, you did get me. But you're giving away the Baron. And I suppose for Nongshim, they'd say, well, we're never going to be able to try to fight for Baron right now, so let's just take the consolation prize. But again, it kind of feels like you're giving away another huge objective, just like what happened on the Infernal Soul. Yeah, and I think this time you actually have to wipe T1. You can't just sit back and go, well, let's we'll try to defend this Baron. You've got you to get in there and force a kick play as Sylvie. He's got Flash. It's time to shine. Are you going out of this one? 0-2, Nongshim. I mean, again, the, the chances of them winning this game are growing by each passing moment, but they still have to deal with this Baron push. And there wasn't really a great play to make when Zayas was pushing bottom side there. Dindin is two levels down, or was at the time. He can't come over there and deal with it by himself and then teleport in. So if he goes down there, they lose him and then lose the inhibitor and then also lose the Baron. So they just opted into trying to kill Zayas here and saying this is the the highest positive play. Is it a positive situation? No, but it's a less bad situation. If we can just live for the Elder fight, if we could maybe survive this Baron. Two more minutes on that. Maybe we had that Miracle Elder fight, because that's all it takes to win this game for Nongshim is one win on the Elder fight. Easier said than done, but if the chance is not 0%, but that Nexus is still alive, that Smolder's still scaling. <laughs> Nongshim fans clutching their seats tightly open. Maybe, is there a world? How crazy would it be if they come back in this game? I don't see it myself, but the, the Nexus is still alive. Yeah. You also had Smolder and Karma with TP. Like, you could have sent them both down if you really wanted to fight for the Baron. It, it's almost like they said, no, we don't want to fight for the Baron by any means. It was very strange. And uh, T1 are just 
now pushing with the Sparrow, although the wave clear is pretty nice with Karma Smolder. It's what this comp the nation does offer you. Sylvie gonna queue in, looking for an angle, but T1 just uh, holding their ground. They're just going 3-1-1 and saying, we're gonna take out these inhibitors first before we do anything. Zayas should be able free. to get this. Oh, the minions will. Right? Oh, uh, the minions will. <laughs> he gets it. No, they won't. He gets it. Right? Yeah, he wants yeah. to instead. He's gonna take down Dindin. <laughs> and now we got a wall coming down. Zayas is going to get that one as Faker is just gonna have to uh, go into stasis. He is going to be executed. And now Sylvie, he gets a kick and immediately dies, but that's two executes now. For Jiwoo, who's looking for more, there's the third one. Triple comes forward from Jiwoo. And that will be four as Guma does bite the dust and Jiwoo will survive. Quadra th kill. As T1 can't quite break the base down. All right, so that is so much money that he just picked up here. We'll see what he ends up buying. Could just straight splurge for GA here if he wants to and then go for this Elder fight. 75 seconds until it spawns. T1 will be up. Guma also has teleport. In this matchup, he doesn't need any aggressive summers. He's just got the Ignite from Carrier, and we'll be able to match some of those rotations. This is kind of a botch, to be honest. Faker ends up coming in here, and it's Smolder, so he just flies over it, and then Faker has to stopwatch to try to stop himself from dying. The second execute threshold will be hit there, and then Jiwoo can fly and flap for the chase. And we might be seeing another Jiwoo ceremony if this does continue. It's not over yet. They still have to win the Elder fight, but this is the biggest swing you were ever going to hope for. He flapped over the wall, and then he got melee ulted. Yep, and then he's like, oh, I can cue them from a million miles away. He didn't say any of that, but... <laughs> I'm sure that Sylvie is screaming like, I'm going, I'm going, I'm going. The AD carries generally don't say too much. I mean, the Nongshim fans are, are here for it. Like, this this miracle comeback, I, I've been kind of, like, putting, setting up the script a little bit, you know? Like, hey, it could happen. It's probably not going to happen, but, like, the, the chances are high the longer this Elder game goes. Creek. Elder is up. The Ox Principal, Valez. Always respect the Ox Principal. The, <laughs> the Smolder and the upset. Nongshim at Pryo. And now Dindin, he's going to back. He can take uh, in. Yeah. Are they going to fight this or what? I mean... Maybe looking for a steal of some sort. It's just gonna come down to a 50-50, but that's a Lee City kicks him away, and it goes to oh, Forrest! Guma! Guma is gonna get it! As you know, Forrest does have a smite of his own. It's his Q button, and he will take it down in the chaos. T1 get it, and they're just waiting for the smolder. There's like negative wait, damage going wait. into him, though. Jiu kept alive by the Melio. Meanwhile, Zay is trying to end the game. Which Elder's there's... better, Valdez? I think I know. Oh, He's going to TP Jiu. back. Okay. And the game is not over. It's not over. It's not over. Jiu, how many stacks does this guy have right now? It's got to be a ton. We're reaching 34 minutes into this game. And T1 will maintain the Elder on a few of their members here. Let's see exactly how this goes. As far as just channeling, 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 he gets kicked away. Oh. At 162. No. That's just not it. How did it go that low? <laughs> With both smites available. 474 stacks currently on Smolder. Got the update. And yeah, so this ends up going their way, but Jiwoo actually flaps over here, gets behind them, and even with T1 having vision here, they just don't have the ability to lock him down. So he can just kind of fly around. It has to be Varus arrows that hit him, because you're not going to get him with a uh, Talia shove. A seismic shove's not going to catch this guy. Chains of Corruption's pretty tough to land in this situation. Otherwise, you're looking at Glacial Prison. And so it, there's just so much free reign, and it's not really part of this draft I thought about when we were looking at, you know, the Lions of 5v5 and the Soldiers survive the early game. How, how well can they get to the late game? How well can he stack with the Karma Pile? I wasn't really thinking about how many different ways can T1 use to lock him in place, and there's a few, but they're not consistent. So he's just had so much power in all of these extended fights. Now, T1 are going to start this Baron up on spawn here. No yeah. one is even in the top half of the map. The They're just quadrant. using the Elder Drake to, to get this objective, and they'll have Exodia for 35 <laughs> seconds. <laughs> but, um, you know, I think it's enough to actually group mid and take the mid inhibitor. Because even with you poking down and being annoying, you have Elder. So if you do it slow enough, might be enough. I mean, the wave clear is just so insane, though. T1 have to be so respectful that the bounce damage here on every single Jiwoo Q is so lethal. I mean, even on, on owner here is super tanky. How much damage it's done to him. His uh, shield is broken. 
on this Rooker and and uh, it's Prox here, rather, I should say. And so, yeah, they're just trying to split push uh, multiple lanes and just use that. The second that you uh, leaves mid, that's a, that's a go sign for T1. They're going to take down the mid inhibitor. We have double super minions in every wave. And yet, Smolder can 1v9. Yeah, I mean, owner is kind of in trouble here. He needs to get over this wall. State taking so much damage. Yeah, the trouble you mentioned is one Q. <laughs> yeah, just one. It's which just is one. which is actual trouble. Look at Carry as well. He nearly died. He almost died from two abilities. And now we got Gnar in the top side. Big equalizer. T1 trying to put an end to this one. But can they is the question. Kuma desperate to try to take down the turret. He gets the one. And Dinan is tanky enough. We still got one Nexus turret. And that might be enough as Jiu is so fast. He's going to land one Q onto Kuma. Kuma, he's going to flash and die. Flash is too late. He's in Q range there. Milio plus this late game smolder is just insane. Who says Varus outrages a smolder? Jiu says not today. And they cannot end. And that Weaver's Wall from Baker actually kind of blocked, no, or blocked T1 from actually capitalizing on trying to push onto the smolder there. He's at 535 stacks. I think this one might actually just be done so. I don't know if T1 can ever win this. Even three inhibitors down. It just feels like it's hopeless for them. There is one ward <laughs> in the base. Yeah, there's one call. Nexus turret, so they can't actually backdoor a Nexus at this point. But and if a wave builds in the bottom lane, and Ocean try to go for like a Elder Flip in two minutes, you know, perhaps. So I, I think the fact that the base is still an issue. There's still an angle for T1, but you're right. Like, if this is ever a 5v5 or, like, Smolder's doing damage in any capacity, yeah, Nongshim will win. <laughs> I mean, it, it's it's crazy how T1 have to rely so much on minions in this scenario, and that advantage is not forever. 45 seconds on the top inhibitor, which has been pushed out here significantly for Dindin. Uzudir, who can clear waves very quickly. You've got the Karma, you have the Smolder, obviously, we've spoken at length about. 51 Infernal Cinders. Yeah. <laughs> he is, so his, his, the Infernal Cinders have given him an insane amount of ability haste, which he already has Shoujins and Quick Blade. So that's why he's able to do Qs so often, so frequently, so frustratingly frequently. And uh, if he dies, that's that's it. But if he doesn't, that's also it. Like that's that's the that's the crux of this game right now. The Smolder will carry, yeah, and he has everything so is much, on Jiwu. He has so much to back him up. He he's does. got a Karma, he's got a new deer front line, Milio. he's got the Milio ultimate, plus the ability to get that extra range. He's 9-0-4. He has zero deaths this game. I think uh, we know who's going to get the POG if we make it there. If, he, <laughs> if they do, in fact, bring us to three, 40 seconds until the Elder comes up, and these waves are still a problem. Top inhibitor so, has respawn. Yeah, they're trying to group up in top, push this one out first, and then kind of like knock them out one by one, right? Go top. That's the farthest away from the Elder. You've got your inhibitor up in the top lane as well. Then go mid, and then maybe look bot. Sylvie's just holding the wave for now. I don't think he can clear it alone. As, okay, you know, Guma does a decent amount of damage himself. He has Infernal Soul. Uh-oh. Right? But look at Faker. I mean, he lost half his health bar. It's one Q. Yeah. Vision's going to play a big role in this as well. Palmy also taking a huge chunk. Not able to shield that one. Isaias is still a side lane threat. And he does have teleport, so Nongshim actually have to be, as the Smolder comp, weirdly enough, the ones who start things off, and the poke is coming through. Ooh. Faker stopped on his back, his TP is available, so he wanted to just come back into this fight at full health. Not gonna TP. be allowed to. TP here on Zayas. This is Jiwu, and I, I think he's gonna be able to kill Zayas. Zayas just going the opposite way. T1 are taking down the Elder Drake as this is happening. And Zayas, I mean, this is gonna take a while for them to kill him. He might even be able to get this inhibitor as Meganar comes in. He's got a Zonya's created as Meganar, and down he will go. He does get executed, but Elder Drake taken by T1. Yeah, but Elder Drake just isn't that good for T1, to be honest with you, Valdez. Like, their comp well, doesn't do longer damage. They deny it from Nongshu. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, well, I was going to say this one. When I saw them decide to go to give the Elder, I, like, a light bulb popped off my head. Is This is, like, the modern version of the Jin Air T1 game. Because the Elder doesn't oh, matter no. to, to Nongshim. They're just infinitely scaling. There is no reason for them to care and lose a fight where they don't have positional advantage. And the three inhibitor advantage that T1 had moments ago, there's still 10,000 gold ahead, 11,000 gold ahead. They're not gonna get three inhibitors off of this Elder. That's not gonna happen again, I don't think, this game. The advantage they had for so long is now gone. As these inhibitors respawn, 30 seconds, 53 seconds. Then Nongshim actually have agency for the first time. And this Smolder has been scaling up since then. And I'm a little bit worried about what's going to happen here for T1 because, yeah, you got the Elder, you deny it from Nongshim. 
Well, what's the next step? Starting a Baron fight here in 30 seconds? It's going to have to be an amazing Weaver's Wall from, from Faker or some sort of Gnar angle here. I mean, they do have a little bit of vision control right now. I think T1 have to kill Jiwoo. Like, I mean, of course, you, you yeah. Can't, you can't, well, what I mean is you can't start an objective. You can't do anything if Nongshim are there because you will just die. <laughs> like, you will not be able to win a 5v5. So either either you all in and you kill Jiwoo and you win the fight, or you're just going to get poked out and you lose the game. And so, <laughs> weirdly, Nongshim are not even going to, to, to take that theory to the test. They're going to just sit back and, and clear these waves and continue to scale, yeah. saying our wave clear is so good that I don't care if you have Baron. We've already done that. We've already dealt with this before. Inhibitor's starting to respawn here, and no one will just give it up. <laughs> Exodia's got nothing on Small. <laughs> yeah, who cares? Who cares about Exodia? All right, Apparently I didn't know. Q doesn't. We were going to maybe have a historic game on our hands here, Valdez, when I when I showed up to work today, but we're we're, we're getting there. Maybe let's see if Owner could say no. It's not. It's a two zero. Look for a flank angle here. They've cleared out all the vision. Let's see how good that wave clear really is for Nongshim here. Is it going to have to push through these Baron Mains? Well, what you just do it? Yeah. His Qs, he's got so many stacks. But what about all three waves at the same time? I, I think T1 are doing the right thing, but they have to play this so carefully. Because if Jiu gets enough damage, the game might descend. As now, Engage is just going to sail wide. But maybe it's just a distraction tactic because they took down two inhibitors. But inhibitors didn't work last time. Jiu is walking oh towards him. Oh god, run away! <laughs> The nerves are coming through here for T1 as well as they're watching this game, I think, potentially slip through their fingers. I mean, they've been in control for so long. Is running at them and everybody's scrambling. <laughs> There's like a giant monster chasing them. Oh, God. Okay, they should be able to get this third inhibitor now if they just focus together. As Faker's on a flank, he has Weaver's Wall. Jiu can just fly over it, though. Uh-oh, Jiu, he's getting aggressive. Okay, now he doesn't have his flight. Let's see if Faker decides to capitalize oh. on this. Guma almost died. And he's going to flash early this time. A Q comes down on the owner. I don't think he's getting out of here unless he flashes. He's going to elect not to flash. As meanwhile, Zayus, he's, just he's looking the for the end. He's trying to just take down the turret, and he will. He's going to take it. The rest of the team is just running away. They do not want to fight this Smolder. I mean, look at how many structures T1 have up as well. It's not like they can, T1 can just go, oh, okay, or rather, Nongship can just go, oh, okay, well, we killed your critical members here. Let's just push this five and end. They have to go through the uh, the outer turret and mid, <laughs> inner turret, inhibitor turret, inhibitor nexus turret. So these respawns are going to come through. And I feel like, I guess, maybe if you can group like this again as T1, now that the nexus is exposed, you might be able to get something done. No wards were dropped in the base. So T1 doesn't have a teleport ward to end oh, with. Oh, man. There's no Baron either for Nongshim, so they just get the waves clear. They can't push even the outer the turret. The outer turret, Val, they can't even 43 take that minutes. One. And the Elder Drake was created because it was designed to stop moments like that 90-plus Jinair Green Wings SK Telecom game. But it turns out the second Elder Dragon was created, and it was a mistake. Because <laughs> this Elder Dragon is just oh, trumping God. the real Elder Dragon. Look at his gold, he's the one, he's the Jiwu Stripe, the 4,100 gold lead, yeah. only in bottom lane, the Jiwu exclusive. This is the Azir, the Sivir, and the Baron all together, plus an Elder Drake, which was introduced after that. There's no Kha'Zix! There is no Kha'Zix! <laughs> <laughs> Where's Umpty? <laughs> oh. oh, feel bad. Umpty should be here for this. Oh, boy, well. I'm sure he'll watch it. And, uh... Yeah, Moby Boots. I like this, actually. It's a great call. And, and Hallbreaker, Hallbreaker well. too. So he's going to try to just burst down the Nexus. And obviously, he's going to have those additional resistances solo here. His job, it, he's not a team fighter anymore. Yeah. Like, like, there's no tank that can survive against you. So all you got to do is split push. So you don't care what items survive against Smolder. You care about what allows you to kill side lanes and, yeah, and actually kill the push. base. Yeah. Uh oh. This could get interesting to you. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Zeus, I, I think that's the right call yes. at this point. Just just run away. Yes. As and uh, look at Faker as well. He's always looking for an angle, maybe the Weaver's Wall into the base. He I was like in the enemy jungle waiting. He didn't have Weaver's Wall, but now that's something they have to be careful about. Yeah, I also really love that Jiu is stuck with his build. He's almost at 700 stacks. Oh, man. Because <laughs> he, he is just full glass cannon because he knows that his teammates... Like, he doesn't want a GA, he doesn't want a Zonius, he doesn't want any of that nah, safety stuff. I don't want any of that because I want to just do the damage and, the, and rely on my teammates, rely on my team's wave clear. I, if I'm in a position to where I have to Zonius, the game is over. I don't what want if, that item. I don't want GA. What if he hits a 1,000 stacks? Do we begin to see some tank items? Because at that point, 
it doesn't really matter what items you have. It, it's just about what your Q stack is at. Yeah, I mean, I guess so, that, may, that may be true. Maybe eventually. Although, at this point, I do agree. Like, you are you are the damage dealer. Yeah, and on this damage. patch, you get value more value out of your, your actual items with, with the, the burn and stuff like that. T1 aren't even doing the Elder Drake anymore. <laughs> it's useless. There's no point. It doesn't do anything. Yeah. <laughs> they don't um, care. What is that ward, by the way? Did he mean to get that over the wall and fail? Or did he think there was a control ward so he didn't want to put over over the wall? Now I'm, like, really thinking into every little yeah, angle. Yeah, your guess is as good as mine on this one, Valdez. But um, they may, there, they oh, are you know what? the Elder. There is a Blast Cone right there. So if you TP to that ward, yeah. you Blast Cone over. Yeah. Then you can get in. Also, if Faker does, it, he can just Weaver's Wall in. So that's that's another option. Yeah, but they need in Zeus's case, right? They need to realize that and actually sweep that out potentially. Here is T1 are going to start the Elder to try to bait them in to being away from their base uh, and not reacting. And Nongshim also don't care. Well, they know. Either. They they just pinged it. Yeah, they know something is there. This Elder Jake goes down and. I think uh, he's nobody just, cares. I think he just swept it. Yeah, <laughs> he just swept it. This is this is basically stalemate towards territory, Valdez. So we're in right we now. We getting a remake? <laughs> I mean, I don't think we're gonna get a remake. You and I are going back to our StarCraft two days. I know. Gonna like an hour and a half game. They're gonna be like, okay, we just need to redo yeah. it. The, that was the funniest thing about that Generic Green Wings versus SK Telecom game. Is everyone was talking about it's like the legendary longest esports game of all time, and Valdez and I are like, man. <laughs> We had like three hour games every week for a while there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, not really, but we did have a, a over two hour game that was remade and then went to an hour as well. Yeah. Um, so, uh, Nongshim trying to make a play maybe for the Baron. Yeah, now this Baron, they don't have vision. Oh, if owner just bursts. Okay. This is so scary. Oh, gotta be careful where you're standing. <laughs> Gee, he's such a threat. Nobody's getting okay, near Baker, this guy. Baker's just going to try to get an inhibitor down, because when these inhibitors are up, you have so much time. And the fact that Jiwoo also has teleport is just so frustrating, because he can just come back at any time and deal with you. All right. And they're not, they got Baron, but no inhibitors. So right now, I got the count. Four Barons have been taken. Now five. Three Elders. <laughs> Guess what? Nongshim, one Elder Baby. <laughs> <laughs> One elder. So five Baby barons, dragon. three elders. Not as good as Smolder. How many barons does Nongshim? That's a zero. How many turrets does Nongshim have? Two. How many turrets does T1 Two. have? <laughs> Eleven. Is that Two Nexus naked? That's right. You yeah. guys aren't seeing this wrong. Uh, do you, um, okay, he just tried to get in there. That was a bit scary. Yeah, I wasn't he, ready for that. My heart was not ready. No. Carry uh, on, carry on. Bomb called down. He's on the run. No, he's dead. He's, he's trying gone. to bait, but this... I mean, oh, no, he gets the flash. Great timing. Equalizer comes out for a bit of poke, I guess. I mean, he, he avoids the Glacial Prison. One Q. Oh! oh! He's dead! They did it! They killed the Smolder! That's game! That's the game! All they had to do was kill t And they did it! GG, I guess T1 will take this one as they use their third Elder Dragon to win game number two. Unbelievable, unbelievable game of League of Legends. <laughs> Kuma better be getting a 12 -er for hitting that arrow that ends the game. As Jiwoo Dodge dodged you. everything, he dodged, he got carry in a bad spot, he got out of the uh, Zonias and escape, and then Jiwoo was able to avoid owner's glacial prison. But finally, the Elder Empowered Boris Q is the answer. We have seen Viper do this before. Late game against Smolder ended up crushing Depth to beat the late game Smolder. This is the latest game Smolder we've seen. And it was ultimately destroyed. <laughs> oh, poor to you. By the way, I'm pretty sure that was his first death. His only yeah. death of the yeah, game. Yeah, it was. The only time he dies, the Nexus explodes. And Nongshim are 2 0. And what was. One of the most interesting games we've seen of the season. Brought to you by Smolder. <laughs> Brought to you by Smolder. <laughs> I, I suppose. Oh, man. Even Jew bound to the camera. He didn't win or anything, but he's like, yeah, you know, tried my best. I did my job. I put on a show for the fans. And that that's all it was. I and love that. It was that. the equalizer to chip him down slightly, do a little extra burn. You know, you got Leandris, you got Elder Burn, and then it's one arrow. And the game ends. Yeah, I, I love the fans as well losing it because that's, you know, we always see the Guma Vara ceremony. It's it's quite common, right? But today, it is just so 
fitting. It is just so quintessential for what the series, or how the series ended. And fans shaking here as well. It was almost a game loss to Nongshim. And that's the kind of game you lose a game like that. Your headspace might not be right. You go to game three, Nongshim, you know, trip you up again. And then suddenly you lose the series. Maybe you don't <laughs> get top two. You forget to ban Smolder. Yeah, you see the burn from the equalizer got him low enough, and then one Q. Yep. Although the maybe elder burn, even just one Q, because like he didn't even have time to burn after that. But regardless, yeah. if we had a, you know, if he had any like Zonias there or something like that, that could have saved him. To be fair, you know, we talked about how the the itemization didn't offer any survivability. It did not. And remember well, this? Yeah. Remember when the Smolder didn't get to play the first five minutes of the game? It's like we're watching Jiwoo's baby pictures right now. Like, <laughs> this is his first day at kindergarten. Oh, so cute. My first ult. <laughs> <laughs> what a game. And T1 clutching it out in the end. I feel like T1 played that game pretty perfectly, too, when you consider how they set up for the potential Blast Cone angle, how they managed waves um, in the late game there to try to make sure there was always a backdoor angle, always a threat. They, they always do a really good job of identifying what the game state is, right? And yeah. I think they did even in this weird spot uh, that rarely, if ever, happens in pro play, especially on stage. Um, they did a really good job, as you mentioned. You know, there were some oopsies like this one, you know, maybe don't wall into Jiu. I think this was the moment where we all realized, wait, <laughs> Jiu just is unkillable. Well, maybe he is killable eventually, but he will kill everybody. Yeah, he if will. We don't, if we don't CC him to death. Exactly. And and they don't have great CC, which we started talking about like 20 minutes before this. And yeah. I was like, well, wait a second. You know? <laughs> Everybody cared about the Elder Drake. Turns out the Elder Drake actually was the thing that ended the game. Yeah, it was. And, you know, that was the, the key part. If he just gets hit with that Q, he's actually totally fine. They yeah. can just go back to the base and heal up and then defend the waves. As even in this moment, you know, we were like, does T1 just have too much stuff? But Nongshim never faltered. And it's actually just insanely bonkers, these yeah. moments here. Like, watch this. Guma flashes, but it's too late. W I, extends the Right range. after that happened, Guma just took a big sip of water. He's like, OK. <laughs> We're in this one for a while, I guess. <laughs> he knew what was coming. And yeah, I, I think that this this was kind of an issue with T1's draft in a lot of ways for dealing with Smolder. Like, Smolder's obviously incredibly strong, as is proven here. Well, the fact they didn't have any consistent way to lock him down. Yeah. Vi was banned, and Nautilus was banned before Smolder was picked as well yeah. in the second phase. So I think that this is not indicative that Smolder will be banned every game for the rest of the season or anything like that. I think it's just a draft issue that T1 struggled to solve, but eventually we were able to get done with the Elder, as the T1 fans were so hyped. Uh, when Guma's arrow did finally ring true. Better be a 12 or 77.7. Oh, <laughs> he won the lottery on this one, but he didn't win the game. Look at all of the objectives. <laughs> Five Barons, three Elders, yeah. Infernal Soul. Infernal Soul. It, the gold difference at the end was 17,000, as it was like sitting at like 12K, 15K for so long. And uh, eventually the gold didn't matter. All that mattered was one Elder Drake, one Equalizer, one Piercing Arrow, and they finally killed the baby Elder Dragon. They killed, it didn't, that graph didn't show the fourth Elder Dragon that was a little bit smaller. Yeah. That was the that was the one Jiwoo they killed the, this game, and it was the one that won them the game. Well, I don't know what to tell you guys, that was a <laughs> sick game. I hope you enjoyed it. That was a lot of fun, uh, but now let's throw it over to the space and see what they had to say about that game number two. Thank you so much, gentlemen. Uh, yeah, what a ridiculous game of League of Legends. Sometimes it looks like it's three Elder Dragons that you need, but actually it's four. Uh, let, should we go back to the draft? It, how relevant is I, it? I, I guess there was a dragon that was picked. Yeah, I think there's a key pick to point out in this draft. Yeah. Oh. No, we've highlighted the wrong, no, no, forget about that. Yeah, we you should probably go back. a little bit back. above and a little bit to the left, that little dragon? You know, uh, I mean, I've said it before, if you want to upset a team higher in the standings, just pick Smolder. They did a little bit of happy gaming on T1, and suddenly things got very scary. That's all it took. It was Ox his law come into <laughs> full They were smacked in the face with that. And I don't, I, I'm feeling so many emotions. I'm happy that Smolder lost. I'm devastated that Jiwoo lost. He had one death that game, and they, it was immediately over, right? Like, I think this was, probably the most memorable game of the season for many a reason. And it didn't really start out that way because uh, it started out when it's going, oh, cool, Rumble support, life, you know, from Alma Life and, and Gen G played it. 
and none of it mattered. Uh, but but he's actually been smashing on this. So that was this was way back, right? I don't know if you guys can remember this, but there was a time before Smolder existed in this game. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I, 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 honestly, I can barely remember it, actually. I remember I was thinking, maybe we should do like a lower third because like Virus was really far ahead. He was like 30, 40 CS at one point. I'm like, yeah, you know, this is probably why the game's going to end because Smolder's really... No, no, I didn't... Didn't really no, come. Let, no. let's, let's go back to the rumble that isn't necessarily as relevant because we do have the Hooney five out of five stars for Carrier's that's first. And that's because he built <laughs> Sorcerer's Shoes and he also built Leandri's. I'm loving the build. Does it doesn't even, even matter. matter. <laughs> <laughs> um, Hooney! <sighs> not wrong. Hooney not knows. Wrong. He's not wrong. He's not wrong, but like that's all you really need to do to make Hooney happy is build Sork Shoes and Leandri's and have Comet Ignite and, and fine. It, yep, and he did all of that. He did. Everything was perfect, and it was a great early game. And his equalizers were actually pretty good. And then th that was, game. and then that game stopped, and the new game that they started playing happened immediately afterwards because there's a lot of preamble. You go back to The Hobbit, there's a whole bunch of preamble, and they do some misty mountains and stuff like that. But then eventually, it's just the, the, the fight at Lake Town when it's all about smog. Yeah, and I mean, the fact he can fly over the clear wall, the fact that they just didn't really have any good lockdown for him. You know, they talked a little bit, uh, the casters, about the fact that there was no Vine or Nautilus. And it became so scary because you're like, okay, we can't handle the smog, let's run away. But like when he hits, like there's so many bounces, and this isn't even like that late compared to where the game ended. But if if you're even slightly too close, you're liable to like hit your entire team with all those little bolts, and just like you could flash away from a queue and kill your entire team. It's like such a scary situation. No, it's absolutely absurd. He also picked up about a billion cinders because he only died that one time, so yeah. he was covered in ability haste. His Q was like like a 1.65 second cooldown, you know, and it just did so much damage. And I actually, I want to give some credit. Nongshim is a team that ha that that you that won challengers in a huge upset against DK back in uh, 2022 yeah. summer. Through them, just like. We're gonna we're gonna find a way to win this somehow. And I feel like we saw and the causes highlight as well, like once you lose your inips, the wave clear, even if you have it, that's one thing, but you can just never leave your base. And then they were like, no, we're not gonna fight Elder. We're not gonna lose this game. We're not gonna we're not gonna fight Baron. And guess I, I think they would have won. If if they could have kept Chi Wu alive somehow, it would have been enough. You know, could have. Honestly, I think if they'd just been able to keep their Nexus Towers alive a little bit longer, because I feel like once they went down, you could see they were just so scared of a backdoor, and it really just uh, limited how they could play the game. Yeah, and we, we can go back to the to the graph as well, because there was five Barons that were taken. There were three there Elder Dragons, in, not even including, necessarily. Six uh, Barons, three Elders. Was elders. it six Barons? I, I thought there were five, 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 five Barons. Uh, but maybe five. we can't actually... Just five. It's, only five. it's only five. My bad. My bad. Might have been a graph issue. Yeah. We may have had a bit of a graph issue. But one thing that Dragons do struggle with is archery. Archery has been their greatest downfall in a very, uh, in, in many, many years. Yeah, and this is the thing as well, because Smolder got just on this patch, his Q the Burn now scales with your stacks and your AP AD, so he was doing so much damage with it as a result. And uh, there's definitely some good arrows coming out, but yeah, I think the ults weren't quite connecting from Guma, but this is the final moment. This is where, you know, the health's been chunked out a bit. And I think, honestly, this is a reminder. So T1 at this point has both Elder and Infernal Soul. Yeah. yeah. Like in the Infernal Soul in particular, as G. Uh, it's so close, man. You no, know, he has Flash, but you just uh, you, you don't well. anticipate. You don't anticipate this is going. Oh kill you. my God, that's one of the ones made by that special metal, oh, right? Oh yeah, yeah, the, the, yeah, 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 yeah. Mithril, and maybe. Something like there's that. Some of that. There's there's heal and all available for Peter and flash for Jiwa, right? Because they just didn't expect that it would die off of just that. And the flash is a really big tool. We saw Jiwa use it offensively really well early on. So heartbreaker for Nongshim. You know but good for League of Legends. Yeah. <laughs> that smolder you know loss. You know what's insane? <laughs> this isn't even the first time we've seen a 600 plus stack smolder, and it's lost to poke virus. Because Viper against Death we had a similar situation yeah. where it was like the game. Surely he's just dumb, but the, the I guess that's his weakness. It's just big arrows. Yeah, I mean, there's that. I mean, if you go back to the KT series, that was a large amount to do with uh, a bit of gameplay issues that were happening as well. But the fact that this was even remotely close and T1 had a 12,000 gold lead for what felt like 600 years 
blows my mind. So I think there's still a bit of a problem with the smolder. Okay, rant over. Let's 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 go into the POG and so, see who picks it up for this one. I'm hoping it's Bard. And it is! Gumiushi picks it up with some incredible arrows. And I'm gonna be honest, he had a really solid game despite, you know, all the smolder issues, was consistently landing poke. So actually managed to secure the first Elder Dragon. But I'm not sure any of that really matters because he killed the small guy. Yeah. That's the main takeaway. He killed the first Elder Dragon and the last Elder Dragon. Yeah, that's all he had to do to, to get by a POG vote. Right, like League, the, the lore of League of Legends is something that I think is, is, is uh, really something that a lot of people don't really enjoy. But what I love is emergent storylines. And in this, <laughs> in this game, just through pure gameplay, Guma is the hero of this story. Oh, because yeah. Because he is the only one that could stop the dragon. Karia, you know, he set him up. He was like yelling at him, you can do this, Guma. You can hit him. <laughs> and then he did. Yeah! 12 out of yep. 12. Everyone understands that if you manage to shoot down the dragon, you're the main character of the story. And, uh,. It worked out once again. Congratulations. And congratulations to, you know, media and everybody else for all being on the same page. I'm really glad when a, when a plan comes together, but that was a whirlwind. And I cannot believe that it was a 2-0 as well, because it doesn't really feel like a 2-0. I feel like we're in that series for a, a really, really long, like it was the extended edition of the series. Yeah, it really felt like extended edition. It felt like we went through so many different arcs in the story, yeah. you know. <laughs> Smolder, little baby Smolder, just growing up, you know, going about his day and then turning into an evil dragon and then simultaneously Guma's story, who tried to, in his youth, kill the dragon, but he wasn't successful. I know. He had to do it again. And uh, unfortunately, it was, it was a, a death of the dragon on the dragon's birthday as well. Uh, it was don't, don't remind Jiwoo's me, birthday don't today. Don't us, we uh, still us. need to wish him a happy birthday. So happy birthday, Jiwoo. But unfortunately, it is, uh, it is not his time for the interview. In fact, it's a T1 interview, so let's throw it over to the stage with Dia for some translation. Thank you very much, guys. This is Dia for the POG interview translation, joined by owner and Gumayushi on the side of T1. Congratulations! Owner, with a feisty victory against Nongshim, T1 has secured 14 wins. How do you feel? In order for us to reach uh, second place, this was a very important match. I'm really happy that we were able to secure a 2-0 victory today. And Gumayushi, you must have been so sad not being able to see your fans uh, in the past weeks. So how does it feel to see them again? I feel like it definitely feels like we came back um, being able to play on stage with the fans and hearing them cheer for us is always exhilarating. And in game one, owner, looking at the draft, everyone got their comfort picks with owner's Lee Sin to Gumayoshi's undefeated Senna and Faker's based Oriana. Were you happy about the comp? Yeah, these are champions that we really like to play and something that we are able to uh, pull off really well in terms of the comp and I think in game we we're just talking about yeah, this is really good draft so let's do, let's do well. And from the start, T1 took so much advantage, owner got a nice double kill in this next replay, so let's take a look. And all while covering the counter gank, you took two kills, so how did you find this angle? In the early 2v2, we believed that we had the advantage, and we caught the enemy's mistake really well, so I think that's how we were able to luckily take that double kill. Uh, I think we caught them off guard, and it felt like such a free double kill, which is great. And Gumayushi, from the start until the end, owners Lee Sin shook up the rift and led the team to victory in game one. And owner, of course, the bald thumbnail came up again. Let's take a look. So, owner, you know, in game, did you imagine becoming bald during the game? You know, from LCK, they really. There has to be one person that really enjoys making me into a bald person. And of course, 
Making the fans laugh is important, and I believe that that's a positive thing. I'll take it as a good thing. And with the win in Game 1, Gomayoshi, you have 17 wins and 0 loss on Senna. Is it that not even the Senna nerf has any impact on Gomayoshi? Regarding the nerf on Senna, I believe that it didn't really have a lot of impact. I think Senna is still evaluated pretty highly in the tier list. I think Mick jungled it really well, so I think it's really all thanks to my teammates. And owner, how do you feel about this score that Gumoishi has? Of course, this friend of mine is really good at Senna. And it makes me think that he has played Senna so well and he's been playing Senna a lot. And Karia's Rumble support has made an appearance. So was this the pick that you guys have been working on? And this is a pick that LPL uses as well, and I think we definitely prepared for this moment, and, uh, and it's been work something that we've been working on. And in game two, you guys had an incredible dive play, and you sacrificed the entire wave to end the bot laning phase, but the game ended up being really long in the end. You know, there are a lot of accidents in the middle of the game, and Ju took a lot of kills. And I think the enemy had high value champions, and that's probably why it ended up becoming such a long game. And yeah, you're right, the extremely fed Smolder got a quadra and with over 600 stacks. And in the moment where the game could be flipped any moment, what was your plan to stop him as a fellow AD carry? I told myself, I am just as strong, just don't get overplayed. And I think telling that myself was what gave me confidence, and I think I just tried to keep my head in the game all uh, the entire time. And owner, what was your game plan? Uh, instead of having a game plan, I feel like this was... This is a game for AD carries, and I thought to myself, AD carries must be fun. And what ended this lengthy game was that one arrow from Gumo Yushi. And yeah, I, I didn't know that he would actually die. It was such a long game, but it ended so abruptly, so it felt kind of empty. Uh, so, what was your reaction? When the, uh, in the moment when it landed, I asked, I asked myself, will it kill him? And it did. And to secure a second place of the regular season, you have your last match against DRX. Owner, what is your solution? So our match against DRX will be the most important because it will lock in our second place. And so we'll put in a lot of effort into trying to lock ourselves into second place. And Gomayoshi, I believe being in second place will be a, big, a very big for us, so I believe that it'll be really important for us to be prepared and we'll make sure that we win. And this will be the end of the interview with owner and Gomayoshi of T1 and back to the space. Thank you so much, dear, for the translation. Great to hear from both Gumiushi and Ona. Gumiushi looking like he's uh, a little bit tuckered out after that series, and I can understand why I think we're all feeling the same way. As we'll check out the standings, not too much of a change, apart from the fact that Nongshim will uh, move back to ninth place, and uh, second place still there for T1. They can lock it in with that victory, as mentioned before. What a night. Like, yeah, I, I really, I think you can feel all of us really. It reeling. continues into tomorrow, gentlemen. Because super high stakes matches tomorrow. Uh, for placement, Hama Life obviously wants to get a, a big win just in case that T1 somehow lose to DRX. Uh, but I think they'll be smolder, so I think they'll be all right. Yeah. Kwondong match, I feel like, you know, they got two chances left. This is one of them. And if they don't get a win, then it's really just down to hoping for Firex to have a mistake, have a stumble. Exactly right. And uh, they've managed to do it before, but it was a very different looking Kwondong Freaks. We'll see whether we'll see them tomorrow. And speaking of which, that is it for us tonight. Thank you so much for watching. We'll see you tomorrow for that epic game here at the LCK.
좋은 곳에서 최강을 논하지 말라! 저희를 이길 수 있다는 그런 생각을 버리시길 바랍니다. 쏘리 쏘리 플러스기아 입장에서 최강 팀들 상대로 갚아주고 싶은 게 많지 않거든요? 플러스기아를 가볍게 보지 마세요. 